Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world. And welcome again to DelphiCon 2023. I'm going to look over here a bit because my slides are over here and everything else is in front of me. Uh, I'm not ignoring you. And uh, it is day three. We finally made it through to day three. Lots and lots of stuff going on. Um, uh, very, very busy day today as well and some excellent sessions. Um, we've had a lot of very positive feedback. Plenty of people saying uh, very nice things, and we appreciate those. The chat window um, on whichever platform you're using, because we're on Facebook Live and we're on YouTube Live, streaming, and uh, a few other places. Well, I so many, I, I don't remember them all. Um, but uh, if you've got any questions, type them in the chat window. Throughout the, the day, there will be people here trying to uh, answer the questions live. Myself, uh, Jim McKeith, who's around at the moment, uh, but uh, I'm just opening this link for us today. And um, most of the sessions will have a QA and a at the end of them, a live Q&A. And the people that are doing those sessions will actually be uh, participating, hopefully. Um, if we can't do that, we'll let you know in advance. So uh, let me share my screen and make sure I get the one that's all the, the correct one. And let's go through the slides. Well, on day three, which uh, currently, if you're not watching the replay in a few days' time, uh, today's Thursday, February the 16th. The first session we've got is from Samuel uh, Rosa de Oliveira. I think he's live. Yes, he's joining us as well. He's uh, online at the moment in the background. Uh, and he's going to be talking about NT. FI or NTFI. Uh, I'll let him tell you how to pronounce that correctly. Um, and it's an open source server to send and receive push notifications. It's an alternative to some of the other um, ways of doing push um, notifications using Firebase, which is very popular. Um, you can see his information there um, and his GitHub link. Very interesting. I'll be around for that. Um, also answering questions, by the way, is Patrick uh, Premata. Uh, hello, Patrick. I hope you're doing well. He's uh, working very hard, and there'll be some other MVPs around as well. Um, but Samuel will be answering questions in the Q&A live later. That starts at 9 a.m. in about seven minutes, um, which is pretty good. Uh, the next session at 10 a.m., and this is U.S. Central Time um, time scale, so that's... Uh, 8 p no, 4 p.m. UK time and various other time zones. But all of the times we're giving you today are US Central Time. And that is the session will be avoiding memory leaks and dealing with Delphi exceptions. Um, always important, particularly if you saw my um, session on Windows services. Things like Windows services that have to run and run and run in the background, which is more and more common now. Um, a memory leak could be catastrophic. You could literally bring down someone's server or someone's computer. So understanding how to um, deal with uh, memory leaks is quite an important thing. That's from Michael Dalry, uh, who's a senior Delphi developer. Uh, what else have we got? Delphi and open AI. Oh, the big topic. Um, we've still got this have we? because I know one session dropped out that we had on open AI. Um, I'm being told we do still have it. The open AI is the, it's the big hot topic of the day, isn't it? Um, AI seems to be reaching that point, that inflection point where it's actually becoming quite useful instead of being quite useless. I know, I know if you type type things into chat GPT, it can get it all wrong and, um, you know, sometimes make some ridiculous uh, statements. But actually, you know, I can see there's a lot of promise there. And I think this is going to be a very interesting session and from Marco Geza. Uh, who's also an Embarcadero MVP. He works for GDK Software. All about how to use open AI in Delphi. Very, very interesting. Uh, maximizing the visual impact of your user interface in VCO and FMX will be the session with Jim McKeith at uh, noon today or 12 p.m., uh, 6 p.m. UK time. And it's all about uh, using your user interface to present things that are exciting and um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, you know, in, you increase user engagement. And this session is in collaboration with Vinicius and uh, uh, Paolo from the Skier for Delphi library. I saw them talking about it on their Telegram um, uh, uh, room or what would you call it, the Telegram session, I don't know, Telegram, Telegram group. Yeah, Telegram group, that's what I'm saying. 
and uh, there, there's a lot of excitement about this. Skier for Delphi, very, very big project, and uh, there are a few announcements coming up about Skier for Delphi as well. I noticed Marco mentioned it on his blog, but um, very interesting session, um, definitely worth uh, dropping in on. Of course, presented by the master himself, Jim McKeith. And then at uh, 1 p.m., everybody's uh, favorite love to hate system is Git. If you are a professional developer or you're thinking about becoming a professional developer or you're just learning how to um, develop right now, um, because we've got a lot of plenty of people joining us from the learndelphi.org site as well, um, Git is the de facto standard for um, source code control. Uh, if you are going to develop with some kind of um, passion and, uh, and, you know, joining with other people, then you're going to come into, across Git. Whether you use it every day yourself or not, it doesn't really matter. Git is the de facto standard. Rich Dudley is going to um, join us. He's from N Software slash N Software. He's their chief evangelist. A great company, N Software. Definitely worth visiting them as well. Okay. Um, at 2 p.m., um, from Michaelis, uh, Camberellis, sorry, Michaelis, I can say Michaelis. Castle Game Engine is an open source, cross-platform, 2D and 3D uh, game engine. You've got to uh, watch this. Uh, even if you, you're you never going to want to um, write a game, and I get that. I, I don't actually play games. I, I consider that a, what's called a busman's holiday. At the end of the day, when I finish coding, the last thing I want to do is sit in front of a computer and play games. But the Castle Game Engine is very, very exciting. If you um, watch some of these demos and see what's been written with the Castle Game Engine, it'll really make you understand that Delphi is just not some kind of toy language or out of date or old fashioned or um, you know slightly lacking in modern features. You will see the Delphi language being uh, used to push hardware to the maximum and produce some really exciting um, graphics and, and uh, uh, game mechanics and game physics. It's very, very interesting um, uh, system. Wor definitely worth watching. And uh, the session at 4 p.m. is the fair critical section the motivation of a, of a fair critical section I'm not really in, uh, know what this uh, particular session is about actually so i think i ought to have read up on it a bit before i start talking about it design constraints implementation testing and benchmarks um testing is obviously a big subject uh, de jour and if you are a professional developer you will need to understand about um, testing and uh, this particular section uh, this particular session is all about that at 4 p.m with janice um, we're looking forward to that. And I think uh, the final session is the recognition and closing session. And um, this, again, will be with Jim McKeith. I may pop in for this as well and perhaps a few other people. But it's definitely worth sticking around um, to see this because we've got a few big announcements and uh, we recognize some of the um, people that have been involved in the projects around um, Delphi over the course of the last year and and uh, through DelphiCon and things like that. We always have a really great team behind the scenes um, working on this, but um, uh, we'd like to sort of recognize uh, all the people that we think are outstanding community members. Um, and that'll be with Jim at 4 p.m. and that's our closing session. So um, that takes us now to talk about the very first session, which I will scroll back through and get to wherever it was. And that is going to be using NTFI as an open source server to send and receive push notifications. We will be talking to you in the chat. Um, so keep saying hello. Hello to all the people from Turkey, Italy, Germany, France, England. Uh, Norway, Belgium, and all the other places. We will get around to saying hi to everybody. And uh, my dog is barking in the background. I don't know if the noise cancelling is getting rid of it. But uh, we're ready to go on the first session from Samuel Rosa de Oliveira. Thanks for joining us. Stick around. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Delphi Con. 2023. We are celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Today in our presentation, we want to speak a little about NTFY for Delphi. How can you send cloud push notifications at zero cost? 
I will, take, I will talk a little bit about our agenda today. We will cover some topics on the origins of NTFY, who was its creator, and cloud notifications. We will have a brief revision of HTTP communication mechanisms, the structure of NTFY and how it works. We'll take a look on publishers, subscribers, and topics and subscription mechanisms. We will see how can you install NTFY for Delphi into your Delphi project. How can you to subscribe and publish using the library? And we will also we'll take a look on a brief utilities and examples and some minor details. Here's a little bit about me. My name is Samuel Rosa de Oliveira. I'm Brazilian. I am currently live in Teresópolis, Rio de Janeiro. I am do, finishing my studies on Bachelor of Information Systems. And you can contact me through my Medium account at samuel-ro.medium.com. It's my page in Portuguese. But you can use a translator or a Google Translator extension and see what I post there. This here is my GitHub if you have any interest. And I'm a Delphi developer and backend enthusiast at Aquasoft Technologies where I engage with some interesting and exciting projects. So let's speak about NTFY for Delphi. So first of all, let's speak a little about of the origins of NTFY and this, its creator and a bit on cloud notifications. What's the meaning of NTFY? NTFY stands for Notify in English and it's a free publisher or subscriber notification service based on HTTP. It allows you to send push notifications outside a device from any computer or cell phone. The creator was Philip C. Hacko, is German and he's a software engineer. And what's Notify? for Delphi. NTFY for Delphi is a client library written in Pascal to interact with NTFY servers in Delphi. Likewise, it allows you to send and receive push notifications through NTFY servers. The creator was me. From now on, whenever you hear me speaking about NTFY, I will not say the acronym, but I will say Notify. So this bear this in mind. A very common alternative for developers to work with notifications is using Firebase. Firebase cloud messaging is a very common alternative and allows you to send cloud notifications at no cost as well. But there has some drawbacks. We will see a very briefly how you can set up it and what are the steps which you have to utilize to implement Firebase on your project. You will firstly need to set up the FCM server. Then you have to set up the client app. Maybe you have to install an SDK, packages and libraries. And so relative complex. And furthermore, there is no way you can host your own server. This is the main drawback of Firebase. With Notify, things get changed a little bit different. In spite of offering this uh, consumption capacity or there is a limit, Notify is 100% free and you have no cost with it as well. There is no need to set up any server. It provides a simple HTTP client. You don't have need to install any SDK or packages and libraries. And it's extremely simple to implement. Furthermore, the main advantage is that you can host your own server. Philip's proposal is to keep the service free of any charge, although he may offer paid plans in the future as well. So you can take a look on their website at docs.ntfy.sh and there's a bunch of things there and documentations on how can you install and how you can use Notify into your project. Here we are going just to mention it very briefly, but there is an integration and examples uh, menus where you can explore a little bit and see what it does or what it offers. Here's a little bit on Philip Heckel. He's uh, his father of two kids. 
His project has already 9,000 stars, maybe even up, even more up to this presentation. Here's his GitHub, and uh, you consider leaving a star in his project as well. Okay, exchanging data on the internet. Since the development of the HTTP protocol, many APIs were created to hurdle with internet communication problems. Below are listed some main ones. We have short polling, we have long polling, we have also server-side events and web sockets. Short polling, it's the technique of the client to request data to the server and fix the time cycles. This is quite ineffective and generates much traffic. It's pretty like that story, maybe all of you know, of the kid that stayed in the back of your car asking if you have arrived or not. Have you arrived? It? No. Have you arrived? It? No. And she stayed requesting this for a long, long time until we eventually arrived at the place. So this is quite irritating, right? And it's the same an analog or it's the same parabola. So the client stay requesting the server for data and fixed time cycles. Long polling, the client requests data to the server only once. The server holds the connection for transmitting data and it's better than short polling. But in this technique, the, the server cannot generate or deliver data by itself. It depends on the client firstly. So the client sends a request to the server and the server does not close or does not send the header, the close header back to the client. And he stays connecting, he stays connected with the client for long periods. In server-side events, the client doesn't need to send any data to the server, but only the server is meant to do it. It's useful for when you want to work with real-time updates like a news feed or something like Twitter and it's real useful if you want to send for example real-time updates like prices and so forth. In this in this case server the server only sends and the client stays connected to the server but it doesn't need the client doesn't need to send any request to the server before he can receive a, some data. Web sockets it's like the duplex connection. Maybe you have already known about duplex connection. In here, both the client and the server can exchange data. They can, this is very useful when you want to utilize for games or share documents and situations where you need instant interaction on both peers or the server. This is WebSockets. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look on how Noti Notify works and understanding its mechanisms. So, this year it's a brief chart on how Notify mechanisms, subscription and publishing mechanisms works. There is a server that stay up to store topics addresses and other publisher and other subscribers connected to the same topic. A publisher is any device and subscriber as well. They all will be looking to the same topic at the server. This topic is essential to we understand the further explanations. When a subscriber sends a GET request to the server, the server does not close the TCP connection. It kept open, does not send the subscriber the close header back. And this is long polling. The server stays sending updates to the subscriber through server push and whenever a publisher needs to post a new notification, he can send a post request to the same topic. So this here is the blueprint of Notify. There are a few servers in the spreading around the world, some of them are in Germany and others in other parts of Europe and United States. The first one is in the USA, the NTFYSH, the official. They are in Germany, 
ntfyams.net. Another one in Germany that is ntfyadminforce.deutsch. Another in Finland and another in France. So now let's see a little bit about topic, topics, publishers and subscribers. In some ways you can publish or subscribe. So topics are URL segments which comes after the server URL. The subscriber uses this URL to create long, the long polling connection and then exchange messages in real time. So here is the server address and after the server address you have the topic address. This URL segment is the topic. As they are public URLs, it's ideal that you create a difficult name to be guessed. Because anyone with access to your topic may be a problem, right? But later we can see also how there are some ways to implement secure topics by using credentials and avoiding this problem. To receive notifications, you have several ways to, to do it. You have the Android official app. You have the NTFY official web app, NTFY client, and also many other li client libraries written in different programming languages. And in the case, our library, NTFY or Notify for Delphi, it's the case. So you can come here in their integrations and projects. And here is our library written in Pascal Delphi. So you can go there, check it by yourself and here is our library the subscription mechanism is very straightforward and simple as it is an HTTP service we only need to execute a GET request to the chosen topic followed by the URL, URL segment that stands for the selected subscription mechanism there are currently four ways to subscribe. One is using JSON, the other is using raw string, server-side events, and WebSockets. And currently our library only supports JSON, but we are working to implement and develop another branches or another features so that these other options may be available as well. Okay. Now we are going to see how can we install Notify for Delphi into our Delphi project. It's going to be right straightforward as well. I already prepared an application to demonstrate this and I will just mention two ways you can install it into your Delphi project. And the installation is it's very very easy, very straightforward. The first option which you may use, you are more familiar with. It's that you have to go to Hazelnut's repository and clone the repository to your machine. After this, you have to add the source folder to your library path or search path. So you come to Notify for Delphi and the project will have some folders stru is structured. And inside the source folder, it's all the necessary Pascal files to the library to work with. And all, the only thing you have to do is to go inside your Delphi uh, project and go into options. Inside of options, there is maybe a language, Delphi, and library here. Select the platform which you want to develop for, and then come here and add the source folder inside of the library path. It's very simple, very, very simple. And uh, you can also select another ways to do so. You can go to project uh, options if you only want to install to a specific platform. And inside of project options, there is a Delphi compi compiler option. And inside of here in the search path, you can go there and select the source folder and add into this place here. It's very, very straightforward. I will not demonstrate this here because I want to demonstrate another way too that you can install into your, into your project. Okay, just remember, the source folder is the only folder which you need to utilize this, this library. The another way is 
that I selected for this presentation it's using Boss Dependency Manager for our demonstration. So here I have a very simple console application project, okay, and uh, here is the folder for the project is in this location. I already have Boss installed on my machine. The only thing I have to do here is to initiate Boss. I can do this with the command boss init. Maybe all of you already know about this. And he will generate, it will act actually ask us some questions for our package name, our home page, and versions. I will leave everything as default because this is not the goal of our presentation. In the, the source folder. After this commands, he will generate the boss files to work with the dependency dependency manager. And the only thing I have to do is to go into my library. I will go back to my library here. And I can utilize this command. Boss install github.com slash hazelnodes notify for Delphi. This is what I'm going to do here. Okay, it's already installed. We have here on modules that notify for Delphi is installed. So it's going to request us to reload the project and after this after this reload it's supposed that our notify unit it's already installed. Let's just take a look here. We can see that notify it's already installed here. It's pretty straightforward. No need to add on other things. So this is the command if you desire to take a note and let's see how subscriber or publishing with our library notify for Delph works. Let's take hands on with the library. To start receiving notifications we just need to add notify unit in the uses clauses and call the subscribe method followed by a topic and a callback function. This callback function will be fired whenever the client receives the survey event. Just need to add the notify unit. And notify exposes a variable that we can interact with the library in the library's interface. And here is the where stays our very secret topic. And follow this very secret topic, we, we can inform the callback procedure. Okay. This callback procedure we will receive an event of type I notify event which is an interface and inside this procedure we can create or we can pass or we can execute whatever callback we want. I'll just demonstrate here in our presentation. So as I said before notify exposes a variable which is called ntfy and uh, I will call that call it here. After this, I will call the subscribe method. The subscribe method will need a topic for our demonstration. And after the topic, there is a anonymous procedure. This anonymous procedure, as I said, will receive on one parameter of type e notify event. And here we can pass or execute whatever or whatever command which we desire to be executed in our client. Our very secret topic will be a very, actually a very easy topic just for, for this conference and for demonstrating on our presentation. I have already selected one which is called DelphiCon, which will be the topic where we are posting here. This DelphiCon, do you remember? this Delphi.com will become a public URL. So if you have access to Delphi.com and test there, you will see my message and you will also receive and you can publish on this topic. But for our purposes, I will select this very easy topic. And also to gain time, I will not post, I will not write anything here on the console because this will take me some time. I will just enable logs here. So, we can see the message displayed at the screen in the time when we receive it. Okay. 
I've, I have uh, omitted one step here just to demonstrate in a more succinct way, but I will explain it later why you need the... why am I, why am I speaking this? So after this, I will just run F, F9, you will see that the connection was opened and now we are listening to incoming messages. We just need to press Ctrl F if we are in the console application to kill the process. Okay, so as I said before, Delphi Con will be our topic, our topic. And I have another machine here connected in the same topic. What I will do now is just to send a message from this machine and let's see if our library receives the notification. I will type here um, Delphi Con. 2023 and I would just type hello everyone there hello guys okay now it's time to publish let's see if we we receive this in our console application we receive it very cool right you have some properties of the message here. I did not have all the fields because this message was a very simple one. But as you can see, we have an ID, we have a Unix time, we have the type of the event, which is message. We have the topic where we are posting, which is Delphi Con, and the message we selected. Hello, guys. And the title of our message is Delphi 2023. I have it in, do you remember that I spoke before about the web client? Here is, it, here is our, our message too. I just access in the topic that I described it before in the official, official server. And uh, here I have selected the, I have sent the message to from my Mac computer and I'm presenting this this presentation in a Windows machine. I'm subscribed by the web client. I received the message and my client application, my console client application did also receive the message. It makes you to remember from the first slide that all the clients are connected and looking to the same topic at a server. This is quite interesting. The long polling connection, the HTTP long polling connection is on execution here because it's holding the connection and eventually the server is sending messages to keep the connection alive to the client. This will be running for over days, months, if I want to utilize for this purpose. And uh, that's it. That's very simple. Let me just send another message here. Uh, hello again. Hello again. And um, we love Delphi. All right, I think all of we love here. I will send again and we receive it. That's it. So, and how can we publish messages in our application? This example was just for subscribing, okay? So, how publishing works? It works just like the same way as subscribing. You will need to add a notify unit in the users clause and create a new notification with the new method. Then you can call publish. This is the blueprint. Okay, just add the notify unit. We already done this. But now this time we are creating a new object by a facade, by a facade method. This method, new method here, it's a, it's a facade which can you can create another object to, uh, from him. In this here, we just, in this example here, we just send a simple message like with a title and a message content. And then we call it publish. So let's see how we do this in our library. Well, let me see if I'm listening everything, okay. Mm. Okay, this time let's publish. We will we will call the notify 
variable again. This time we will call publish. It's a function. But before that, we will provide a new notification object to, to this to this function here. As we see, we can call the new method. The new method it's actually a facade, and uh, then we can create many objects here. We can create an API, a notification, an action, or a config. But for our purpose, for we create a new notification, we have to call this one. So we will have we will need a topic which is Delphi Con. We will post a simple message with just a title and a message content. This is going to be our title and the message content. Content. Okay. Uh, what can be our title? I will put on the UTF-8 string here. Delphi Con 2023. And a simple message for us. We love Delphi. With a, sim with a simple heart. Is there? Yeah, there's a heart here. Uh, then we can, we just need to call publish. This, this is all we need for publishing our notification. We are expecting this notification to be displayed here in our subscription in our clients so if there is another client connected in this URL he will receive the same message so let's see if it works mm. it's taking a little longer than expected Do you think I have problems with internet here? Oh, no. It finally arrived. Uh, I think there was a problem with the server. But here is our message, Delphi Con 2023. And uh, the emoji and the heart. Pretty simple. This is everything what we can uh, demonstrate in the, in the simplest way. Of course, there are other methods here. There are many other options which which they are available by notify server but i will explain them very briefly you can take a look at the library in the hazelnuts repository because there are many many options that you can you can test in your project for instance the library already pro i have already provided some small test cases which you can play a little bit like you can send simple messages, actions, and attachments, headers. You can work with si simple like emails, tags, icons, and URL attachments. I will explain them very briefly in the other slides. But summarizing, this is how we can publish and subscribe to our library. And now, just a few technical issues, uh, a few technical notes, actually. I have developed this library primarily in Indie, and uh, I didn't have in mind that this could be so much useful for another platform such as Android or iOS. And because of that, a new branch is on development with Nash HTTP. After the development on this branch has been completed, I will release a new version of it that it's mainly on, it's focused on net HTTP by default, it developed by default, and you no longer will need to add two libraries that can, that must be shared with your application. I know that this is a drawback because I am a Windows developer, I'm not an iOS or I'm not an Android developer. And uh, I was primarily focusing on Windows and that's why I chose Indie because it works pretty well. I know that many of us, or many of 
us or many of other Delphi developers may be criticizing me already because because of this and I should have actually done this in HTTP since the beginning but no worries I am working on the release on the development of this branch and we will soon have this option by default in our library actually I, I am finishing some tests the branch is right up here net HTTP you can choose by your own your own tests but I'm working to release the the fast as possible keeping the quality of the code and trying to maintain compatibility with other Delphi versions like older ver versions of Delphi well about the steps this is what happens net HTTP can be implemented on any platform but I'm the, I am on, on progress to to release it and Indie only supports Windows for the moment concerning the steps that I previously told that I have omitted it's because you will have to share these two libraries in your application the LibAI and SSL, SSL AI 32 they are the open SSL that Indie needs to make the secure communication protocols and etc for publishing only for subscribing you don't need to utilize these two libraries okay but as soon as the branch is been completed the development of the branch has been completed you only have to do it's one thing for those who would like to use ND they will have to go in this path and add a compiler directive in the project so the library can behave to utilize Indie instead of Natch HTTP. By default, the library will utilize Net HTTP, but if you want to switch to Indie, you will have to provide this directive compiler in the project here. You can go to Project Options. Let me remind here just just really quick project options building Delphi compiler and then you can place this conditional define right up there project options building Delphi compiler project options building Delphi compiler and here conditional defines I always struggle a little bit to find this this path and here is where you can place the conditional defines if you place like this the library will behave to utilize indie if not will behave to utilize net http by default okay of course this has not been implemented yet the default behavior for the moment to the release to the version 1.0.8 two it's using indie but as soon as this branch is is finished in the development another release will behave completely different i'm working and uh, if you want to contribute as well for other features and things of the gender feel free because this is an open source project I hope this has been clarified. If you have any questions later, we can call a little bit more. So let's see a little bit on a little bit on utilities and examples and some minor use cases of the library. Okay. Some utilities. You can make several operations with Notify. Not all of them are currently implemented in our library, Notify for Delphi. But most of them are. In general, you can use Notify for Delphi for the following operations. You can send simple messages with it. It's quite straightforward. I said this a lot of times here. Uh, view actions. You can utilize action buttons in the notifications. These action buttons are simply buttons that 
redirect the user to a certain place or a certain website and uh, these actions view view action buttons they do this if you click the button you will be directed to a certain page or a certain site or you will open an application and you will see something so this is these are view actions HTTP actions there are they are actions that execute HTTP requests so for example if you have a button and there is an action HTTP action in this button you will have to make an HTTP request because this is an action HTTP action button they execute HTTP requests we can also send files with notify for Delphi you can send uh, images you can send whatever type of file do you, you, you want the files are stored in the server for up until maybe three hours or something yes three hours which is enough time for the user to download it you can send simple emails the email is attached with the IP address to avoid abuse you know you can add or you can attach icons or tags in the notifications with our library and you can also send URL attachments these URL attachments are any data type like videos or images and so forth there are some few use cases that it's useful the first example are login alerts let's suppose that you have a computer a machine and you want to be notified whenever you have a login in that machine so if you've been hacked or if you have been if someone has access to your computer you may receive a notification that someone has accessed your computer and uh, login alerts are a very common example that notifications are useful for there's uh, this other point it's the famous example that you forget how many spaces are in your disks and uh, there's you can receive an alert of how many space or how many avoided space still remains and notifications can be also useful for this there is a very specific feature that it's interesting for when you are deploying a project and you want to be notified about the deployment of that project after deployment is finished or it's over or when your website or another project has been successfully deployed you can use github workflows and uh, receive the notifications that it has been completed you can execute rem remote commands with this kind of software and like for example make remote commands to make a big a big cap or turn off your machine the sky is the limit and you have to use the imagination here we also have low battery alerts this is very very common right and also and also we have health check logs that they are utilities that linux has to you know and you under understand or be notified by your tasks in Linux. I said before that you have the hosting option, self-hosting option, because notify differently from any other notification service allows you to host your own server. The message manager works just the same way like the official server and you can also create secret topics that are accessed with credentials I told before that the URL are public so if someone gets your URL they can connect to it and they can send messages through it but if you have uh, put some sort of authentication of some sort of credentials this would not be this would not be allowed so the library already exposes some interfaces some functions that you can provide your username or your password they are encrypted in base me in base base 64 
So it's very important that you use HTTPS because it's plain text, right? And there are others. There are other minor minor features as well, like Android disabling Firebase and uh, cache. This is here. This here is for the official server owner. So let's see this a few look uh, a few of examples before we finish our presentation. The first one will be with GitHub workflows. As I said before, we can receive the notification after the deployment of a GitHub project. Okay, it's it's quite a straightforward because it's quite simple. You just need to add a new GitHub action, and in this new GitHub action, she m must be possible. She must be able to make an HTTP request, and we have to set up it with our notify parameters. So. Here is an example of my GitHub. I have created this action that whenever is is successfully deployed, I send a notification to my to my topic, and I receive this notification with my library. It's very simple. This here it's another example with a Windows service. Whenever the service is start, or whenever the server starts because the machine has started and uh, someone has logged in the machine i send a notification that someone has logged in the machine so here it's how can we utilize it with our library very simple you have logged on your pc at certain date and a simple title Here's another example of a notification with support with to an action button. Any device with support for opening the geolocation URL can redirect the user for this specific app, for example, Google Maps and so forth. So this one is Google Maps. You have a view action and this other one, it's also in a view action that all it's utilize it to open the Gmail. Depending on this URLs, these protocols, geolocation or mail, you can direct your app to open the specific app application you want. Right? Very simple. And here it's an example of how we can send files with our library. The files I was already mentioned, they are stored in the server up until three hours, which is enough time to the user to download. And it's very simple as well. We just need to inform the file where, where our file is. We just need to inform the path where our file is and then use our attach file function with the value. After this, we just need to publish. I forgot to put here, but you already understood. So that's it, my friends. I really hope have, you have enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And uh, again, sorry for my pronunciation, any mistakes of my grammar. I hope you have understood me. And let's pass to the Q&A session now. If you have any question, you can just put in the chat. We will, we will we'll love to hear from you, any feedback, and uh, I hope you have really enjoyed. Thank you. Hello, what a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed that. I, you know, Delphicon's had so many good uh, uh, presentations, but that's one uh, I found particularly useful. And I'm going to uh, use that, um, uh, uh, I think, probably in my own projects. I, I, it wasn't a project I knew about until... Um, Delphicon earlier in the week when we talked about it. Um, we're just getting a little, there we go, they've just sorted it out. Some gremlins in the background, the producers are nagging people to turn things on. Okay, well, uh, the good news is uh, it's been a very lively Q&A, and I've actually got Samuel and Dion uh, both joining me live. Hi, guys. Hi, Ian. Samuel, you're a little bit quiet. We can just about hear you. You have to, we'll, we'll let him fiddle with that. How's that? 
say something exciting, Mike. Still a little bit quiet. Might might be that your mic is coming out through your camera or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in hearing microphone, but it seems that I'm not going to get a volume higher than this. Okay. All right. Well, you're very quiet. Uh, you're very quiet. We'll, we'll we'll let you work that out because I've got there's plenty of questions. So <laughs> you've been typing away rapidly. So I think you you probably covered a lot of them anyway. Uh, so it's good. Um, okay. So. Um, I've actually got my own question, um, and I didn't ask it in the window, but uh, to me, this looks actually quite similar to MQTT. Um, MQTT, mm -hmm. for those that don't know, is a similar kind of um, notification protocol where you've subscribed to uh, things. It's used in, in uh, IoT, Internet of Things uh, applications quite a lot, and there's been a few articles on it. Would you say that's probably a fair description that it's a kind of similar thing to MQTT? Well, it's a bit similar to MQTT, but the mechanism is it's uh, actually even more simple because it's only plain HTTP, you know? Yeah. So it's even more simple. I, I like that. Uh, just, okay. just plain HTTP and HTTPS. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, and, and I also got that um if people want to uh use this on mobile they can use the client um straight away and that will work but the server there's still some work on, um, ongoing with that is that right yes uh, actually there is no server option for windows but in applications uh, it actually it's only a library a client library and it's not a server library the server uh -huh. is actually made in go and uh, you have to have another client connected to the, of course, to, to the server. So <laughs> it's, it's very, very simple. I just have to say that's very, very simple. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was impressed at how simple it was. And that's the thing that, um, you know, with anonymous uh, methods or anonymous functions as you was using, uh, it makes it very straightforward to create it. And I liked the initial demo where, you were doing it as a console app and, and making it. I, th I think you did an excellent demo. I had some brilliant ideas, like uh, having a service that notifies people you've just logged on. I, I love that. Uh, that. That's the ultimate um, spying tool, I think, for people saying, ah, ah, they've logged on to their computer, so I know I can message them. <laughs> Send it out as a service. Uh, uh, I think yes, um, I demonstrated um, with a simple console application, but actually the library has another DCL application that you can run and, and try to have a playground as well. Brilliant. It's really good. Um, I'm going to go through some of the questions, apart from many, many people saying hello to us. And Patrick Primatan and uh, Dania suggested instead of saying hello to every country that's joined, we should just say hello world, which I thought was a genius thing for a, uh, to say to a bunch of programmers. Uh, and let's have a look. Okay, so um, Raphael said, is this a kind of message broker? Um, kind of, I suppose. Yes. The, the, we can, you can utilize for messages as a message broker as well, but the intent is just to push notifications. You can utilize for as a message broker. Yeah. And, and uh, I think you answered this question during the um, the um, uh, uh, presentation where he said, uh, am I able to actually create my own NTFI server? And I think you said, yes, you can. You can. You can create a server on a Linux machine or uh, Mac OS, but in Windows, you have to utilize a Docker image because there is no server option for Windows. Yeah, excellent. And another question was, how does authentication work? And also, how do you specify the, the host name for a custom server? So if someone writes um, writes a, a, an app, what's to stop people, you know, seeing the traffic going out and then trying to, uh, I'm guessing it's encrypted anyway, but uh, um, what's to stop people just joining your server and sending messages and then all of your, uh, your clients are suddenly getting alerts from, Buy my new thing, you know. <laughs> subscribe to this horrible uh, gambling site or something ridiculous like that. Is there some form of authentication? There is uh, authentication interface where you can put your username and your password. As I said in the in the presentation, the authentication it's actually a basic authentication. We have no OAuth authentication. You just you put your username, your password. You encrypted everything on page sixty four. 
and that is transmitted through the network, but you have to utilize it to PS, of course, because yeah. it's plain text. Yeah, so to stop it being intercepted, HTTPS is the thing to do. And I, I think um, when I've used MQTT, uh, what I've done is actually encrypted the packets. So uh, whatever I was sending, if it was a string or something like that, I actually encrypted it and then had a, a little um, um, of its own token. I think I used a JWT token or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that I, I actually built on top of that protocol and added my own authentication. So yeah, you could subscribe to my uh, my um, uh, server, but it wouldn't help you at all. You 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 couldn't read what I'd been sending backwards and forwards. And because of that authentication token that I'd built into it. Um, if someone did intercept that traffic, it, it wouldn't help them because they wouldn't be able to send it out and the clients then filter out the things that aren't authenticated. So I, I think um, the basis is quite simple and then maybe you build on top, you know, your own uh, kind of technology. Um, Patrick, uh, our very hard working MVP, who is always in the, the chat rooms and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't sleep because we're always quite late. He said, is there any max quota of usage on a server? Except the operating system and sockets available, you did answer it. Michelle. I'm not uh, very sure. I'm not very sure, but I, I remember it's quite, uh, quite max, actually much lower than five days. But you know, for notification services, you're not going to need much, and it depends on two things. Depends on the bandwidth. If you abuse the bandwidth, if you start sending large files, large images, and and the server, the official server, will actually block you. And uh, I think there is a limit of almost 20,000 or 70,000 messages per day, something like this. Right. I don't know, but it's quite high. For a notification yeah. service, is enough, you know. And of course, if you're hosting your own server and it's your own bandwidth, then there, you know, you can uh, decide that there isn't a limit, and uh, or however you want to limit it. And I guess that overcomes that if yeah. you want to store lots of big files then go ahead but uh, it's your bandwidth so, yeah it's uh it you could can be read a little bit on their yes you can read yeah. a little bit on their documentation they know how to they explain you how to set up your servers with your desired limits but this is everything on the documentation i cannot remember right now yeah no i'm always the same i, I kind of know things and then my head fills up and it starts to spill out and i forget something so <laughs> Yeah, it's very, very interesting. I, 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 like I say, I hadn't come across this project before, but I did hear about it earlier in the week and thought, wow, that's good. And I looked at it and I've starved the repo. Anybody else uh, who is uh, interested in doing this should also go to the repository. Um, I did actually make a note of what it was. Let me just, um, is it uh, Hazelnuts? Is that your repo or is it someone yes. else's? That's yours. Okay, well. That's you. Okay, well, I'm going to um, add that so that I can actually uh, put that up on the screen. Like that. That's your repo, isn't it? Is that correct? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Okay. I, I didn't want to publicize anybody else who suddenly uh, um, forked your uh, your repo or something like that. I mean, I'm glad they forked it, but let's uh, let's make sure you guys get the, uh, the, uh, the stars and the uh, kudos for it. Okay, so... Um, Let's have a look what else. I did start some other questions. Um, I think you covered this in the um, questions and answers anyway, but what happens if the server connection is broken? Um, does the library try to reconnect automatically? This is from Francois Piet, uh, is also an MVP. Um, is the application code notified? No, the application is not notified. And uh, this is uh, this is not meant to be implemented in the library. I can do this as well, and actually all the person when to contribute, but for the while, you can use a call option where you can only send one request and then you disconnect. And then if you you can put a timer or something like that that stays looping, the short calling option, I will explain it. But if the server is broke, the application will simply stop receiving the notifications. It's not meant to display anything that uh, right. it has stopped. But this is something yeah. to be improved. Yeah, and MQTT, which is a similar thing, has a quality of service. Uh, it's called a QoS, and you can then say, just send this. Try and send this once, and give up if it doesn't work. Uh, try and send it repeatedly uh, with a number of times. And the last one is, send it until it definitely comes back and works. And I, I think 
Um, if people are looking for something that's a guaranteed protocol, then maybe MQTT is more for what they're looking for. But this is more about notifications. It's your best efforts to get the notifications out. But if the server doesn't work and it's crashed, then it's like UDP. You send the packets out, but there's no uh, real acknowledgement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, which actually makes it simpler because you don't have to look for anything because you just send it. And, and more fast. Yeah. yeah, which I, I like. Uh, what did I recession? That's a similar question. Oh, I think you answered this question as well. Um, what port is used because of firewalls? They wanted to know how, uh, which port to configure. Well, ISIS HTTPS, of course, in port 443. Normal HTTPS, and I would find any, any HTTPS work on, on, this, on this port. And uh, I'm not reminded, but you, I think you can configure this in the server as well. You have to take a look at the documentation. Yeah. So, so uh, I'll just recap what you're saying. Um, because it's HTTPS, the standard port for that is 443. And um, that's okay. how. Uh, SSL works, and that's how, how HTTPS works. And uh, if you want to try a different port, it's probably not going to work for certainly for browsers and things like that. That's not how that they're designed to um, work. Yeah, it's, it's theoretically possible to send encrypted traffic down any port, really, at the end of the day. But uh, and the, the other thing as well is that I've said this before in a different presentation if you're having trouble implementing SSL, then you can use a reverse proxy. Um, like Nginx will actually do the reverse proxy for you. You can then um, proxy the HTTPS port out. So if uh, you, you can talk HTTPS, but your server can't support it for whatever reason, um, or you can't uh, get the SSL certificate onto the right place, um, you can use a reverse proxy and it will move the traffic around and then point to your server. You can also use um, Let's Encrypt for the SSL as well, so you can get the certificate from there. But, um, Really, the open uh, SSH, uh, open um, SSL uh, uh, libraries cope with all that kind of stuff anyway. That's what it's there for. So. And as you said, um, you do actually use that um, with your your apps. So, uh, what's the other one? Quite, I didn't quite understand what this question was. It, um, what is oh, the one time one time password? You can ah, couple the keyboard okay. with this. <laughs> With this library it works pretty well but one time password is totally different from uh from uh the, the focus of the presentation you can couple with it like to generate an OTP to the client and you send him you can use notify to display him in his client that the, the OTP password and you can couple it it, it, it actually it's an, another idea great idea to do this yeah that's actually a great idea and I, and I think uh, what I like about this is that it's almost a kind of independent solution um, because you can run your own server and you, you know, you've got all the code there to, to uh, create the server and you've got the code, the entire source code for the client as well. I really like this idea because I like the idea of the concept of owning the end to end solution rather than relying on Firebase, which you know, may or may not be around forever. Uh, and I, I, I really like this solution. I think the project is great. I think what you know the code that you've done is, is a, extremely interesting, and uh, and I'm definitely going to look into. It. I am actually working on a project at the moment that could use these notifications. And one of the things I was just looking at was one-time passwords. So <laughs> I think you just uh, solved a couple of problems for me there. So that's that's great. Um, we're running out of time. Um, but thanks a lot, guys. As as ever, Dion is always here, and he's like some. Uh, Thank you, Dion, for uh, coming as well. Support me. Yeah. Samuel yeah. asked for my help, but he could stop, talk all by himself. Is is his first international lecture? Dion, is so it really? Well, really? don't make it your last because that was an absolutely excellent presentation. Uh, you know, really Thank good you. job, and and it's a lot of fun to um, see this. And uh, and uh, as I say, the great thing about Delphicon is. I've been a developer for 38 years. There's not much I haven't seen. I've worked in COBOL and Unix and all sorts of weird things. And I do not stop learning. Every single day that something comes up, and DelphiCon this week has been, there's been a lot of good sessions. And this session is one of the ones that I particularly enjoyed. So thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, John. And you. Yeah. I okay. All right. In the chat and if you have any questions, I, I would, sorry. I yes. 
stick around and I'll answer the questions because the, uh, um, you know, we will uh, turn your video off so that you can uh, actually live a life and do some things and without worrying that everybody's going to watch. But, um, but uh, answering the questions is perfect. Okay. Um, Martha's not messaged me, but I think we're going on to the next session now. Is that right, Martha? Martha's our producer. I'm not just talking to a random invisible person. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, the next session is coming up now, and that is avoiding memory leaks and dealing with Delphi exceptions um, from Myco. And uh, we'll be back later with a live Q&A again, I believe. And I'll be there as well and watching along. Keep watching, everybody. Speak to you later. Welcome everyone to DelphiCon 2023, when we are celebrating 28 years of, of our loved Delphi. And in this session, we will see how to avoid memory leaks and how to deal with Delphi exceptions. And this session was written by me, Michael Dory, and who are speaking here is John, because Michael couldn't speak here today. So, uh, in your agenda, we will see memory leaks, why do they matter, uh, how to deal with memory leaks, have memory leaks any relation with exceptions, how we can deal with exceptions, and who I am, uh, uh, Michael Lopez Dari, a long-time Delphi developer, senior developer at Acusoft, outsource company from Brazil, and I uh, certify a Delphi developer certified master of the right so memory leaks why do they matter well the first uh, thing that we have to put on the table is that who manages the memory of your application one of the many responsibilities of the operational system is to manage the memory we are talking about memory uh, random access memory memory run okay so Mother of God is this operational operational system that manages our mem our memory run, okay? And other mother of God moments in Delphi, we do not have a garbage collector. And if you are a long time Delphi developer, this is not new for you. But if you are a newcomer or if you uh, learn it to to develop in other languages like C sharp. Uh, JavaScript, you this information may be shocking to you, but even if you are lo a long time Delphi developer, uh, stay calm that we will see many things that may be matter to you too in this session, okay? And just remember that Delphi is very updated, is a tool that almost every year has a new version, so this whole uh, phrase here is not completely true by now the true is in the file we do not have a garbage collector for win 32 64 bits and that's okay but for other platforms we have POSIX 32 memory manager right and this is other thing and we will not talk about this uh, memory manager in this session we will only focus in this win 32 and in 64 bits and how we can solve memory management problems in this architecture okay so uh what is memory leaks why do they matter in windows environment right well uh we must start with variables there are nothing but nicknames to memory segments right so everyone knows that and variables when we choose a class or uh, a class instance, an uh, object, we are also using just nicknames to access more complex structures, right? So this is clear to all of us at this moment. But uh, variables are nicknames to memory. We create an object, we fill that memory with a class structure. And when that class structure is accessed by instance of an object, a uh, method calling, or a uh, proper setting, anything that uh, manipulates that object pass through that uh, memory that we allocate when you, we instantiate that object, right? 
freeing that object from memory doesn't change the object structure. When we free some memory, we are just telling the compiler that we are not using that structure anymore, right? But we are not uh, cleaning that memory area, right? We are just saying to the compiler, the operational system, that we are not using that object structure anymore, right? So, uh, it gives us two scenarios, right? We have, when we instantiate an object, we have to, after use that object, we, ha we have to tell the compiler that we are not using that object anymore, as well as when we want to use some object, we have to in instantiate it, right? We have to declare its create, its class create, its class constructor, and if we don't know, if we don't do that, uh, that variable will contain garbage, right? Uh, I don't go through stack uh, variables and heap variables. I think that maybe uh, this could be very, very more complex uh, uh, theme for this session. I only will say that local variables maybe will not be initialized, initialized and we have initialized them before we use them, right? Even if, if we are using that local variable for objects or for uh, object instance, right? And the only uh, type that we do not need to, uh, re we not require the initialization is the string type, right? Well, uh, usually then, memory leaks are segments with invalid reference, like in this scenario here. I have a simple variable and I instantiate some object. I use that object here, right? And after that, I just comment here the free. So in abstinence of this line, I will have a memory leak, right? Because I are not freeing this object. Of course, your systems are not look like this, right? Like the, this simple method here, but it's just this step, the first step to we understand what we are talking about. And not free some used memory, that memory will continue to be referenced. We must avoid that. But how avoid it? So how can we avoid that in some places of our system, any kind of condition or any kind of uh, behavior of our system, uh, avoid to have this particular uh, comportment here. Well, uh, first of all, we can use report memory leaks on shutdown, right? Is a, a Delphi native uh, resource. And with this resource, we can uh, monitor our application and see how many memory leaks are available at this moment in our application, right? And if you want to use, if you are already done using this, this flag, I recommend you to use with conditionals and isolating in a, in a set of debug uh, configurations. So in your release application, you, you will not have the, the alarms of uh, some leak has been det uh, detected by this uh, memory reporter, right? And this reporter, again, is a native solution from Delphi, then we list to us all the memory leaks that we have, right? And in this simple example here, I, I, uh, in the next step, we'll show you the source code. It's very, very easy to see how a, a leak is generated and how, can be how it can be detected, right? And we also has the register expected memory leaks, and maybe we can go around some leak that we already don't know how to solve, but we already can identify where is it that pointer, so we can use this uh, native method all as well. Uh, let's see this in source code. Uh, I put here the creation of my leak object right and this method here will instantiate it and in this step here 
I will resist this expected memory leak. If I run the application but not click in this button, we will see that after my application, I have the uh, alert here saying that I has have a memory leak. And if I run the application, but this time uh, releasing, registering the memory leak in this method here, I will still have the memory leak, but I will not be referenced. Right, so, uh, if this do not solve the memory leak, what are you talking about? It? <laughs> okay, because usually, guys, our system will much more be like this, right? If you already don't monitor your memory leaks and you just go there now and put your your memory leak uh, reports uh, as true, you will see that maybe if you are not writing uh, a very structured code, you will have a very large uh, list of memory memory leaks, and this large list of memory leaks uh, is not usually easy to solve. And many times we don't have access to some uh, leaks. We don't have access to some source code that maybe it depends on third part uh, code writers. So. For many cases, we don't have even the the ability to solve that memory leak. And for these cases, maybe register expected memory leak can exist to us. But notice, register memory leaks only work because I know where is the pointer of that leak, right? And usually when we just see the, the report, as you can see here, we don't have the the address, the address memory, right? In the native uh, form of memory leaks, we don't have access to the to the pointer. So how can we identify what pointer is that? And how can we solve or register that pointer? Well, uh, if you already have some uh, DevOps configured, okay, uh, CI CDI, on your uh, development process, uh, usually what we recommend, you freeze these memory leaks, right? You generate a, a log based on, on your current uh, memory leak state and just put on your CD uh, or Sonar Cube or any other tool that you use to validate your search code that you will not allow any new memory leak. Right, and after that, you go to every new code that you write, uh, blocking, okay, that you will not allow any new memory leak, and with some time we go back to you, your previous list of memory leaks and solve each one by one. But again, even with these tools to map and not allow new memory leaks, you you still have this large amount of memory leaks and you have to deal with it, you have to solve it. And how we can so identify where is that, that memory leaks? Well, for identify and solve uh, this particular memory leaks, I will recommend you complementary tools to map and solve these memory leaks, right? Uh, with only the report uh, memory leaks on shutdown, maybe it will be very hard you, for you in a large and a complex system to identify and solve all your uh, memory leaks. And these two blogs posts here maybe help you. This one is from Embarcadero itself, right? And they show how to use the leaker and even with a, a small video on YouTube, so you can watch it, it's very simple to, to install this tool and use it in Delphi to see what line of code generates that me particular memory leak, right? And from LandGraph, we have this very complete blog, blog post here that lists many, many, many tools to deal with, with memory leaks, uh, some free, some commercial, right? And 
all this list of memory leaks tools will help you to identify each line uh, generates that memory leaks, how you can solve it, uh, can generate logs for you from where that leak are being generated. So we'll help you and we'll make the, the solving memory leaks prob problem a very simple process, right? So these uh, two links will be in this uh, PDF presentation that I put on, on GitHub. So when you can go to GitHub, get the source code, you also will get this uh, presentation links and you can access that. Uh, so memory leaks related exceptions. Well, uh, as we can see here in this example, many memory leaks also can generate exceptions. If we do not initiate uh, a variable, right? If we do not create the variable here, I can see in runtime, we can see in runtime that this process will generate an access violation, right? And other way that we can maybe or maybe not have uh, an error with related with uh, memory leaks is when we instantiate and we free that object and after we freed the object, we try to access it again. Uh, these are more complex case because of what I told you before that uh, in this case, the memory will not be uh, completely destroyed by compiler in this free instruction here, right? The free instruction only tell that we are not using that memory yet, but uh, that memory will stay in the shape that we create that object. So this source here that are being executed after the free, free command can it cannot work in this time will not have an exception but with a more complex system with a more complex structure maybe we can have some access violation in this line here as well right and so uh, memory leaks can link us to exceptions and this kind of exceptions can be hard to find and solve, right? So notice we started with memory leaks or not initiable variables, and we are now dealing with the exceptions that that memory leaks can generate to us. And this kind of uh, exceptions are hard to find, hard to solve because it's not a, a integer value conversion, it's not a server not found, it's an access violation and only say that and we don't have the idea of this uh, memory address where is this where it is to go there and find the solution and many authors uh, not a compatible uh, structure uh, but just uh, for concept uh, classify exceptions in list at least three types right check it exceptions like file not found uh, error exceptions like server not found and runtime exceptions that uh, will go through all those exceptions that uh, we developers generate in runtime and all these uh, related to memory management exceptions can be put in this uh, particular type here uh, this particular type we can solve avoiding memory leaks or bad initializations in our system right so how can we deal with that uh, how can we eliminate this uh, behavior from our systems well first of that we will see that uh, many authors also link uh, exceptions or uh, access of exceptions with bad performance uh, even being a, a small impact it has one so think about it as well right and the fundamental way to deal with exceptions in Delphi is through uh, try except block, right? We will not go to every detail of try except block here, but it's a more more simple way to deal with exceptions. And of course, more complex system, uh, try except block maybe be not enough, will be not enough for us. And where, what we can do in this kind of scenario? Uh, we can use inner exceptions. Uh, other native solution from the file so we can easily understand the path that exception to, uh, took 
right? And we can see this in this exception here, in this process here. Let me just finish my application. And this line here, I was rising a outer exception and putting a new exception on some exception stack that are generated in some uh, other method. Okay, some inner methods will uh, uh, rise an exception and this try block here will catch that exception and put it uh, through my uh, through my through the the rise with my, uh, a new exception that I can uh, in a log after this rise uh, watch and, and try to understand where the exception was generated and let's see in the runtime if it make it more easy more understand so here we have one exception after that other and other and other again and other on so, so bug has occurred and i can see all the steps that the exceptions came through right after this function call here uh, this one has generated other method call other method call and in the finish method call i have just the rise exception so with inner exception maybe will not be more easy for us to understand all the pass through that the exception took and go there and try to solve it uh, maybe it's more easy to read this that to read just a, a av uh, main server, right? And even from from the user, user can read more easily if they see a, a complex list of what maybe can be wrong, or what option maybe he has uh, took or selected that are not working well. Uh, instead of just saying this uh, access violation window here, right? And uh, we also have other native solution from Delphi to deal with exceptions. Uh, that is application on exception event. And this simple here we already are using. Stop our memory tick. And here on the form create, we are uh, setting this event. It's just a simple uh, of object event, right? With a sender and a exception type. And this will all uh, when every method rise an, an exception in the entire application component. So in any moment of your uh, runtime life of your system, if this event is present, is present on your application component, and any button click, any event rise an exception, this exception will be generated, will be directed to this uh, event here, right? And you can uh, going through all the inner exceptions here. And after that, generate that list that I, I show you before, right? And just please be very careful with this uh, event here to not generate ex exceptions from this block, right? <laughs> if you generate uh, some exception in this uh, particular event, your application maybe go through uh, eternal loop, right? So, so pay uh, a good attention on that. Okay, but uh, this event will help a lot because uh, we'll not have to to put it in all uh, method call that we have in our application. It just put on general uh, application component, and immediately all the application exceptions will go through this method, right? Even for for writing logs, this is, this event is very good. And uh, talking about writing logs on exceptions, I have this uh, TMS automated exception log uh, solution to tell you. And this solution will automatically uh, register all exceptions on a cloud provider server from TMS. 
So if you are trying to deal with some complex uh, errors and you don't have access to many logs, maybe this solution will help you out with that situation, right? And that method call can be put at here on application reception. Of course, this application reception will rise for every exception on your system. So if you usually are using exception to uh, just inform simple things on your uh, form validations or any other kind of method validation on your application, uh, all that method will also register a, a exception log on your cloud provider. But you can maybe easily go through that uh, testing the exception type on your own exception method and only register the exceptions that you wanted to solve, wanted to identify, wanted to understand what's going on, right? Okay, uh, so back to tools that we have to solve exceptions problems. And after that, we go through a small recap. And in this recap, we will see memory leaks must be avoided, right? So uh, again, memory leaks, all the memory that we do not register, we do not uh, read that we used, will be registered as a memory leak and will stay in operational system memory until the machine was uh, restarted, right? So uh, take care and avoid. Your system can uh, run more slow. Your applications can run more slow with uh, many uh, memory leaks. Your, uh, the operational system can put your application on swap mode swap mode so your application will, will run more uh, slowly than other applications of that machine uh, all of that can be avoided if you look out for memory leaks and avoid them right we have extra tools that can help us on this path uh, as i told you and show you the link uh, eureka log we have medexcept we have the leaker uh, many tools, even free tools that you can use to understand where your memory leaks are occurring and how to solve them, right? And exceptions maybe will be related to memory leaks or bad initializations, right? That a tricky situation because uh, this kind of errors will be uh, usually access violations, right? And access viola violations are very tricky to solve to identify and to uh, correct them and after that we have many native ways to deal with any type of exception interceptions application on exception event even the the try except blocks from the ofi that we we can use but these other solutions maybe will help you as well as uh, the more complex solution even a record log or meta exception log for exceptions okay they uh, work well with exceptions uh, uh, they work as well with exceptions too but uh, for memory leaks detections i use them on many projects and i see uh, many benefits from using them right so really thank you for your attention and you can contact me at my email here, uh, here in my uh, blog in Portuguese, but you can go there and write any uh, text in English. I will be happy <laughs> as well. And all this source uh, code uh, from this pre presentation, I go, did not go through all the, the options of my application, but you can find all the source in my GitHub, as well as this uh, PDF of, of uh, of this presentation will be there so you can go there download and access all the links that i put here if uh, any of these tips will help you out to solve your memory leaks problem right so thank you again for your attention and maybe i'll be here to answer your all your questions on q a session goodbye well, that was a good session. Uh, lots of very good comments about it. Um, I've been told that Maiko is not entirely confident speaking um, 
English because his native language is Portuguese. But we have Dion with us, and Dion is his uh, his standings. You are the official spokesperson. Is that right? <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There you go. You see, you know, I always say this during our live presentations, it wouldn't be right if everything worked completely smoothly. Poor old Jim uh, <laughs> is having trouble with bandwidth and a few microphones stopped working. Uh, touch with, no, I'm not going to say it, but I was going to say, I seem to be the only one without problems. Of course, now everything will stop working and we'll, we'll be <laughs> in a terrible state. Okay, um, so I did um, make a couple of notes. Um, I was trying to find Myco's GitHub um github uh, uh let me see if i can find it because i wanted to uh, put that up on the screen let me just see if i can uh hmm. uh, he said follow me on github but i don't actually see i see the repository okay I don't think that's him. So we'll come back to that another another time. I've probably spelt his name wrong or something. Um, what I did do was note down um, some of the URLs. Um, let's just have a little, quick look at the questions. Um, we've got ages for the Q&A, so I don't think we need to um, rush too much. And I can probably speak more slowly than I normally do as well, which is a good thing. Um, so let me have a look. Du, 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 pin messages. Here we go. So... Uh, it's not really a question, but it's more a, a, of a statement, which is um, uh, Greg was saying he uses Eureka Log, um, which also catches exceptions and more. Um, yeah, Eureka Log is um, it, it allows you to uh, report things like uh, memory leaks as well as uh, catching exceptions and stuff like that. So that is an alternative. Um, I don't think I, I was doing lots of other things at the same time, so I didn't see. Um, you really you read log mentioned in the presentation, but uh, uh, there is a, a, a lot of um, various options there. Um, what was the other one that I saw? Um, yeah, someone was saying another person had said, um, why is it? And this, there were a couple of answers to this. Why is the same code in Delphi 3 doesn't make memory leaks? But in Delphi 10.4, yes, and I suppose the same would be true of Delphi 11. Uh, and Patrick uh, did answer that, so I'll just put that up. Um, things evolve, and uh, you know, stuff happens. Like people work on components, and maybe you were getting away with something before, and now they've tightened up the code, and it creates a, a, a memory leak. Or it could just be that um, you know you found a genuine problem because. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts in the compiler and a lot of moving parts in the runtime and the IDE, so there could be a memory leak. They do do lots of testing to try and uh, um, avoid that. But then a follow-up uh, answer from Patrick was, and also there's a lot of changes uh, because the later versions of the IDE use um, fast MM, and that was actually what um, you were showing in the video, I think, there, um, Dion, wasn't it? That um, that thing where it says report leaks on shutdown is actually a fast um mm feature isn't it not yes yeah I uh, thought so. many many new leaks are being reported uh many uh, libraries uh, use have leaks and the reporter did not notice that and this new version of of fast mm and uh, even a rack or, or other tools are getting better and better and and capture leaks and even now uh ian we have many kind of memory leaks like uh device context uh many user uh operational system resources that you can unlock and that will not be registered as a memory leak for you and you can have trouble with that and uh, not uh looking at your code maybe uh, generate some leaks that you are not being reported of yeah and that that's the the case that um you know you might not have known there was a memory leak but actually there was and that could be why i, I the thing that always and, and i feel kind of like developers have a certain responsibility and i don't think everybody gets on board with this idea that actually if your program is used on someone's computer you have a moral responsibility to make sure that you fix memory leaks because Windows is not very good at coping with applications that grow and grow and grow and steal memory by accident. 
Um, it's not the case on iOS and it's not the case on Android because if you've got a memory leak, then uh, the operating system will suddenly start to say, hey, there's something wrong with this application and clear you out of memory. And eventually it will just say you're, you're a rogue application. And they do look for it in the approvals process. But on Windows, unless you've gone through the Windows Store and to be honest, the approvals process on the Windows Store is a bit Mickey now, so <laughs> shall we say? But uh, but it, as if you've gone through the process of being tested on Windows, they're probably not going to spot a memory leak. And some of them are very subtle, because if it's just leaking handles and things like that, it can take a very long time before your application actually impacts the the, the computer. Right. You know, um, so this is one of the things. But even so, you know, if you're working with bitmaps or working with larger um, objects that have, take up a lot of memory and you leak bitmaps all the time, it won't be long before people think their computer's slowing down and it's your fault. <laughs> and maybe an only one process has memory leaks and the entire application. So uh, one day you do not go for that process, you will not have no leaks and your application will run just fine and this is the main cause that uh, makes michael do this uh, session because many uh, customers many uh, clients has this problem and one day the application just go down we do not know why uh, going slow uh, we look uh, having four memory four gigabytes of memory allocated on operational system and the clients go why are, how can it be but just one process has the memory leak so it's very important to to monitor all your process to get sure that none of that have memory leaks that's a, that's an excellent point and and in fact a kind of point following on from that as well is that um, once your application starts impacting the system very heavily, or if it's a 32-bit app and you reach a couple of gigabytes, um, what happens is things stop working in your app because you go to uh, show something like a button and there's a whole bunch of GDI memory that's going to be used and, and things like that, and it, you don't have enough memory to do it. And so it, it, you go to create an object and it fails to create it. And if your exceptions and your handling are not done well enough, um, and you just assume that every time you create an object is definitely going to work, then you get even more horrible things happen, like lots of... I mean, it was driving me crazy, because you said you recorded that video, but every time you were testing, it was going, bing! I'm like, oh, <laughs> what's happened to I thought for sure? <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I really like, forgot to put the audio off, and now I'm I, I, re-watching it... I... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think it's very interesting. But I started to twitch after all. I'm like, what is broken? What is broken? I mean, they got so <laughs> Why many apps wrong like... again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, but that's a fact. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing that does demonstrate as well that the user experience uh, as well, because your end user, if they have things happen and, and go wrong, and that that alert message comes up because you have failed to create something or you're using too much memory or something you, know, you run out of disk space which is a different problem altogether then they're going to start getting messages like that it's very quick before someone decides your application is just not worthwhile uh, and it would really be a horrible thing that you spend all this time developing your application you polish it you've got great documentation you've gone through and if you're a commercial uh, developer, you've got the sale, and it's very difficult to get the sale. And you've shook hands, and everything's great. And two months down the line, the customer says it keeps eating our computers. It's using all the resources. You've just thrown away all your hard work because of something stupid like you didn't free an object. And uh, for this session, uh, Ian, uh, we talk about. Uh, I talk about uh, with Michael about. Uh, dependency injection framework, uh, uh, smart pointers, there is interfaces, many other ways to deal with uh, memory leaks. But uh, Michael told me, let's keep it simple because if, if we talk about a very complex uh, uh, memory framework, maybe the, dev the normal day developer will say, no, it's, that is not it's for me. It's too complicated. Yeah. 
Yes, I want to keep it simple. For this presentation, for this session, I want to show simple things, simple way that you, with a simple code, you cannot have memory leaks. You can solve your memory leaks without using smart pointers or other very complex framework to deal with that. And I think that is a great point and, and, and make very uh, reasonable for me when Michael told me that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, every presentation I do, I try and make it as simple as possible. I, and I actually go so far as in my example code, I don't use uh, things like string helpers very often um, because a lot of developers are coming from older versions of Delphi or maybe Free Pascal or something like that. Uh, and uh, there are string helpers in, in those languages as well. But they may um, look at the code and go, wait, what's this function here? I try and make it as pure Pascal as possible so that people um, get it. And I think that's a very good point you made is explain things in a way where people don't say, that would never happen to me because my code isn't that complicated. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. will. It will happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, <laughs> the links that I put at the bottom here are some of the um, Embarcadero blogs as well whilst we've been talking. And I've also um, put Wagner's... Um, uh, link there as well, which is another one that was mentioned. Uh, Wagner Landgraf, he's responsible for, uh, I always forget whether it's um, X data. Or, I know he works with TMS, so um, I apologize, Wagner. I should know this. He's actually quite, I get quite well with him, but um, he's a very smart guy and his catching memory leaks in Delphi is also a good article. Yeah, okay. Um, let's have a look where we are with the chat. Did we cover everything? Um, yeah. last four star i don't know whether he was talking specifically about this he said but maybe you need to play the theme from jaws uh when compiling da, 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 something bad is going to happen but, uh, i think that's more for compilation i think he was talking about um uh, compilation errors rather than that um uh, that, that's the thing with the fast memory manager and the memory leak detection is that it's not really a compile time thing that the compiler can do so much and say it looks like you've done something silly here. You know, you haven't assigned uh, a value to this or you've you've used something in a bad way. Uh, what it doesn't do, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't say you forgot to free this object. And that only happens yeah, really, um, you know, when you're actually running it. Um, maybe a, a, a more robust sort of static um, um, parser would actually go through and say, I don't ever see where this object um, gets free, but that's... That's what the memory leak detection is. Uh, Sonar Cube and many uh, uh, static code analysis tools do that, uh, Ian. So you you have oh, many I... tools to help you. Even the compiler, because even with a, a, a variable not initialized, uh, the compiler tells you, but it, yeah. it compiles as well. So yeah. uh, you can just ignore the the warning and and let <laughs> all the this right. stuff happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, there's some very well-known uh, component vendors who uh, some of their libraries do that, and it really bugs me because when I compile my code, I try and make sure I've got no warnings and no errors. And so when the warnings are coming up and they're nothing to do with me, it's very frustrating. But I normally uh, fiddle around with it to get rid of those. But um, yeah, it's it's one of those things, isn't it? Well, um, I'm not sure if we've got any other questions. Um, it looks like. Uh, oh, actually, there is a question here. Um, yeah, Terry was saying it is Wagner Langraf. Yeah, I know who he is. Uh, uh, I, Wagner is uh, he pronounces it Wagner, not Wagner, um, but it's uh, Wagner Langraf. I know who he is. And um, yeah, you. I don't even know what word that is, web or something. Um, it would be a great function to integrate full debug mode from fast MM. That's a spelling mistake he's got there, into the Delphi IDE. Um, yeah, so if you use the external fast MM um, library, then there are some com conditional compile um, options that they kind of used a lot with Delphi 7, which is a very, very popular and version Delphi, and you could turn on full debug mode, and then it would report absolutely everything, um, even things that were not really critical, um, like a few minor handle leaks and stuff like that. 
Um, I think as far as I'm aware in the IDE, it's, it's kind of doing the next step down from that. So it's reporting um, anything that you used and then didn't free or you did, you, you know, like some assignments. If you do an assignment, you can end up with the memory orphaned and, uh, and go from there. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't do that at the moment. Okay, um, let me just have a quick check with that. There. Ah, okay, I see you put up the... Uh, let me add this in here. And that was Myco's uh, GitHub. Yeah, I didn't spot that until, until I went to there. Um, okay, Martha, um, just I'm going to have a quick word with the uh, producer whilst we're doing it. Just... She's, she's invisible. Uh, but Martha, we're, um, we're, we're probably running out of questions. So if we've got some um, a short video, we'll probably play this in a moment uh, once I've finished speaking to Dion. So if you could just message me in your magic window down here, that would be great. Uh, it's like I've got an invisible friend, isn't it? And I'm talking to them. <laughs> I'm not crazy, honest. <laughs> Uh, it was a great presentation, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's a subject that it, it's worth um, people looking at, um, a couple of people talking about their favourite uh, fast MM4 options and things like that, and saying, there were XE versions that leaked. Yeah, there have been leaks in um, run times and stuff like that over the years. It's frustrating, but, you know, it just goes to demonstrate how hard it is. If anybody thinks that they've totally mastered... Um, memory management and never get get a leak, then by all means, start programming in C++ and you will soon learn you know nothing about memory management and everything leaks because uh, C++ is extremely, um, uh, uh, what's the word? I'm, tricky. I think that's the word I'm looking for. I, yes. I like it. It's a great language and there's a lot of crossover between Delphi and C++. But uh, yeah. Okay, um, Gregor saying thanks for the presentation. Kevin Bond, Dr. Kevin Bond, no less, uh, one of our um, guys that was in, included with the, um, the Code Rage, I think it was, uh, Coding Boot Camp, actually, my apologies. Um, very well-known uh, computer science um, guy. He's liked your presentation, so that's a, that's a big thumbs up from uh, someone who really knows what he's talking about as well. So uh, kudos on both of you. And... Um, we are going to go on then. Um, but, Maiko, if you're listening or you see this on the replay, well done. You did a good job. Uh, you, you have to practice your English. So next time you can come along and uh, chat with us. I couldn't speak a word of Portuguese at all. and I, I can't even say hello, I think. Most languages I try and learn how to say, can I have a sandwich, please? And, yes, I'd like two beers. That's about <laughs> I reckon that can get you very far in life. Uh, um, but unfortunately, Portuguese. Jim actually does speak some uh, Portuguese. He's, he's learning Portuguese. Yes. Um, but Maiko, come on next time so that we can wave at you and say thank you. But, uh, okay. Okay. Well, um, thanks a lot, Dion. Um, and we are going to do some lightning sessions now. And uh, we're, these are just quick um, presentations because we've got some spare time. The next session will start at uh, 11, so on the hour. So whatever time zone you're in, it will be on the hour and we'll be starting on time. And that will be Delphi and Open AI. So stick around for that because that's the big topic. Um, but for now, we are going to a pre-recorded little snippet for you. Any moment. We are excited to announce to you that now the Deleaker supports the Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney. The new release of Rad Studio adds significant new and enhanced Windows capabilities throughout the product in addition to the major productivity and performance enhancements across supported platforms. The Deleaker works as a plugin in Rad Studio in order to help find leaks and optimize usage resources efficiently. In this video, you'll see how the Deleaker integrates with a new Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney and assists developers to find and fix leaks. Launch the Deleaker installer. The installer shows available Rad Studio versions.
Rad Studio 10.4 Sydney is supported. Let the installer add the leaker to the Rad Studio. Ready. Start the Rad Studio. A developer can open the Deleaker window at any moment by clicking to the Deleaker menu. Let's create a new Windows VCL application. Build and run the project. Return to the Rad Studio, open the Deleaker window, and take a snapshot. Let's look at the live objects. They are grouped by the class name. Here is the main form and a lot of other objects. For each object, you can view its size, a source file, and explore its call stack. OK, let's close the application. The process quits and the deleaker starts taking a snapshot. No leaks found, and that's expected. Let's introduce a leak. Add a button to the form. Name it. Double click the button to add a handler. Let's allocate some memory and instantiate one object of tstring list. You will see the way that the leaker finds these leaks. Build and run. Click the button several times.
close the application. The Deleker is preparing a snapshot. The Deleker has found some leaks. For each leak, you can view its hit count, size, source file name, and call stack. To explore leaked objects, switch to Delphi objects. The Deleker has found the T-string list object. Here is the call stack. To navigate to the source code, right-click the call stack and choose Show Source Code. The leaker opens the source file and moves the cursor to the line where the object was allocated. Let's return to the allocations. Navigate to the line where the memory allocated by the getMem function. The final snapshot contains all information about leaked memory and objects, size, hit count, value, and module. It's easy to proceed to the source code to find the location of the allocated resources. Let's close the deleaker, the project, and create a new similar application in C++ Builder. The project is ready. Build it and run. Without closing the application, switch to the IDE and open the Deleker window. Take a snapshot. Here you see a lot of allocations and some live objects as well. Objects are grouped by the class name. For each object, you can explore the call stack. Close the deleaker and the application. The deleaker has found two global objects. Good job! Well, let's add some leaks. Drop a button to the form. Name it. Double click to open the handler. Let's introduce two leaks. Start the debugging. Click the button a few times. Close the form. The deleaker is taking a snapshot. The snapshot is ready. The deleaker has found the leaked object. Here it's call stack. Right click to the call stack and choose show source code to navigate to the source of the leak. The deleaker opens the editor in the correct line. Great! Switch to the allocations and you'll see that the leak made by the operator new has been detected as well. Right click to the allocation, choose show source code to go to the source code. Great, here is the correct line.
The Deleaker is a memory profile for both Delphi and C++ Builder that helps fix memory loss as well as leaks of handles and other resources. It is tightly integrated with RAD Studio to allow developers to locate the source of leaks without leaving the IDE. Happy coding! Fantastic. Uh, and that was a perfect, perfect little filler there for uh, the, the end of the previous session about memory leaks. I really liked that. Um, uh, okay, so our next session is coming up. And this is called uh, Delphi and OpenAI. Uh, is it a blessing or a, a curse? And this is by Marco, uh, who is from GDK Software and is also uh, an Embarcadero MVP. And we are about to start it now. And I, is Marco joining us for q and I'm not sure if he is or not. Oh, we'll find out. There may, there'll be a live Q&A at the end of it. Okay, over to Marco. Keep watching. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about Delphi and OpenAI. I'm Marco Geuze from GDK Software. And the topic of today is Delphi and OpenAI, a blessing or a curse. The agenda of this talk is divided into three parts. I'm first going to show you how to get started with OpenAI. This will be a relatively short part as there's a lot of information you already can find on the internet. The second part is about the integration in Delphi itself using the Tools API. We go into some detail on how to create a Delphi plugin and how to implement shortcuts and forms in Delphi. And lastly, we will connect everything together and see what we can do with OpenAI and Delphi. And of course, we hope to get an answer if OpenAI and Delphi is something you can use in your daily life. All right, just 30 seconds to explain who I am and what GDK software does. I'm Marco Geuze, co-owner of GDK. We have several teams in the Netherlands, the UK and in Brazil working for a variety of international projects and clients. Besides software development, we also do a lot of Delphi upgrades and we have a Delphi Hero mailing list uh, where we regularly publish interesting related Delphi content. All right, that's all for now. Let's get started. Let's start with a clear distinction. OpenAI is not the same as ChatGPT. Uh, OpenAI is a research and development company and ChatGPT is only one of the tools they released recently uh, and one of the tools they get a lot of attention with. But it's not uh, the only tool we're going to use today. The reason why we are using different tools is not only that we are uh, at this moment not really interested in the chat functionality, but that we also want to integrate uh, the tools with Delphi. And as of today, that's only possible with the paid versions. So let me first quickly explain the way uh, the OpenAI tools are available. So we have the free version of the chat GPT tool and probably you've played around uh, with this tool already, but there's more available. As you can see here, OpenAI offers various tools to create images, to translate natural language to code, um, and to perform various other natural language tasks. And of course, everything using artificial intelligence. So the various OpenAI tools are available using a paid plan where you only pay for what you use. So you pay, let's say, for generating an image or for um, creating OpenAI uh, related tasks and uh, do, let's say, grammar, trend, uh, grammar correction. The various uh, OpenAI tools are available using a, a paid plan uh, where you only pay for what you use. So as you can see, you can pay per image or per token, which uh, loosely translates to one word per token. So the first thing you have to do is create an account. Uh, I already did that, so let's obtain our uh, key. So here you can see the secret keys, I already copied this. Um, and you can see the usage uh, per key, so what you actually use. Uh, when you register, you get some grant or credit, so you can start immediately. Um, but if you'd like to use the API more intensively, I'd recommend, uh, recommend to add billing information. So now that we have the API key, uh, let's head over to some examples to show you what you can do with uh, OpenAI. So 
So let's go to the um, examples and here you can see what uh, what is available uh, as an example but of course you can add um, whatever request you have in, uh, into the um, uh, into the open AI API um, so what can you do um, well here you can see some examples you can uh, classify uh, objects or companies in this case where you would say okay I want to have this response and it it will automatically fill in the rest of the uh, of the items you can um, translate um, SQL or, or ask for SQL um, so build a query uh, and you will get the exact query uh, you can parse unstructured data so there's really a lot of things um, you can ask um, so let's uh, go to the playground to uh, see what we can do with Delphi. So the playground, you can specify an input um, using various models. So you can choose a, a specific model. Uh, the most advanced one is the most expensive one, of course. Um, but you can see what works for your uh, actual request. Um, you can specify the amount of tokens you want to use. Um, and as you can see here, I've created a function which returns a, a t-list uh, of type string. Um, and I ask the OpenAI to explain what this actual function does. So if I submit this uh, question, it will come back to us with uh, the explanation of this function and as you can see it's quite a nice answer so you can also uh, ask the open ai to change the function so let's say we want to uh, change this to uh, an i list i can ask uh, change this function to return a interface list um, and maybe add uh, of integers and if we ask this then you will see you get a nice list uh, an interface list um, and it even changes the example code in here so this works really well um, okay now let's go one step further and create a open AI connector in Delphi and um, yeah, why not use the OpenAI itself to help me with that? So for this, let's um, use the chat GPT functionality so you can see how that works. Um, but basically we could um, put this in here, of course, as well. Um, so I'd like to program against interfaces. So um, let's ask the following. Create a class uh, to connect to the OpenAI. AI API um, written in Delphi and because I'd like to program against interfaces uh, let's add using interfaces so we'll have to wait till it's uh, until it's uh, done but it it'll generate um, an interface, as you can see, to connect to this uh, to the Open AI API uh, using Indy in this case, um, and of course we could also ask to use the T REST uh, request if we want. Um, for now, I'll um, I'll use this uh, this generated code. And as you can see, it's not quite right. Um, because it's just um, a interfaced object, but it, the actual connection to the OpenAI uh, interface is not there. So let's ask it again and a bit different.
All right, and as you can see, uh, see in the second example, uh, it actually implements the uh, the correct API um, using HTTPS. Um, it adds the required um, parameters. So this is the actual class you could use. However, there's an easier way of using OpenAI in Delphi. Um, there's a nice uh, Delphi OpenAI API project uh, on GitHub, and you also can get this via uh, the GitHub package manager in Delphi, uh, which provide access to the API. Um, and that's the one we're going to use in, uh, in our example. So here we have a um, demo project with a prompt uh, button to center the actual request and a memo to display the results. Um, if you've not installed uh, open AI, the OpenAI library, you can find it using the Get it Package Manager, uh, searching for OpenAI, and you can install the, the required library. Okay, so let's implement the uh, the button um, to connect to the OpenAI API. So we need an instance of the library. So OpenAI, um, to OpenAI.create. Um, you can uh, paste the key right away uh, when you create it. Of course, you need a key to connect to the OpenAI. Um, so now we have the OpenAI library available. Uh, we can also use various functions within the OpenAI library. In this case, I'm going to use the completion library I showed you earlier in the playground. So I want to use the OpenAI.completions um, and I can create an instance of that as well. So completions, um, OpenAI.completion dot create um, and here we have to uh, give a couple of parameters um, to provide a prompt um, and the maximum amount of tokens the system can use so this is an anonymous procedure um, uh, you have to provide a params And as you can see here, um, you can specify a model. Uh, we're going to use the DaVinci model again. Um, you can provide a prompt and the, um, for example, the, the maximum amount of tokens you want to use. As a default, it's, it's 16, that's not too, too much. So we need to add more um, or to, to increase the maximum amount of tokens. So let's first add a prompt which is the text of our edit box. Um, we want to add the model in here, which is the um, text da Vinci 3. And let's say uh, we want the maximum amount of tokens to be uh, 1000. So that is around 750 uh, uh, actual letters. So now that we have the uh, completions, we can uh, use this and free the completions afterwards because we need to do that. Um, within the completions API, you get um, a list of choices back. So the input results in various choices. For now, I'll just uh, pick the first one. Um, so choice in choices. Okay, so we'll pick the first one and we'll just break out of the, uh, the loop for now. So as you can see here, choice dot um, text is the resulting text, so we'll put this into the memo uh, we created. There you go. Um, 
And let's run this. So, um, as an example, create a class to manage a company uh, written in Delphi. So, um, the system uses my API key, uh, which of course I will change after the presentation. Um, it sends the request and if everything goes well, I'll get a response uh, in here. Um, sometimes it, it takes a time, depends a bit on um, how busy it is at OpenAI. Uh, currently it's quite busy, so a lot of people are using uh, OpenAI. Um, but usually we'll get this uh, result within a couple of seconds, it's now taking a bit longer. Um, I'll just wait for the results. There you go. Um, so I get back a T company class. Um, it adds a couple of uh, uh, private fields uh, and it even creates properties. So currently I can see it's only um, read. You could ask um, uh, the system to give more info to add uh, writable properties or editable properties uh, to make these interfaces, etc. You you get you get it. Um, but as you can see, the so the basics are working. So now we can go to the next step, um, which is see if we can integrate this into the Delphi IDE. We do this using the Tools API. The Tools API in Delphi is the way to build additional functionality in Delphi. There's some information. Uh, to find here at Embarcadero's website. But even better is this GitHub page um, with David Hoyle's updated version. All right, so our goal today is simple. Integrate uh, into the IDE, the code that I showed you earlier, um, to connect to the OpenAI API. So there are several ways of doing this, of course. You can add a separate prompt, uh, for example, in a dockable form in the Delphi IDE, or uh, interpret the code that you're typing. Um, for this demo, um, we choose to activate the functionality using a shortcut and by typing in my question. So we start by creating a Delphi, Delphi package for our plugin. So let's go to here. New package. Uh, let's save it like Delphicon Open AI. And what we have to do is add the uh, design ID to the requires um, because that's the only way you can uh, you can use the tools API uh, from within this package. So design ID. Um, There you go. Okay. Let's now add a new unit um, where we first uh, implement the key binding. So uh, I'll create a OpenAI.key. Uh, maybe let's change the name because this one is already used by the um, library we installed earlier. So Delphicon.OpenAI.keyBindings. Um, and save it somewhere. Okay, so we need to use the um, Tools API, of course. And um, the Tools API uh, has several interfaces uh, you can use. So if you search for key binding, um, you have all kinds of services, uh, interface services you can use in, um, in your own package to um, connect to the Tools API or to Delphi, basically. So let's do that right now. Um, uh, the OpenAI key bindings is a class. Um, you have the T notifier object, uh, which you can use, and here you have a lot of um, interfaces. In this case, we want to have the 
keyboard keyboard binding there you go and we need to implement several um, functions that's that are defined by this by this interface so these are the the functions that we need to define um, so let's say I paste them in here um, and we can use the binding services now to add a shortcut. So add key binding. We have to provide an array of the shortcut. And there's a way of adding a shortcut. I think it's text to shortcut. Uh, so let's say we use uh, control shift F7. And this one is in vcl.menu. There you go. Um, and the key binding has two other properties, which is the procedure um, that's going to be executed if the shortcut is pressed, uh, and some flags. So in this case, we want to create a new procedure. So let's say uh, bind. And we have to define this one, of course. And add nil um, like this. So now we have to define the bind procedure. So let's do that in here. Private procedure bind. And I think uh, there's a certain way of providing the actual um, notifier implementation, which we can find here. Let me see if I can find it. There you go. Uh, so this is the um, the way of defining a uh, a procedure that get called when you press the key button. So I'll just copy the uh, parameters of this one, paste it in here, um, and I think we need to change this one to here. at system.classes. All right. Oh, we got an error. OK. So here um, we have the procedure that gets um, fired if you press this specific key in Delphi. So uh, later on, we will implement um, the OpenAI functionality in here or probably in, in, in another unit. For now, I'll just, um, let's say, I do a show message. Um, dialogs. Key pressed to see if our uh, plugin works. Now we have to do um, some other things to get this to work, which is, uh, implement the binding type, uh, the type, the display name, and uh, the name. So let's say in here we say uh, results would be oh. Delphicon. Um, AI, and the get name uh, should be something like this. And we have to uh, get re uh, get the um, implement a get binding type as well, uh, which is binding type dot partial for now. Okay, and lastly, we have to add uh, something to the implementation and the finalization section of this unit. So the plugin. Um, will be initialized uh, if you install this package. So let me just copy these um, these two lines and paste them here. Um, and we need to uh, create a, for now, just say create a global var or local to this class uh, to store the key binding index. And um, as you can see here, um, 
we need to say, okay, we want to create an instance of this uh, key binding class. And if it's created and Delphi is running, um, remove the key binding from the, um, from the Delphi services. So let's um, install this package and see if it works. Uh, I get an error, let me see. Oh. There you go, so it's installed. And now if I uh, press Control shift f7 we get um, the show message um, we defined here. So as you can see it's quite easy to add a key binding to Delphi. Now we need to do two more things. Um, First of all, check if um, the key code is our actual um, key. So um, let me copy this to here. So in case our uh, key code is the shortcut we uh, defined, then we need to do something, of course. Um, and we should uh, set the binding result um, to handled so this could be t binding result dot handled so now we um, intercept the specific key we defined uh, we do the show message and um, we set the binding result so that we we have actually handled this shortcut so the next step um, is to access the content contents of the Delphi editor. So what we want to do is um, see what a user uh, typed in, uh, give this to the OpenAI uh, API and provide the results back. So let's first uh, see what we can do with the context we get here. Um, so the key context is a interface to um, to several functions um, and I'm going to use the edit buffer in this case to get access to the actual uh, edit buffer in the Delphi ID and if you um, go down to the to the edit buffer itself you can get uh, for example the selection um, so the selected text you can add information or uh, or delete information so let's first try that and see if we can um, can get the uh, the information out of the context so what we will do is instead of the key pressed show message, uh, we'll just show what a user selected in the Delphi editor. So if you go to context uh, dot edit buffer, we can make use of the um, edit block um, <coughs> to see what uh, text the user selected. So let's say selected text becomes this and uh, we show the uh, selected text in here instead of the, uh, the show message we had earlier and now if I install it and test it you should be able to see uh, the text that we selected so let's say I do this I press the key and as you can see I get the um, selected text in here and that's the way we're going to use the OpenAI uh, integration for now. So what I'd like to do later on is uh, select the text, get this to the OpenAI and replace the text with the results of OpenAI. But first we're going to change this a bit so we can actually insert text into the Delphi editor. Um, for this we're going to use the context again. Um, and we're going to uh, pick the edit position uh, from the edit buffer and um, here you can insert uh, let's say a text so if we would say okay we add a, a test in test text in here um, and test this so we install it again we should be able to select some text and it will get replaced by uh, test so let's say pick this one I press the key button and you can see um, the text I selected is replaced by the this text. Um, so now we can uh, implement the OpenAI to, uh, to be able to insert some text into our uh, files. So let's revert this change. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and here I have the uh, form which we created earlier with the, um, the connection to the OpenAI. So if we copy this um, text and put it in a different function in here. So let's say function uh, send request to OpenAI. Uh, we pass in um, a prompt. And we get a result back. Um, we'll paste the text in here. Of course, we need to add some uses. So that will be OpenAI. And it will be OpenAI.completions. Um, and now replace this with the prompt and set the result to the text we get back. And finally, um, we're going to query here the OpenAI API with our selected text and place the results back into the edit buffer. So here we would say for OpenAI results sent request with the selected text. and insert this into our editor. So install this. Probably we need to change some, um, some settings in here because we don't have a component available. Um, we should provide nil to the class. We need to add the rest components and it's installed. So now let's um, put a test in here um, to just to see if it's working. So I'll um, ask the same as we did earlier, uh, create a class to manage AT company written in Delphi. I select all this uh, and I'll hit the shortcut. And now uh, the system will query the OpenAI API and paste back the results. There you go. Um, the only thing is, as you can see here, uh, it's all on one line. So we need to make some changes in our um, code to uh, make sure that we'll get the, um, the this class on separate lines instead of all on one line. So let's first delete this text in here and go back to where we queried the OpenAI. Um, so what we have to do is we have to split the result into um, separate lines. So um, say this will be um, text to insert. Um, what we want to have is an array of string. And we say, okay, the OpenAI uh, open result, um, we're going to split this and we do this for the end of line characters. There you go. So what we now have is a, a list of strings. Um, and what we're going to do is insert these one by one. So for in line in of the text to insert do move this one to here um, and say okay we are going to insert line by line um, we have to add the line break as well uh, because we want to go to the next line and the other thing we have to do uh, is move to the uh, let's one further Edit position. Move. Let me see where I can. Oh, I have the option. That's why. There you go. Move to the beginning of the line. Uh, because if we enter the line, then the cursor will stay at the same position. So you have to move to the start of the line and then uh, paste the next uh, the next line. So let's 
let's see if we can do this. Uh, so we now installed the uh, plugin again. Uh, let me add a new unit because then you can better see what's happening. Uh, we're going to do that again. So create a class to manage a company in Delphi. I select all this text, hit the key, and there you go. Um, so, as you can see here, uh, we have a um, class for managing a company uh, created by OpenAI, including the implementation in here um, with some um, constructor and properties. Uh, I think it even includes a T list, so we need to add some users here. Uh, but it even includes an employee list uh, without me specifying it. And um, the system adds, or the OpenAI API adds some procedures uh, to add and remove employees. Um, currently based on strings, but you can ask this again and specify a bit more uh, the, the type of class you exactly want to have. Now let's um, do some more examples uh, before we come to a conclusion. So um, let's say you want a SQL statement to update a company. Um, you should be able to add it in here. So write a SQL uh, to update the address field of a company. Uh, we select all this and we hit the key again. And there you go. Um, so that's an easy one. But but let's see if we can uh, change some other things in here. Um, so let's say we want to rewrite this. Um, and for this part, we want to uh, extract this to a function. Uh, we could simply say, uh, rewrite this code to, um, a function returning a choice text. Uh, select this all again, hit the key, and there you go. Well, you see a couple of errors in here, so there are some, some enters. Uh, uh, but that's something uh, has something to do probably with our with our implementation right now. But this is a function um, you could extract. Uh, it'll accept a, a, a completion and it returns a string. And as you can see here, it replaces the uh, the result with the choice pin text. So it does work. Um, now for our last example, uh, let's add a new unit again. And um, let's say we want to create a class to connect to Gmail to retrieve emails, again, written in Delphi. We execute the shortcut and let's see what the system come back, comes back with. There you go. Um, right, so it creates this Gmail connection. Um, it uses the string list, so we should use this details. Oh, let's put it on top. Um, classes. It has the implementation, um, and I'm not quite sure if the code compiles. Um, probably not, because there are some errors, I think, in here. Um, but for now, for now you, you get an idea of what you can do with the uh, OpenAI connection we have. So let's go back to the slides and wrap things up. 
So we've built a Delphi package so we can use the OpenAI API from within Delphi itself. Uh, I don't have the time to show you more examples of the integration, but I'm really looking forward to your suggestions on, on how to uh, use this in your daily life. Uh, let me share my findings so far. OpenAI is very useful to uh, create skeletons, skeletons for classes to um, create proof of concepts connecting to various APIs, as I've showed you, and to help you in, in creating functionality within your application. I've used the AI for uh, various tasks, and most of the time it's just faster than Googling something. But it also has its limitations. OpenAI can very convincingly create complete nonsense. Um, Several times I've asked something to OpenAI, uh, got a very nice interface class back, uh, but with non-existing Delphi calls. And then the fun, the fun begins, uh, because suddenly you have to debug code that um, has been written by some tools who can make um, beautiful mistakes. So if we have time at the end of this session, maybe I can uh, show you some of these examples. So. What, uh, what is it, a blessing or a curse? I'm not sure yet, the future will tell, uh, but with the progress being made, I think our job as developers uh, will change and we will increasingly ask for the help of AI. Um, in the end, it, it will help us to develop faster. So, that's it. Thanks for being here. Uh, I think it's now time for Q&A. What a great presentation. I really, really enjoyed that. I've had a great day today. Uh, Jim, Jim not being available, I've been getting to do all the hosting and some fantastic sessions. And the good news is we have Marco live with us uh, today for the Q&A. Hello, Marco. Hello. Hi. Ian. Good what to a see great. You. I really, really enjoyed that presentation. That was an absolutely fantastic um thing it's great to watch class person really that's what i would call you an engineer typing away and actually typing code live in the presentation you, you're a very brave man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, I, that was fun to do absolutely yeah but i think it, it's good as well because as i've said this before when people type code live it shows that even you know really excellent programmers and i i actually consider um based on what i've seen of you you know your stuff People make mistakes, you know, forgetting a semicolon or something yeah. like that. that. That's part of being a programmer. Absolutely. I say this all the time, a developer. Yep. Um, lots of questions, lots of um, positive right. feedback as well, people saying things. Um, so uh, let's have a look at what we've got. Okay. Um, first of all, I think we'll just put up your website just here, which was uh, GDK Software uh, dot com forward slash knowledge base um i went to there if people haven't gone there yet they should do because you've got some really great articles on all sorts of other subjects as well like yeah, uh, university you. and yeah. stuff like that so um definitely worth uh, taking a look if they haven't already done so um with regard to the questions let's go and have a look at what we're doing mm -hmm. um first of all I, i'll really put my comment in here whilst we give that time for those those uh um, that caption to be taken in by people so they can uh, mm -hmm. note it down. And that is what you just did in that presentation. It, I don't know if people really took it in, but I certainly did, that what you just wrote live in 41 minutes was basically code pilot for Delphi. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I you really I did. You, you, you know, I yeah. mean... Yeah, there are, uh, of course, some, some rough edges, so... Um, uh, but but yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh, that's one of the uh, of the great benefits of Delphi. I think that that in, indeed in forty minutes, um, well even less I think because of all the the talking I do, uh, you have something like this, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So so, uh, so yeah. boo hoo to you, Microsoft, because uh, I mean uh, obviously Microsoft own uh, oh. uh, open a, I think they don't own them, but I think they've put a huge investment behind them. Many exactly. Yeah. Years. We, uh, we and, might and I'll use tell you, Microsoft in here, but still, or OpenAI. But yeah, uh, indeed, it's great. Yeah. yeah, Microsoft. I mean, kudos to Microsoft there. I think they they realised that OpenAI was um, 
yeah. obviously the way to go. And I think Google really were wrong-footed by it because they just did a presentation on their own AI offerings. And, yeah. uh, you know, dispassionately, I can say it flopped massively. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's it's nice to see Microsoft scoring over Google for a change. Okay, so um, down to the questions then. Um, someone said here... Um, what, this is more of a comment rather than a question. They're saying with chat GPT, um, you can create the DFM structure for buttons as well and things like that. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you can in, indeed ask. Well, th that's basically sort of the same as we are using um, with chat GPT is, of course, more a conversional style, whereas this one, the, the, the plugin I, I showed you right now is more asking direct questions and getting the answer back. But you certainly can ask questions like uh, give me also the, the the event structure or for the same class and it works so does it quite you, well yeah yeah so is there like a conversation or is it just you can say the ask the question in a way that includes the context exactly the yeah for okay. now with the plugin i have is indeed just a one-off so it doesn't remember what you asked before the chat gpt of course does um so yeah basically the same engine uh, is, is behind both so uh, probably, I don't know, probably there will be an open AI um, API to chat GPT as well. Uh, or maybe yeah. there is already, I don't know. Um, it's it's uh, the DaVinci, is so um, I think by now you also have a uh, the paid version of chat GPT already. While I did the recording, it wasn't available. I think right now it is. So things are moving yeah. quite fast uh, with these, these new techniques. Oh, I, I'm absolutely... I'm positive that 2023 will be the year where AI just becomes so huge that people yeah. can't can't view it as a kind of science fiction anymore. It's a science fact. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there's a lot of discussion. I mean, your 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 heading of your topic was a blessing or a curse, and I think that's actually um, a very good choice because I, I had a conversation. Someone emailed me from one of the other sessions. I, I always get a lot of emails when I, I do mm -hmm. the hosting, and um, Someone asked me that question, did I think it was a blessing or a curse? And I, I kind of went on and said, well, you know, I can see it will not be long before we pick up our cell phones. And when we go to type a message, instead of autocorrect, mm -hmm. it will actually suggest answers in full uh, yeah. based on the AI. And I think we're almost at that stage now. Not, I mean, Gmail yeah. certainly includes that. Yeah, you know? exactly, yeah. And I think that that's something that will happen, if we like it or not, uh, that will happen with the development work we do as well. It will change, uh, definitely. And well, exactly you, how, we don't know yet, but but yeah. Well, um, you did say something interesting that I, I thought would uh, um, definitely um, make a point there, which you said, sometimes it can produce some very convincing nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely the, the case. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. There's yeah. something to watch out for, and I, and I think it's like a lot of things where, um, if you think about it, um, as a developer, when you work on someone else's project, it's always a little bit frustrated because they do things slightly different to the way you do. Or, and if, of course, you know, the AI is probably a combination of all sorts of um, different uh, programmer styles and yeah. ideas. I'm not sure that there is a an open AI Da Vinci code style for delphi i think it's a conglomeration um, of everybody not yet. Not yet. yeah well you i can know. see a time i can see a time where the control d which does the automated formatting may actually mm -hmm. be applied yeah. at the end of the chat uh yeah. gpt or open ai or whatever uh, um ai is in there so yeah. um yeah. okay one uh, particular question where i need to find it which is, uh, let me, sorry. oh, here we go. Um, someone said, is the key bindings unit available to download anywhere? Are the examples that you showed? Yes, yeah, I shared, I think, in the last slide. So if you go to uh, gdksoftware.com slash Delphicon, there you find the links, all the links uh, I, I mentioned. So also to the, the tools API uh, libraries, but also to the GitHub repository where, where you can find this uh, this unit. Yeah, um, so. Sorry, what was the end of that that link? It was uh, the Del Delphicon, Delphicon. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna um, put that in here, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So the answer is yes, it is available, and you can go and get it there, uh, yeah. which is handy. Um, 
Can it do, uh, this is another good question as well, can it do a uh, class based on inheritance? So if you say, now I think I know the answer to this. So if you said, um, can I have um, candy company, which descends from tea company, mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing that because it's not a kind of uh, contextually following on from a previous question, that that would be a lot harder. <clears throat> it will, although if you uh, ask the question like this, so uh, create me a class uh, like of candy company based or descends from company or from tea company or then it will return the right code. So it also um, uh, knows how to uh, do inheritance or like interfaces. So if you would ask, give me um, a tea company class, but interfaced, it will also create an interface for you, include, including a grid or, or and, and all the the, the the properties in there so huh. i'm quite sure it can um or um, yeah the class inheritance itself I, I i haven't tried that yet but i know for sure that if you like ask things like uh, get, uh, based on an interface or based on a certain interface it will just return exactly uh, what you're asking for so yeah uh, do they yeah. do they mention at all um the stopping point at which they stopped training the model because i know with chat gpt they have yeah. a thing where they say it was up until november 21 or something like that so yeah, it didn't I think know so. anything that happened after that so exactly yeah yeah so, probably, so do they... i don't know yeah what, what the latest delphi editions are from uh november 21 would be nice to ask that to see if it knows about that i don't know probably yeah. not indeed probably the, the the training stopped then um but I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah. I, I hope they're going to periodically retrain it because um, the problem is that Delphi is always uh, pushing the barriers and trying to add new features. And some of the new features, like, in fact, it was quite funny because someone did actually uh, comment on, on this and uh, they said, oh, it's very cool, but this uh, open AI library is written, is written in modern yes. Delphi using inline variables and is not compatible yeah. with um, Delphi versions older than Tokyo. Um, I think your examples use the inline variables. Yeah, but yeah. I don't I think really that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think the open AI was returning inline variables, which is uh, uh, no. a different. No, no, no. And I, and I think that's the thing there that maybe there's a little bit of confusion. Uh, Rad know how uh, or however you call yourself. Um, the example was using the inline variables and I, I actually i have to say a little confession here when the inline variables first came out i was absolutely dead set against it i've been a delphi programmer since years ago yeah yeah and I, and I think that's true of many mvps are like no 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 we yeah. can't do this this is complete heresy heresy you know but you know what once you get to start using them it's very addictive because they've yeah. got awful lots of benefits to do with scoping and it just right it Absolutely. makes it easier to write the code the flow of code so yeah yeah so much easier uh, and indeed scoping but that's a completely yeah. other topic yeah yeah and the open ai um unit that you quoted um does that work with early versions of delphi or no same i think because of the inline um variables so it's perhaps not too difficult to to change and and um, get rid of these um, yeah, it's probably e easier to just upgrade, right? Yeah, but yeah. But and, yeah, and no, there's, there's quite a few open AI libraries as well. This is um, from Helmut Jim, uh, Delphi Open AI, and there was another one. Uh, get it has the um, uh, Open AI yep. for Delphi as well. If you're going to get it, and you can see it there, uh, and, and they're not. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that. What's going to happen is there's going to be a big fight over who whose implementation is uh, um, the one to have, and then uh, eventually the winners will come out, and we'll all benefit from it. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a very exciting development um, in terms of what's happening across the world. Um, we've still got a little while to go, so um, whilst we're talking about this, I, 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 this is kind of like a housekeeping thing uh, as well for us, but. Um, there is a the uh, part of this open ai and all the rest of it is the um mid journey um, applications to do with uh, creating images because obviously it's another abuse or use of ai where people are saying i'll oh, take this image of ian and then age it by 20 years so i look like i'm a, a, a corpse or a mummy or something like that or um produce variations and I, I had a hilarious image where it 
it produced what looked like I had four brothers and they all looked very suspicious. So, um, but Mid Journey is an, another AI. And uh, if you go to the blog there and the Delphi Digital Fan Art Contest, there is a competition um, to produce some AI art. Uh, and it's, it's extremely uh, interesting. And there is actually a GitHub repo as well where there's some really great backdrops and um, uh, wallpapers and things like that, which are all AI generated. And uh, I actually went in and edited a few to make them higher resolution and stuff like that as well. But I, I think the problem is Mid Journey makes them into squares. And really, if it's going to mm. generate backdrops, it needs to make them uh, rectangular. But yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, is there anything else? Let's see. Uh, I think that covers all the questions that we've got um, so far. What I mean, what is your take really overall on... Um, where you think the AI is going to be in the next uh, um, sort of year or so? Uh, I mean, do you think it's realistic that there's going to be an add-on? In fact, you may be the guy that creates it. I don't know. You're halfway there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, well, so difficult, think... yeah. Um, I think so. So one one of the other things that that we don't show uh, couldn't show is is like uh, finding bugs in code, let, let's say, or uh optimizing code so there are uh, lots and lots of ways i think to um to 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 be in addition to your daily work um it i think it, it will take some time for for uh, the adoption to 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 everyone to get used to that and to actually use the help of of ai um so will this be within a year i don't know could could be yeah. um you always, uh, it's always difficult to predict these kind of things, but with the progress, you, see, yeah. Yeah, you can ask the AI, but uh, yeah, well, that's uh, a good idea. <laughs> when do you think you will reach singularity and take over the world? Uh, I wonder if anybody's uh, asked them that yet. <laughs> yeah, yes. no, but, but I, I certainly, I, I, it, it, it will um, probably make our lives easier in, in certain ways. So um yeah it will it will have a, um an impact on on the way we uh, we write code so yeah, yeah i think so and, and and hopefully, hopefully, yeah i think it'll enhance us actually i think that's the thing because as, yeah. as you said about your your uh, convincing nonsense i think there's always going to be you know you can hire contractors in to come and help you write code but occasionally mm -hmm. those contractors will write code that you completely disagree with even though it's perfectly yeah. uh compiles and perfectly valid um, exactly. I'm hoping that we will still have a, uh, a future for some time to come. I, I haven't got many years left in my life, but I'm hoping that, <laughs> I think that, 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 that AI, AI is slower than my lifespan. So we mm -hmm. shall see. But it's a, it's a very exciting time. And I mean, I mean it, it, yeah. it is, of course, a, um, you know, con there's controversial um, things about AI as well. And lots of people um, worrying about... Um, you know, what's going to go on in terms of, um, you know, will AI be used in ways that are negative? The one um, thing that came up actually in a conversation the other day um, is to do with the um, blog, um, the blog writing. Someone was saying, I actually edit some of the Embarcadero blogs, and mm -hmm. someone said, um, do you worry about plagiarism by writers or... Uh, or do you worry about them using AI to mm -hmm. produce articles? And there is actually an AI that's specifically designed for writing articles, and that's called Jasper AI. Mm -hmm. And um, ChatGPT, uh, an open AI, was then set to help detect articles that were written by the AI, which I thought was amazing that they now can uh, fight in the, the, them as well. But a lot of plagiarism yeah. tools have incorporated uh, open AI's techniques to spot AI-generated yeah. text. So I don't, I don't know how mm -hmm. that's going to end up. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think that's also one of the, the um, uh, comments I saw, um, that you have to be careful what you send to, uh, especially chat GPT, uh, because that, that will be used in training their model. So um, yeah, um, well, make sure that, that you... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, Sp Spotify have just um, announced that they've had a deal with um, ChatGPT where all of the podcasts that they had 
were being used to train uh, not not chat gpt open ai we must mm -hmm. separate it. so yeah. were used to uh, uh, they had a deal with a company called findaway and uh, this is relevant to me because i actually am an audiobook and narrator amongst other things and findaway uh, we're, we're doing a deal with Spotify and OpenAI, and we're training the AI-generated voices using the narrator's mm -hmm. voice. And then they were using AI to narrate other audiobooks. And of course, what, they ha what happens there is that they're using the, the narrator's work to replace the narrator's. And there's yeah. a big fuss about that. And of course, you know, it's a lot more um, difficult to replace the... Uh, a developer although you've shown that it's not that difficult <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but the narrating they've actually had to drop that deal because it was such a fuss because mm. all of the narrator said wait a minute you know there's a union for that uh yeah. that's not okay you know? exactly yeah. yeah yeah and i think so, so it will be um uh something maybe which which will happen the same with code or code generation or um maybe even building applications so right now we just ask of course to to write some code but um maybe in the future you can ask to write even more complex programs um so and yeah how how on on what code is that based and who owns the code <laughs> they're all nice nice our code, code our code that's the thing and, I, I, and it's uh yeah i don't know well, i think Overall, it's a good thing. I think that um, absolutely, yeah. You know, it's obvious that there's going to be a lot of twitching and worrying about um, AI because it is, it is a, it's a new era. Um, up yeah. until you know, probably last year, this kind of AI, you know, we had, um, mm -hmm. I'll call it the Amazon robot because I have one down here, and if I say its real name that ends in a ah, uh, it will answer. But uh, yeah. up until then, people thought that these intelligent assistants were AI, but I think we're realizing now that. That was yeah. not the case, that they're just very clever, interactive um, bots. Whereas exactly. the AI is actually now, it's gone from science fiction to science facts. And that's, uh, that's a little bit more yeah. concerning. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But it's great. Uh, anyway, uh, great session. I really enjoyed it. You, 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 fantastic presentation. And you, you did a really good job of explaining it. And um yeah. And I think, you know, you covered most of the questions during the uh, session, which is why we didn't have a lot uh, to talk about. Okay, well, yep. thanks a lot. And uh, I'll You're speak welcome. to you soon. We're going to go right. on now to, to uh, um, Jim. But uh, apparently Jim is uh, Jim's having some issues with his internet, which is why you're seeing me today a little bit more, because I, have, uh, I live in Texas, so we have bigger bandwidth. It's a little uh, American joke there about Texas being bigger and better than everywhere else. Um, but what we're going to do whilst we try and um, work out what's going on with uh, Jim's internet for his session, we're going to play a few um, short sessions uh, to keep time and then I'll talk to the producer. While that's happening, we'll find out where we're going to go next. Okay, um, speak to you soon. Creating a simple web server with web broker. For fun or real projects, it's useful to know how to serve files like does a web server. During this session, I'll show you how to create a web server from a web broker Delphi project to display a simple website in a browser. Hi, I'm Patrick Premartin, Embarcadero MVP, French freelance developer, teacher and streamer. Uh, you have my GitHub, LinkedIn and Twitch accounts if you want to uh, see what I uh, create. Some of my uh, website around the fee and web programming are on the screen. Webbroker is a simple HTTPS uh, server available in Delphi since many years. With it, we get a console application we can adapt to our needs by adding actions as URL endpoints. Each action is an event with a HTTP request and a response as parameters. It's up to us to do what we want with it. This documentation is available at docwikiembarcadero.com website. 
What is web server? A web server is a program listening on a port 80 by default for one or more IP. This program knows the hypertext transfer protocol HTTP to speak with a browser or any other HTTPS client. The most used commands of hypertext transfer protocol are GET and POST. GET is what browsers use in their address bar and for forms. All parameters are shown in the URL. POST is used for forms or to add data to users and log files. HTTP has a secure version, HTTPS. This version encrypts the content of data exchanged between the web server and its client. If you want to know more about HTTPS, go to this Wikipedia page. You have the link on the screen. When we surf on the web, browsers ask pages to servers with GET commands. Server answers has two parts, a header and a body. In the header, we find two important things, the HTTP status code, the content type. Depending on them, the browser displays an error or the body of the answer. In this case, when I go to developer tools, we have a network part and we can check the header. with the status code 200 and ici, and the uh, text HTML as content type. It's the web page the browser display here. About status code, you probably know one of this, uh, these values. 404 for a file not found or an URL corresponding to the thing. 500 for internal server error. 403 for uh, forbidden access. Uh, when all is good, the code must be 200. If not, you have the choice in a list. You have the link for a Wikipedia list of uh, HTTP status code. Here. You can see five parts. Information, success, redirection, client error or server errors and uh, the list of code you can use to answer uh, if, you, uh, if you create a web server. Or a list of code you can uh, receive from a web server and check in your uh, programs, browsers or uh, client of API. On a classic file system, it is the file extension that indicates what the data contain correspond to and how or by which software to display them. The content type has the same behavior for a web browser. It tells the browser what the server sent in the body part of its answer. Content type are also known as a MIME type for emails. Many lists are available on the net. My preferred one is in Mozilla developer documentation. You have the file extension on the server and uh, the MIME type or content type uh, the browser expects to, um, to show the file with an extension. For CSS, you have text CSS. For HTML, You have text HTML content type. And for, for pictures, .jpg or jpg, you have image jpeg and so on. If the content type is wrong, the browser uh, display things, <coughs> not what you expect. Web broker um, can be used as a simple web server. It's not complicated. We only have to know where are the files of the website on our server storage and map URLs to the local file system after some security controls. If the files are available, we send them with a good content type. If they don't exist, or if we don't want to send them, we generate an error with a good HTTP status code. 
It's really easy to do. Why WebWalker? Because it's simple. Uh, it's included in all editions of Delphi since a lot of uh, years. Uh, and we all can use it. But there are uh, many other solutions to do web server in Delphi and C++ uh, Builder. Rad server from Embarcadero, Delphi MVC framework available on GitHub from Daniel Tetti and a big team of volunteers and supporters and other frameworks or components I uh, listed on the bottom of the page. The demo. Uh, this sample contains two parts. The web broker project source as a simple window console program and a website created for the 28th uh, birthday of Delphi uh, and the Delphicon with uh, pictures generated by Dal E2. I wrote uh, wonderful pictures. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's an opinion. Uh, never underestimate the power of the beauty according to to who announces it, uh, sensitive souls abstain. I apologize in advance for all these colors. <laughs> the sample project is available on GitHub. Creating a simple web server uh, with WebBroker with uh, two folders and demo sites. For the website I created for uh, this uh, sample. And the WebBroker source in the SRC folder. In Delphi, we have a web broker project uh, with its uh, web module unit. The website has uh, three folders the root, demo site, the images, IMG, and buttons to change pages in the BTN folder. I declared the same thing in the uh, action of a web broker, the root, IMG folder and BTN folder with an asterisk uh, to um, intercept the URL starting by slash IMG or slash BTN. If not, it's the root activated by default which uh, receives the, the get command. For the root, I log the request on the console to show what uh, web broker receive and uh, I uh, answer with file the procedure I've created just above. Uh, I pass the pass info of the request. The pass info contains the um, relative URL. Uh, without localhost and the port. File name. The path of the website on the disk. The response variable to get the answer and the handled variable. If it's uh, false, the request is uh, managed by the default handler or uh, nothing. If it's true, the dispatcher stop the dispatch. I remove the, the first slash uh, character. In the IMG folder, I remove slash IMG slash of the pass info and for the BTN, I do the same with slash BTN slash. So, answer with file will receive only the file name uh, asked by the browser. And here we filter the file name uh, by uh, removing all characters we don't want, like uh, slash and uh, backslash for security reasons. And uh, I check if the file name is empty. If it's uh, empty, I uh, I'll show the index.html by default. I get the local pass of the file name. If the file not exist, I send a 404 error, file not found. 
If the file exists on the hard drive, I checked is, uh, its extension to fill the content type with the good uh, code. You have a list here. Of course, I don't have, uh, I don't need all uh, in my case. Uh, if the content, uh, if the file extension is not managed by the program, I uh, send an exception. If the extension is okay, I have a content type. I fill the status code, and I send the answer as a content stream. And it's uh, over. I start the program. I change the default port. Uh, it's uh, 80 by default, so I have localhost uh, access on my uh, browser. On the localhost URL. And I have the index on the screen. The WebRocker server a received uh, some uh, some get. First one pass info slash default one. Uh, one for the BTN gauche gif. So uh, with this, uh, the index.html is sent to the browser. The browser needs the pictures and ask them to the server, depending on its cache. Of course, uh, I uh, already have uh, displayed the, the page, so it doesn't ask all pictures, uh, but it asks the favicon, uh, .co, uh, we I don't have on the folder, so uh, it will ask this file uh, for each page. Oh, here is the website and the beautiful pictures generated by Dali of Delphi developers uh, with uh, Delph and uh, an ancient uh, Greek uh, helmet. You have all, um, all files on the log. Hein. It asks for the page. Uh, and uh, and the images the big boss I'm not available live to answer questions but uh, if you have any I'll make my best to answer them if it's about a github repository open an issue or discussion on them uh, if it's about this session, you can contact me on LinkedIn or with the contact form of my blog. You also can leave a message on frenchdeveloppe.com or English Delphi Praxis Forums. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the DelphiCon. See you later. I always loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song, and then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey get up get coffee. Code monkey go to job. Code monkey have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say code monkey very diligent, but his output stink. His code not functional or elegant. What do code monkey think? Code monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code monkey not say it out loud. Code monkey not crazy, just proud. Code monkey likes Fritos. Code monkey like to have a Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man with big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code 
old monkey like you. Old monkey like you. Monkey have long walk back to cubicle. He sit down, pretend to work. Good monkey not thinking so straight. Good monkey not feeling so free. Good monkey like Fritos. Good monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew. Good monkey very simple man. Big warm fuzzy secret heart. Good monkey like you. Monkey thinks someday he have everything, even pretty girl like you. Code monkey just waiting for now. Code monkey says someday, somehow. Code monkey like Fritos. Code monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man. Big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code monkey like you. Code monkey get up, get coffee. This is actual object pass Cal code and was recorded in real time. You can compile it with Delphi or App Method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there, you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well. Hi. Well, uh, we think we fixed the issues that we've had with uh, Jim's connection and the vagaries of uh, of the internet. Uh, whilst that was playing, I was uh, making my little code monkey dance as well. So uh, there you go. Good jo good job, Jim. We really like the uh, the video. It's my favourite tune. Uh, I am a code monkey, and uh, we're going to try and work out if Jim can come and join us. Uh, we have a video coming up, which is uh, advanced visual effects with Jim McKeith. Um, someone want to send me a message, Martha, with your magic message? How are we doing, guys? Jim Jim says he's almost ready. Okay, well, I'll feel a bit. Um, I did, um, during that, that, that little presentation there, um, I did include some of the um, sites that were there. The One of the guys that was talking, the guy with the French accent, is our, our favorite uh, chat uh, answerer, MVP uh, Patrick. And uh, this is his website. Um, for those of you that are interested, this is his GitHub repository. He's got a load of stuff on there as well. And he did um, also talk about, uh, let me see, I did make a note of his, oh, here he is. Okay. Um, let me add this in here. And this is also his um, website as well. Uh, Patrick is also um, the operator of Delphi-Books. Dot com and 
in there is basically every kind of book you could ever imagine is uh, to do with Delphi's there listed back to the year dot I think and uh, Patrick operates that as well so um, good job Patrick you, you, you're, you're always answering questions in our chat and uh, you do a good job I'm filling by the way for time if in case anyone is saying but that doesn't mean to say it's not true it looks like we're ready is that right I think so I hey, think yeah, right. you're ready <laughs> all right sorry about that um optimism strikes again it's the internet all right well, let's give this a shot it's great jim so awesome thank you here we go hello welcome to advanced visual effects with skia for delphi this session is part of delphi con 2023 as we celebrate 28 years of delphi agenda we're gonna do a quick introduction to skia for delphi we're gonna look at shaders and also a new acrylic effect. Also gonna do some look at text and a Skia showcase. Now you might be saying, hey, Jim, why are you talking about Skia for Delphi? Why aren't you talking about VCL and Fire Monkey? What's going on? We get it, you like it. Well, this is not my first session on Skia for Delphi. There's a link there on an overview I did previously. You can check that out. <clears throat> but if you remember back to two days ago now, when Marco and David were doing the uh, future of Delphi, there was this slide here where they talked about in an upcoming release, the next major release, so not the next point release, but the next major release, there's going to be some uh, extensive Skia library integration into both VCL and FireMonkey. So, um, is going to have a lot of, of these features are going to be built into Delphi. So right now I'm talking about Skia for Delphi, which is a third party add on library, but we're going to expect to see some of this integrated into your favorite visual development framework. Skia for Delphi is the product of these two geniuses, Paulo and Vinicius from Brazil, the Spirit of Delphi award winner from 2021. There's their uh, LinkedIn and GitHub pages and stuff there. And I had the pleasure of meeting them when I was on my trip to Brazil last time. They're great guys. Got to spend some time with them, get to know them, met their families and such. So definitely uh, I'm a big fan of that. But also, like I said, it is coming to FireMonkey and VCL. So shaders. Talked about shaders before. Very cool technology. It's a What it is, it's a way that you can run graphic effects on your GPU. So each of the pixels are processed individually, but it's done in parallel and changes the color of the pixels. And like I said, it's done on the GPU. GPUs are massively parallel. They have a lot of cores, they're able to do a lot of things at once. It's the secret to all the neural network stuff they're doing lately as well. Previously, before Skia, each platform had its own shader language. You had, uh, HLSL for DirectX, GLSL for OpenGL, GLSL, ES, MSL. There was a lot of them. Well, now with Skia, we have the one shader language to rule them all. SKSL, Skia shader language, works across all platforms. So the great thing is that if you want to use these, you can do this, write it in one, one shader, and it works across all platforms. More information on shaders is available there. The Shader Toy is a great website to go to just to see a, a right variety of uh, a showcase of skias. Or, I'm sorry, a showcase of shaders. And a lot of those shaders are available with open licenses. You can grab the code and easily modify it. There is a guide there, um, both from Google Skia and that I've written as well, as far as like how to transition shaders from GLSL to SKSL, and uh, then some other documentation on SKSL, as well as a simple Skia shader viewer that I wrote in Delphi that you can load your shaders in and view it. It has a lot of shaders in it there as well. All right, so can you do anything useful with shaders? A couple examples here. There's a, a book app or a, an app with a page curl effect, very nice page curl effect that was built by the uh, Venetius and Paulo. And then here also is a button, an animated button, which you can kind of see the animation right now in the slide. The animated button, I do have the code for that is available in the Skia for Delphi repository. 
as well, but the the other one there that's a was an app they built for a third party. Using shaders, uh, I should put the code in here for this. It's I think pretty straightforward, but there is some code involved. You can copy and paste this. I've used this in a number of different applications. But you need an SK animated paint box. You have a method that loads the shader into it. You right here, I'm loading it from a memo in this code here, but you can load it from any source from a file or whatever. You make the shader in a runtime effect, and then you load it into a paint, and then in the uh, paint box animation draw event handler, you run through the shader. There's some variables in your eye resolution and eye time that are used internally by the shader that you have to pass in, and that's all there is to it. Well, there's a lot of stuff you can do beyond this, but this is the basics of how you do it. So let's do a demo of some shaders. This is a mobile app built by Venetius and Paulo. Um, I love that splash screen, by the way. That's a, a Lottie animation, which we're not talking about, but I just love the splash screen. So here we see the page curl. This is done with a shader. Notice how the page has a bit of reflection to it as it curls very smooth running on a mobile device. And the same shader will run across all platforms because it is written in Skia shader language. Now here's the same video, the same shader running in landscape mode, still on mobile, much easier to see the reflection to it and the nice smooth page curl effect. Very, very nice. And this is actually interactive with the user as the user is turning the page. As you can see, they can move back and forth, giving that very physical effect. Much more exciting than a regular, um, just slipping through pages of a PDF where it just transitions with the slide or whatever. We see a shader applied to a button. So if you notice the button has First of all, a nice gradient that kind of is just very nice and subtle, but then it has that glow that slides across it. This is a shader on a button running on a mobile device. And I'll show you the code for this here. Here's the shader button project. It's available on the Skia for Delphi uh, repository. It's also, I believe it's in, it should be installed when you install it as well. But if not, you can go to the GitHub. The way this works is there's a, this is the main form here, and this is a frame, frame shader button, which is defined here. And in the frame, we have the SK animated paint box, which is what is displaying the shader with some text over it. And you'll notice there's an animation on the paint box, and yeah, on the paint box, and that animation is triggered on pressed, to deal with the uh, animation for when the button is pressed. When the, well, it's not a button, it's a, it's a paint box, but it's behaving like a button. So in order to give it that responsiveness to being pressed or tapped is done via an animation. So in here, here's the code where, let's see, right here we're drawing it. So this is simpler than the code I showed on the slide but we're just setting the resolution and the time, those are the two requirements, and drawing it out here. And in the create event is where we create the um, paint and the shader. And we're loading the uh, Skia shader language button shader. So let's run this here. Oh, actually I'll show you the main form. There's only code here is I put a on click event handler just to show that it is clickable so that you can see that that behaves that way. So I'm gonna run this. And if you watch as I click this, actually I'll click before releasing it so it doesn't actually trigger the click event. So see how it shades that out? That's the, you could make that whatever you want to, but that's the way it's set up right now for the uh, animation on pressed. And then when I click it, we see we get the dialogue here popped up just to say, yes, it is clickable. There you go. That's just a, that's a cool example um, showing how to use shaders to add a nice bit of visual effect into your applications. I have another one here. This one I made um, just because I wanted to show a different 
possibility you can do with shaders. I'm going to run this one here. This one, I'm using a shader for the background. So the background of the form is a shader that's being drawn. And I can turn the shader on and off. I can pause and resume the shader animation. And also show that if I change the style, that changes here with the shader as well. So uh, just the button shows a button on a form. And this is showing the form as the shader, just to give you some ideas, hopefully some inspiration for things you might be able to use in your applications to use shaders to add some additional um, cool factor to your applications. Acrylic or frosted glass is a glass morphism, which is where you're taking some of the characteristics of glass and applying it to user interface to impart some information or just some effect. So here you see example, you know, this is just semi-transparent, whereas this one is acrylic or frosted glass where it has that blur on it of the background. So this is a copy of the Netflix app where you can see we have acrylic at the top and bottom. And here is just, uh, this is just shaded and we can zoom in on it here and we see that's the shade and this is acrylic or frosted glass, it's blur. And see the difference here. It's just darker in the background where this one's actually blurring it out. Let's take a look at a demo. This is the Netflix acrylic sample created by Venetia Sampaolo. It's simulating Netflix. Uh, I will show you. So there's a frame here that is the, so if I click here on the top, we see the header is the acrylic frame. And if I go to the acrylic frame here, it has, I'll show you the design surface, a, f uh, a rectangle down here that has um, the, if we go into the code, we can see the paint of the rectangle is overridden. And in here it's applying the uh, effect to add the blur. Added in a property in here so you can turn the effect on and off. And so I can show you this here in action. And again, this will run across all platforms. I'm just demoing on a Windows because it's easier to record my screen. And let me scroll down a little bit here. And I added a, a glow to these buttons here. You can just see a slight glow as your mouse over them. And then I can turn the acrylic off. And you see now it's just shaded. And then turn the acrylic back on. There's a button for your glass onion. I think that's all the one I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, Breaking Bad, that TV show. Uh, anyway, yeah, so there we go. Great way to add acrylic, or easy way to add acrylic to your applications. This was uh, a project I kind of created for fun, but it does show loading a font dynamically with Skia, which actually was a lot easier than I expected it to be, to be honest. Uh, let's go look at the code here. All I'm doing is down here in the initialization, I'm using the SK default providers to register the font file. And I'm just, I have a list of font files that I just make sure they exist. And if they do, I load them in. And once I've done that, then I can create uh, what I'm doing. Let me run it and then I'll explain the code. This is kind of hard to explain what it is I'm doing, but I thought it came out really cool. So here's a list of all the fonts I have. A lot of fonts I've collected um, online and I was going for these like really kind of bizarre looking fonts and you type some text in here and then it puts the text out each character in a different font in a different color and then I made it so you can actually zoom in on the characters or if you're like ah, I don't like that one here I'll just change the uh, font that's used on that character for example um, the idea being is that it kind of lets you create that ransom note type look which ransom is one of the fonts <laughs> uh but I, I just wanted something that was just like create a really random font collection i was also eventually i'd like to add the a uh an outline to each font as well which is another effect skia has for that is that you can add font effects and those the font effects are in the the sample that skia ships actually i'll load that up and show you real quick Oh, let me just show you the code, the rest of the code in this. So, um, 
Yeah, so here's where I'm typing it, and all I do is uh, create a, a label. I'm using an SK label here, but you could actually use any label. Once you registered it, it just shows up as a font that your application can use, which is really great. Um, I am using Windows paths in here, but if I were to, um, you've seen other examples of this, of how you can use different path styles or different path locations for different platforms and uh, load in your fonts on any platform there. But actually, that, I mean, that, there's, that's all there is to it, really that loading, the registering the font file is the, the key code here. The rest of it is just kind of uh, simple stuff you've seen before. But I will get this uh, code posted. I'll probably post this on my own repo just because it's kind of weird and I have other plans I want to do with it beyond just being an example of showing how to load uh, fonts for Skia. Now, this is the... The, the main sample that ships with Skia, the Fire Monkey version. There's both a Fire Monkey and VCL version with maybe not exactly the same functionality, but very similar functionality between the two. And I'll run this here and show you the drawing text example. Again, awesome splash screen. Love the splash screen. Drawing text. Uh, this is, I get people asking about this all the time. I keep telling them, Skia for Delphi, right to left. There you go. Um, but here we see the paragraph multi-style and then basic. So here we go. We see this is a, a stroke font. So the font is not is hollow. It's the same font, but in this case, it's just stroke instead, which is a nice, useful effect to have uh, in there. And we can take a look at the code for that. Right, so here is the code for this and drawing basics text. If I go into here is where it's using it and it's using the paint box viewer, which is here, which just has a paint box that is, uh, it just assigns the handler to it. And all we do, or all it's doing is selecting the fonts right here, SK font create. And then for the stroke, it is right there, setting stroke width. <laughs> pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Uh, in this case, it's painting the font on using, the, on the canvas. I wanted to showcase just some different Skia built applications here to give you some inspiration and some ideas. This is, uh, of course, the Skia for Delphi repository. It's available on GitHub. It's also in Git it, easy to get. Uh, you can install it via Chocolatey as well.
All right. Hopefully, I'm just going to stop the video. I'm not sure why. Hopefully, this part is okay. Uh, I'm just going to go to Q and A, and then I'll get the uh, replay up later. Apologies for the issues with this. I'm not sure. It says it's fine now, but um, I will have the replay up with all the uh, full quality later. So, if there are any questions on this besides why does it look bad, <laughs> I uh, can address those now. The I wanted to, the main thing I wanted to show off was the. Um, The uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, that's right. The shaders with the button and the acrylic and stuff like that. The more um, so. Oh, looks good now. Good. <laughs> uh, yes, and as I showed, the right to left is uh, supported in Skia for Delphi. You can do um, at. That there's a reason that Skia is being added in the next major release is because it does add a lot of improvements in functionality, performance, new features, and uh, fixes and such to FireMonkey and VCL. So uh, even though what I'm showing is using the Skia for Delphi library, in the next major release, there will be the Skia incorporated in, which will have a lot of improvements. Uh, Lars says, Skier for Delphi states it's a 2D library, but is there 3D in this pipeline? There isn't 3D in the pipeline as far as I know. It's just plans to plan to be 2D. It is a library designed for building user interfaces, application user interfaces. So, and that are all those are all 2D. So it is, it is uh that's its goal. And it's used um Like all your web browsers, Firefox, Chrome are all using Skia. If you go to the Skia website, the main Skia website, you can see it is a very, very popular library. It's getting adoption everywhere. And the cool thing is, really, I mean, this was kind of the idea. FireMonkey, the idea was to have a single widget set that worked across all platforms. It was like, no, we want to use different widgets on each platform and make it hard for developers. And... um which was the one, so there's the two camps, right? There's the, we want native widgets on each platform or unique widgets on each platform. And the other one camp is what FireMonkey was trying to do, which was we want to have a single widget library that works across all platforms. And now we are, uh, everybody's kind of shifting that direction. And so it's uh, by having FireMonkey and VCL based on the Skia library, using the Skia library, it lets us leverage the work that is being put on by Google and everyone else to improve Skia and give you all that benefits as well. So you got to keep writing FireMonkey code, but now you get the advantages of Skia library. Oops. Uh, so this is a good point is that the, um, actually, so the, the Skia update in uh, 11.3, and again, it's this is a future looking statement, so it's not promised. It's just a, this is the current plan is that the next major release will have Skia integrated into um, Delphi or VCL, FMX, and C Builder. So if you're a C fan, you can take advantage of Skia now. So Skia right now, Skia for Delphi is for Delphi only, but in the next major release, when we have it integrated in, it will add the uh, C support as well. And as Patrick points out, my example with all the fonts and colors, yeah, that was not, don't don't use that in production unless you're trying to go for really ugly. <laughs> uh, but I, I was just, I wanted to try that and I'm still working on it. It's, um, I'm not sure where the idea came from, but I, I wanted to have that really uh, atrocious looking fonts with atrocious looking colors. Yes, the... Shader generated C with Skia. It, that's on the Skia simple shader, simple Skia shader viewer. I think is what's called, which is on GitHub. You can find that and download it and take a look at that one. It has uh, that ocean in it, which will run. I ran it in an M1 or in a, in a Windows VM on a Windows on an M1 Mac, but you can run it on any platform. It works across all platforms now. Uh, Olaf actually went in and helped me with some of the cross-platform code to make it work good on all platforms. So yeah, you can run it everywhere and it looks great. So 
Olaf's session on Delphi and AI. There was the one earlier today, um, OpenAI or ChatGPT and is Git or, or a blessing or a curse. Uh, that one will be available as a replay as well. And then I talked to Olaf this morning and he's uh, had some stuff come up, but he's going to get his uh, get his session finished and we'll have it later. We'll probably just do a separate webinar, a standalone for that one. He always does great work. So I definitely want to make sure we find time to get that one going. Patrick, I admit I do like stuff with lots of colors and shapes on video games, but indie game programming, everything is allowed. <laughs> but if you want to make a game, the secret today is you want to do like uh, pixel art instead of like good art. And then you get a lot of leeway because you can do whatever you want to. But... I wonder which game library for Delphi will have a Skia version first. Um, I know that Andre Magny's uh, FMXer, which is not a game library, has Skia Skia support in there, and Ether Dev has a number of libraries as well with Skia support. I'm trying to think if there's any games that are using it yet. Um, I mean, technically, Fire Monkey is kind of a game engine, and it has will have Skia in there. Roland is asking, will Skia be statically linked or will 20 meg DLL ship with each application? Um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there, there, this is because it's for the next major release. There's still some things that are being figured out, worked on, but uh, that is certainly something that we want to improve the user experience around. So stay tuned and find out. Stay tuned. Yes, thank you, Patrick. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, oops, I had the wrong one. There's a little. The chat box has a little message down at the bottom. That I can't get to go away, and it blocks some of the messages I'm trying to show. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Apparently, the uh, bandwidth issues were uh, from Kirk laptop or Kirk's computer when he rebooted that fixed it. So we're just going to blame Kirk for all the bandwidth issues we're having. <laughs> uh, no, I, I love Kirk. I just harassing you a little bit. And uh, Patrick suggested we do a behind the scenes thing, which actually that would be cool. I like that idea, Patrick. So I will see about putting something together and then maybe I can... Uh, I'll do it after the fact, and then maybe I can talk to Ian and Martha and some of the people involved in different parts and just kind of show what we have going on here. There's a, um, Ian and Martha and I are running the doing the majority of running the event, but then we have a lot of the people that help out with uh, some of the art and some of the other different aspects of it too. So I'll see how many people I can get involved to just talk about what's going on and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so... Next major release. Uh, no, 11.3 is not the next major release. 11.3 is the minor release. So the way the current version numbering works is the whole number is the major release. The uh, decimal number is the minor release. So 11.2 is the current version. I have to think about this because I'm... <laughs> I never kid. I always get these numbers wrong because I have been meetings talking about versions from around the road. So 11.2 is the current version. 11.3 is in beta. Um, and the beta is available right now. You can get, I don't know if you can still get on the beta. If you're on premium support, you can, I believe, if you're not already. And then that will be the next release, 11.3. And then the next major release, which will be maybe 12, can't say for sure, will be the uh, the one that has the ski of support included into it, which is really exciting. I am very, very excited about that. Something I've been looking forward to for a while. When will we post the replays? Um, replays typically, yeah, Lars says within a few days. We'll be getting, so, so the lightning sessions will be up uh, this week. And then depending on the session, I might get some of the other ones up this week. If not, uh, hopefully next week. We like to take the original video and put the Q&A on the end of it so that you have the best quality and the Q&A attached for the watching it online. Um, that takes a little bit of time to go through and do that and we'll get those posted as soon as we can. 
Kirk says, no problem. If I see an opening for a wisecrack, take my shot. <laughs> um, I unfortunately have not done... Um, there is a new ski label, STSK label. I have not used it. Oh, well, I've used it, but I have not done it around right to left. I know that I've talked to other people that have used Skia and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have right to left now in Fire Monkey. This is great. But I, I've not used it. I don't, I don't know all the nuances of right to left, unfortunately, but um, definitely check that out. There's a Telegram group for Skia as well that you can go in and ask questions and get answers to your questions and stuff too, I believe. So uh, go check that out. And uh, if you're not using, if honestly, if you're not using Skia yet, Check it out now and just know that it's going to get even more exciting in the next release when we uh, integrate it in. So with that, it is almost end of the session here, end of my time slot. Uh, sorry for the technical issues. Um, honestly, I, I'm a, too optimistic and expect things to go brilliantly. And uh, there's always problems. I should know better. I've been doing this for too long, but I don't know. I don't learn. Uh, question, how long till version 12? So I'm not saying it's called version 12. Again, this is, it will be the major version that comes after 11.3. Uh, not years. I can't say when, but not years. Um, less than, I think I could say less than a year would be my expectation, but I'm not going to say anything more beyond that. <laughs> uh, it is. It is soon. And there's the Telegram group right there, t.me slash Skia for Delphi. One of the cool things about Skia is, one thing I love about Telegram is it has these really cool animated stickers that are vector-based, and those are based on Lottie animations, which Skia lets you do. So I think that's brilliant and fun. Uh, perhaps when it'll be released. Yes, it'll be released when it is released. I, I, so I can say this now. I have the the gray in my beard. There was a a wine commercial years ago. I remember as a kid that was we we don't release our wine before it's time or something like that. I, I don't remember. And so that's uh that's uh kind of yeah. It's not released before it's released. Uh, and then Lars says he doesn't work from Barcadero, so he can speculate. He's going to guess roughly nine months after previous minor. It's an interesting speculation. I'm not going to confirm or deny or uh, speculate on that any more than that. But with that, I'm going to give you a couple minutes before we get into our next session, which is Get Demystified with Rich Dudley. Um, actually, Rich, will you come on? I don't know if did you get a chance to check your audio earlier. If you want to check it right now, you can before we get into your session. Okay, good. You did. All right. So Rich has got his audio. Last time he had some audio issues. Um, I had audio issues on Monday and this morning as well. So it goes around, but hopefully it's all going to go well, but we'll have Richard's session here in just a, sorry, Rich's session here in just a, a couple of minutes. And then we'll see you all for Q and A. And he got a, if I remember correctly, it's a pretty long session. It is, um, got 47 minutes of presentation. So 13 minutes for Q and A. And we'll just start that right at the top of the hour. So I have plenty of time for Q and A. Rich said, 45 minutes from now, maybe a different story about whether or not he still has audio. Hopefully he does. Hopefully I still do. Ah, technology. I love it, but it's unpredictable.
Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining my session. I'm Rich Dudley, the Chief Evangelist for N Software, and today I'll be demystifying the source control system named Git. Git is probably the most popular source control system in use today, but there are others still in wide use. My goal with this session is not to convince you to switch to Git, or that Git is the greatest, but just to help anyone who doesn't know much about Git understand what the love is all about. As for me, I was an ardent subversion user for almost 10 years. I changed jobs to a company which was implementing TFS. TFS was horrible. That lasted a year until the developers nearly revolted and we began using Git. I used Git for over 10 years. I mentored teammates in Git and helped write some of the internal Git practices. Now I find myself back on Subversion here at N Software. We have decades of history in Subversion, numerous build pipelines and other activities tied to Subversion, and it works great for us. We have no plans on changing internally, although soon you'll start seeing some of our code samples hosted on GitHub. To get started, I want to briefly look at how version control has evolved over the last 50 years. This is helpful in understanding what makes Git so weird and popular. SCCS is generally acknowledged as the first real version control system. It was initially released inside of Bell Labs for development on Unix systems. This means version control is literally 50 years old, so no one should have any excuse not to know about it or use it. SCCS is only slightly more than making complete copies of files with a numbering scheme for the versions. Although no new development has occurred in decades, many Unix distros today still have SCCS built into the operating system. Diff, also developed by Bell Labs and released in 1974, was the original utility to compare differences between two files on a line-by-line -line basis. Previously, it was difficult to see exactly what changed, and the last commit won, frequently wiping out the work of others. In 1979, Bell Labs released Diff Successor, named Diff3. Diff3 could compare any three files and merge the changes or mark conflicts. Now, two sets of changes could be compared to a common base version and merged, allowing two people to work on the same files and compare to a common ancestor. This compare-merge-conflict strategy carries on today in all source control systems, whether they use Diff3 directly or incorporate the strategy into their own tooling. A few years later, in 1982, RCS was released. RCS may be the oldest version control system still under active development. RCS is the first version control system to use reverse deltas which means storing a complete copy of the file only once, and then just the instructions to make the changes for each revision. Ironically, today RCS's source code is hosted on a Git server run by the new project. A few years later, CVS was released. CVS is a front-end system for RCS, but adds repository change tracking rather than just tracking of individual files, and a client-server mode. Although its last revision was in 2008, CVS is still in use today. Its source code is hosted in a CVS repo run by the new project. CVS is one of two systems listed here which had a strong influence on the way Git is designed. BitKeeper was the original distributed source control system, a mantle which only Git and Mercurial have worn successfully since then. Even though the founder of BitKeeper was a contributor to the Linux kernel, the fact BitKeeper was commercial and proprietary did not sit well with other members of the kernel team. BitKeeper offered a free but feature-limited license for open source projects, including the Linux kernel. In the free license, BitKeeper hid the revision graphs, and a project to visualize them led to BitKeeper discontinuing its free for open source projects in 2005, including for the Linux kernel. Subversion was released the same year BitKeeper was. Because Subversion is open source, cross-platform, and had several modern GUIs, Subversion's popularity skyrocketed, it peaking in about 2006 or 2007. Subversion remains very popular today. It's probably the number two or number three most used version control system. There are a number of services offering Subversion hosting, and both Subversion and several GUIs are still under active development, so you're still in a good place using Subversion. Needing a new version control system for the Linux kernel, and finding none to his liking, Linus Torvalds designed and developed the first beta release of Git in about four days. A few months later, Git managed the release of the Linux kernel 2.6.12. Mercurial was also spawned from the BitKeeper debacle. 
announced a few days after Git was announced, and was also an option for hosting the Linux kernel. Like BitKeeper, Mercurial is also a distributed system and has many of the same goals as Git. Although Linux chose to use Git, Mercurial is still actively developed and used by Facebook, W3C, and Mozilla. Mercurial was actually a little more polished and popular than Git in the first year or so after their release. Bitbucket initially supported both Git and Mercurial, but dropped Mercurial in 2020 because surveys showed less than 1% of new projects used it and 90% of the developers were using Git. The release of TFS in 2006 led to a four-way race between Subversion, Git, Mercurial, and TFS for version control supremacy. TFS did not win that race. TFS has been morphed into Azure DevOps today and is not very popular, but is widely used because Microsoft. GitHub itself is not a version control system, but bears mentioning. GitHub is a web-based service for hosting Git repositories, but adds considerable amount of features on top of Git, which are so ubiquitous today, people often think they're basic Git functionality. The features and developer-friendly design and pricing, generous free options even after the Microsoft acquisition with GitHub, is probably the one thing most responsible for making Git as popular as it is today. To bring things full circle, BitKeeper was open sourced in 2016 and today its source code is hosted on GitHub. Just a quick look at this timeline and you can see a lot of activity from about 1990 to around 2005. But most development since 2008 has been just incremental. It's hard to say we've hit source control perfection, but since Git was released, there hasn't been anything nearly as disruptive. On the previous slide, I mentioned centralized and distributed version control systems. Both of those bear a little bit of an explanation. First, what we called a centralized version control system was simply known as version control until distributed systems emerged. Centralized version control systems is client-server. Client copies are known as working copies. Working copies usually have the full code base, but revision history is centralized to the server, although I think subversion keeps revision history locally now. And files can be locked on the server, preventing their editing by other developers. In the really early days of version control, before diff tooling was widespread, file locking was the way to prevent multiple changes to the same file. Tools like diff3 kind of lessen the risk of multiple edits, but locking still persists to this day. Locking isn't really a problem until check-ins don't work right or someone goes on vacation without check-in and others need access to the locked files. Another feature of centralized version control systems are shelves. Shelves are how you store incomplete changes so you can work on something else, like stop working on a new feature, shelve the changes, make a hot fix on the trunk, then unshelve the changes, and get back to your feature work. Distributed version control systems utilize peer-to-peer -peer style of collaboration. Every node can operate as both a client and a server and has the complete copy of the code base and revision history stored locally. Since every node is equal, they're called clones. The update action is known as a pull and the commit action is known as a push. With the advent of Git hosting services, the usual workflow today looks a little bit like a centralized version control system with slightly looser rules. In a true distributed version control systems, Developers push and pull among each other until everyone agrees a release is ready. Then, someone cuts a release from the consensus commit. This worked for a while with the Linux kernel, but took a Herculean effort by Linux. This might be sustainable for a short while on small teams, but you'll quickly run into Metcalf's law issues with each successive participant. Instead, there is usually a designated main or team or organization repository configured in a server-only mode, and this serves as the canonical copy of the code base into which all merges are made and from which the latest updates are pulled. Being the designated org repo is the business model for GitHub. Developers can still push and pull from one another, which is helpful when debugging or refactoring some code, but this isn't a good idea as a main workflow, and in corporate environments may not work at all due to the security posture. When using a designated org repo, Builds and releases should be made only from the org repo, since it's easier to centralize the tooling and ensure the changes have all been merged. It's the clean copy, since no one is working directly in that main repo. Distributed version control systems make it much easier to work disconnected, and you can test merges locally to prevent conflicts. 
Unlike centralized version control systems, there's no limit on the number of clones a developer can make. If you completely mess up a repo, you can just delete the folder and make a new clone. You can also make clones to test out new ideas or libraries without jeopardizing the main repo. There is no way to lock files in a true distributed version control system, all of which include tooling for examining and merging diffs for the time when two people are actually editing the same file. As it turns out, conflicts are rare even among large groups of developers, especially if you use a work ticketing system and open communication to keep two developers from working on exactly the same thing. With a distributed version control system, you're going to use branches frequently to replace shelves, to work on a hotfix, or just try out a crazy idea. Branches are a mainstay of Git. The major downsides are some people have a hard time giving up the command and control structure of centralized systems and the increased drive space needed for a complete clone of the repository, which really isn't a big deal given today's hard drive capacities. Development of Git happened under serious time pressure, so there was not a Git manifesto published or even strategy or planning sessions. The goals on this slide were expressed by Torvalds in email discussion and archived on listservs and were collected into various histories of Git. Other source control systems at the time took 30 seconds to merge a single patch. Linux would often have 250 merges at a time across all maintainers. Git's performance is usually 10 to 100 times faster than other systems, and the first alpha versions of Git were merging patches at about 7 per second. Although Torvalds had a strong disdain for CVS, Git does actually incorporate some features from CVS, notably the three-way merge, and Git keeps the distributed workflow which BitKeeper pioneered. The corruption safeguards aren't detailed in depth, but today these features include every clo clone having the full commit history and cryptographic hashes, the ability to walk a revision graph and revert, as well as multiple merge strategies. Linus Torvalds designed Git to be different from other source control management systems, aka version control systems, going so far as saying, I have absolutely zero interest in creating a traditional source control management system. So if you wonder why Git seems so weird, this is why. Even the name is an allusion to Torvald's attitude towards other systems. In British slang, Git means an unpleasant person. As we just discussed, Git is a distributed version control system designed to allow independent development and easy patching. It does, however, have its own nuances, which we'll review here. Every local clone is a complete copy of the main repo, and most importantly, everyone has the full commit history and full cryptographic authentication of the history. Now, this is SHA hashes, not a blockchain. In case of disaster, any clone can serve as the main repo or be used to recreate it. This is very reassuring if you remember a time when hard drives would crash and you'd lose everything. Branches were designed expressly for nonlinear development, and you can use them and you will use them often in Git. Many of the workflows emphasize working in feature branches, merging into the main branch only for the release. Branches can be made from any commit, so they're very useful when a hotfix is necessary. Git tracks changes at the directory level, and in large projects is very efficient compared to other systems, but single file operations are slightly less so. When you examine a single file, the operations still have to walk the entire change history, and it could take as almost as long as a full project operation. Git is so efficient, it's unlikely you'll notice any burden at all. Merge conflicts are actually rare among experienced developers, and a good diff tool and merge strategy handles automatic merges without a lot of worry. Git can identify and merge changes using three different strategies, including the CVS-inspired three-way merge. Should any of these automatic merges fail, Git tells the developer manual editing is necessary. At no point is Git a last save wins system. Should a clone fall too many revisions behind the main trunk, the developer is notified to get the latest before attempting a pull request or a merge. Being designed for open source projects from the beginning, Git supports the ability to fork a project. This is used to resurrect a dead project or take an existing project in a different direction. Forking is useful in enterprises too, where boilerplate code is in a DevOps repository, which development teams fork and customize for their services. In the early days of Git, patches were sent via email or pulled directly from another clone. 
Hosted Git services added a pull request feature, which informed a project maintainer that a contributor had changes to merge. These changes could be reviewed and merged by the maintainer. Pull requests were added recently to core Git, so now there is a built-in notification mechanism for changes regardless of how you're using Git. File renames can be a real mess in some version control systems if you don't use the built-in rename function. Renames can look like massive diffs or a delete and add, which breaks the history of the file. Since Git works at a directory level, it tracks renames and maintains the commit history even if the file is renamed. Helping speed adoption and ease transition, Git has a CVS emulation mode as well as the ability for bidirectional updates with subversion repositories. Git also supports multiple protocols for communication between clones, including HTTPS and SSH. A few times now, I've mentioned workflows, but what exactly is a Git workflow? I like to define a workflow as the pattern of activities you use when setting up repositories, forks, and clones, and then managing the changes to your code base. Fork and pull is a simplified Git workflow, which I think is the easiest way to get started with hosted Git, as well as establish some good practices early on. I used this workflow for developers who are new to Git, as well as non-technical product owners and business architects who are contributing to documentation. The first part of this workflow is setting up a repository, forks, and clones. Start by creating an organization level repo in a Git host. Developers then create personal forks of this repository, usually in the same hosting service, but because of the nature of Git, can be any hosted Git service. Developers then clone the organization repo to their development machines. The first remote reference in a local clone is named origin by default. Developers then add remote to create a reference to their fork using a personal alias. The key best practices here are cloning the org repo first so that no matter what clone of whatever project you're working in, origin always points to that org repo. The other key practice is when adding your personal fork as a remote, give it an alias which refers to you, like a nickname or a user ID, anything like that. Use this same alias for all your projects. When you're tired or rushed, you don't want to have to think about which alias is the main repo and which is your personal fork. You can just rely on the muscle memory of which alias points to what. If you pull changes in a peer-to-peer -peer arrangement from a, from a teammate, you can use their nickname as your local clone reference as well. You'll notice that fork and pull looks more like a client server style and less peer-to-peer -peer than how Git was originally designed, and that's okay for getting started. The second half of fork and pull is managing the changes to your code base, and it goes like this. Before starting work, or maybe periodically through the day, but day, developers pull from origin to make sure they have the latest updates in their local clone. Developers do their work and commit changes to their local clone. Local commits are then pushed to the personal fork. A pull request is made from the personal fork to the organization repo. There, changes are reviewed and either approved and merged, or the pull request is closed and additional changes are requested. We found that pull requests could mostly replace code reviews. Feedback was faster, and so was turnaround time. The ability for other developers to comment on pull requests, which can be seen online and also sent to contributors, provides very atomic feedback. The downside to replacing code reviews with PRs is that PRs are very atomic. They're very focused on the changed lines of code. Are these lines of code well written? Do they do what they're supposed to do? Every once in a while, it's worth looking at how the code files are organized in your solution and that the system is meeting the architectural guidelines and practices you have in place. I'm now going to show you all how fork and pull works using GitHub and the Git command line. Although I'm going to do this demo in GitHub and the command line, it works pretty much the same in all Git hosts and GUIs. The UIs might look a bit different, but the process and commands are all the same. As we go through this demo, keep in mind that fork and pull may be the only workflow you ever need. I've presented it here as a starting point, but is good enough for large, important projects too. Here, I've logged into my GitHub account and created a demonstration organization. Signing up for GitHub and creating organizations is a little outside the scope of this session, but all the Git hosts have pretty good documentation. The first thing we need to do is create a new repository. 
So we'll just click that button and we'll call it Delphi Con 2023. All right, demo repo for Delphi Con. Oop. Delphi Con. Let's make it a public repository. A couple key things that we want to add here are a README file and a Git ignore. Git has pre templated ignore files. These are used to exclude files which shouldn't be checked in, like, say, user specific settings or binaries from a build process or even that packages director that we talked about earlier. They're pre compiled for all kinds of different languages and editors. Delphi just scrolled by, so let's grab that one since that's what we're doing. And we can choose a license. If we're doing this as an open source project, we can choose a license which will be published in our repositories. Oh, I don't know. Let's do MIT. That's pretty permissive. And here, we just set it to create repository. And very quickly, we have our DelphiCon 2023 repository with a license file, a readme, and a gitignore already in place. So, step one is done. We have an organization repo. To create a fork, we just come up here to the fork button, tell it we want to create a fork, and it asks us where we want to create this fork. This is going to put it in my personal account and give it a repository the same name. We're only going to copy the main branch for now. Why not? It's the only one that's there. Then we just hit create fork, wait another moment, and there we have it. We now have a fork. Step two, complete. And now it's time for step three, creating our local clone from the org repo. To do that, we have to go back to the org repo. And we can just click this little breadcrumb here, and GitHub will take us back to the org repo. We're back. Under this green code button, if we pop that down, we'll find the addresses for each protocol we can use to clone this repo. We'll start with HTTPS. Clicking this little button copies that URL into the clipboard. Save us some typing. And now we can bring up our git command line. We just do git clone, paste the address, hit enter, and in a few seconds, great. If we change directories to get in there and list the contents, you can see the git ignore, the license, and the readme have all come down. We have an identical clone of our organization repo now. And now, step four, creating a remote reference to our personal fork. To get back to our fork, all we need to do is come over here to the fork button, drop that down, select the fork that we created just a moment ago, and GitHub will take us back. Once again, under the green code button is the addresses we need. We'll copy the HTTPS one, pull up our command line window, git remote add, whoops, add, and here's where we give it an alias. I'm going to name this for me. Paste in the address, and there we go. We now have our repo, our fork, and our local clone all set up with the references from our local clone to the origin and our personal repo. If we want to confirm this, we can just use the command git remote, and it will list our two different uh, remotes, an origin and a personal one. All right, cool. Now it's time to start making some changes to the files and going through the process of committing and pushing and pulling. In our folder, we can again see a readme, a license, a git ignore, and a git control folder. Let's edit the readme. Just right click on that, bring up our favorite editor, Notepad. Now, this is Markdown. If you've never seen this before, it's going to look weird but it's a way to do markup with some very simple line initiators. Let's change this to be the classic hello world. This is a demo for DelphiCon 2023. Hope uh, everyone is learning something awesome. We'll save that. To see which files have changed in your repo, you can use a git status. And here it says on branch main, we've modified the readme file. Good deal. Let's do a git commit 
with the command line toggle AM. The A stands for all files which changed. The M says include the message. Initial edit for the demo. You'll want to use some good commit messages. You'll thank yourself in the future. You're going to go through a lot of commits. The better your commit message is, the more you'll appreciate your present self. Great. So we've committed the changes locally. Let's do a git push r dudley. These changes are going to be pushed up to my personal repo. Now let's check something out that's really cool. Here we can load readme and we can see the changes that we just made. Hello world. That's awesome. If we go back to the org repo and we display that readme, you can see the changes are still what they were. They haven't been accepted yet. This is good. This means I've made changes locally and I've pushed them to my personal fork. What we do from here now is we create a pull request where we tell, well, in this case ourselves, I have changes to make to my own files. Going back to our personal repo, we just hit the pull request button. We say new pull request. And it will show us a diff of the files that we've edited. We can simply create a pull request and say, hey, this is ready to be reviewed. My typing skills are legendary also. We're going to create the pull request. Now, as you can see, this has moved us from our personal repo back into the demo org repo. If we want to see the number of commits and what went with those, we can click on the commits tab and GitHub shows us. This is the first commit, the initial edit for the, re for the demo. There's only one commit. To look at the files that changed and the differences between them, we just click on the Files Change tab, and here comes the diff. We've changed the pink into the green. To merge this, we just go back to the main tab, and we say, awesome job, dude. Click the Merge Pull Request button. Confirm the merge. And we've done it. We have made changes on our local clone, pushed them to our personal fork, merged them into the main repo. If we go to the code tab, we can now see the changes are present in our readme file. Outstanding. We have just made changes using a very simple Git workflow. The ability for Git hosts to display markdown files in your repository is a very cool and very powerful feature. A README is a great way to welcome people to your project, to explain how to use it, to document your team commitments, or even to link to other markdown files to form documentation. Every Git host has, supports markdown, although some have some slightly different flavors than the classic markdown. Here's what GitHub's looks like. It goes through and shows you how to do the different headers, how to make H1, H2, H3, H4. You can do lists, links, add images. It's a rudimentary style of markup that gets rendered into just basic HTML. If you plan on using a Git host and you haven't worked with Markdown before, take some time to learn Markdown. It's very powerful, very easy, and still pretty cool to use. Now that we've merged our pull request, there's one more thing we need to look at. Back in our org, we can see that we have all the changes here. But if we go to our personal fork, GitHub alerts us, hey, wait, there was a merge main made to the org repo that is not reflected here. There's two ways that we can bring this into alignment. One is with this new sync fork button. Another way would be to go back through the fork and pull process pull from origin, and push to our repo. Let's do it the hard way. Bring up our command line. We'll say git pull origin main. That will bring the commit history down to our local clone. We will git push r dudley. And now the commit history and only the commit history is getting pushed up to our personal fork. That's great. 
If we come back here and reload this page, that message should go away because both repos have the same commit history. It does. This branch is up to date with our organization repo. Excellent. If there's one thing I've mentioned a number of times today, it's branches. Branches, branches, branches. You'll get to use a lot of branches if you use Git. They're very powerful and they're an easy way to sequester some changes from other changes without affecting the main trunk. Let's see how this works. Again, I'll bring up the CLI. And although I'm using the CLI, most of the GUIs actually just automate the CLI. So the commands and everything are identically the same. To create a branch, all we have to do is say git branch and give the branch a name. Let's call it test. Good deal. If we want to confirm which branches we have, we just say git branch with no additional parameters and git will list the branches for us. The asterisk in green color on main tells us that that is the active branch. If we want to switch branches, we just say git check out test. And now we've switched to the branch named test. And again, we can say git branch. And now we can see that the asterisk in green color indicates that test is the active branch. If we come into the file we were editing earlier, whoop, don't switch file branches with the editors open. We can now add some edits and say, this is from the test branch. Excellent for us. We can save that. And doing our git status, git tells us that on the branch named test, we've modified the readme file. If we do a git checkout, back to main, we can do a git status, and it says that our branch is up to date with origin main, but there are some changes on a different branch that we need to commit. So let's switch back to our test branch. We now tell it to commit all files with the message, creating the test branch. And we get push to the or to the destination alias for me and the branch we want to push. And if we wait a moment, GitHub will create a new branch and take the changes. Coming back to our repo, GitHub helpfully tells us, hey, there is a new branch created. We can create, compare, and pull re make a pull request. I want to look at something first. Here's the readme on the main branch. And view all branches. We can switch to the test branch. And the readme looks exactly like it's supposed to from the test branch. This is from the test branch. This is great. Now let's make a pull request from our personal fork back to the org repo, crossing branches. And we have two choices here when we make this pull request. We can either say, take the test branch from our personal fork and request it to be merged into the main branch of the org repo, or we can have it create a test branch in the main repo. Here, we're just going to merge to main. Doing anything more than this, and we start to deviate from the fork and pull, we get into a more advanced workflow, and I don't want to go there just yet. We are testing branches. Great, let's create the pull request. GitHub will teleport us back to the org repo with a pull request, which we can choose to merge. Normally you'd want to inspect these things, but for the sake of simplicity and time, we're just going to merge it here. Outstanding. If we go back to the code, 
we can see that this edit was made from the test branch. We're looking at the main branch and the org repo. This is how easy it is. One final thing to look at before we leave this demo. Let's go back to our personal fork. And remember again, this branch is two commits behind our Dudley demo main. We can just quickly sync that fork, update the branch, and now our personal fork has the same commit history as the org repo. Now that we've looked at our readme file, let's take a peek at two of the other files that come out of the box with a GitHub repo. First, let's check out the MIT license. It's just the full text of an MIT license, including a summary of permissible uses at the top. That's pretty handy if you're starting open source projects and don't know which one you want to choose. You can choose a couple, pick through them, and see which one suits your needs. Also, the git ignore. This is a very powerful one because this is the one that tells Git what to exclude when it adds or updates files in your repositories. It's just a long list of things that can ignore. And you can edit this file. This is a, just a plain text file. You can add different things or take different things out. There's also the git ignore command, which will add to this file as well. Now that we've seen how to edit files and commit those changes, let's see how an add and delete works. Off camera, I've added a couple files to our repository. One is named add and one is named delete. I've already added the delete file and made a pull request to our main organization repository so we can see how a delete works without spending a lot of time in the demo. But let's see how to add a file. To add a file, we just use the command git add. And we have two options here. We can either name the file specifically using wildcards if necessary, or if we have a whole bunch of files, we can just use dash dash all, and all the files will be added. If we do a git status, we'll see that we have a file that's ready to be added to the repositories. So we do our git commit dash am adding a new file. Great message. And let's push it. Well, that's happening. Let's come in here and also delete this file. Just like we said, goodbye. We don't need that anymore. And we can do a git status again. And we see that now git has detected we've deleted a file. So we can do again, git commit deleted that file we'll push this. We could have done this in one commit, but I felt like doing two. And now that commit has been made in our local for our personal fork. So if we come up to our personal fork, we don't see any changes yet. We can refresh this page. And we'll see that the add file is there, but the delete is already gone. How does this look in a pull request? Let's create one. Click the pull request tab, click the new pull request button, and we can see how Git displays these. Git shows the add file as an add, and then because the file was deleted, there's no diff. It's just marked as deleted. Now we can create a pull request and merge it just like we did previously. For the sake of time, and since we've already seen a pull request, we'll skip actually completing this pull request. Here's a list of the commands I used in the demo today. This is also included in the slides, but you can pause here if you need to and write them down. Any of the commands marked for the host UI, I did in the GitHub UI. All the other Git hosts will have similar ones, but you'll need to refer to their instructions to exactly how to perform these operations. Anything labeled as command line, I did in the CLI, but any of the Git desktop GUIs will also have the same commands with the same name. You'll notice there isn't a delete on here. That's because there isn't one in Git. You just delete a file through the file system and the next commit picks up the change. And that was a very quick but complete demo of how the fork and pull workflow works. 
When I would do this type of training at a previous employer, the presentation I used was called Git in 10 Minutes, and people were amazed. Wow, that's all that it takes? It's not that hard. It's really not. Once you learn a few basic commands and, an, and a decent workflow, Git is very, very easy to use. After you get comfortable with the basics of working with Git, you can look at adding some intermediate practices. I demonstrated how branching works, and the next step is usually a branching strategy. When do you use branches? Do you merge from a branch directly into main and then make a pull request? Or do you make a pull request from a branch into main? Things like that. This is a team commitment you'll also want to document in your readme file. You'll also want to add some branch protection rules to ensure no one accidentally pushes to the main branch if you don't want them to. All of the Git hosts have the ability to display markdown files, and indeed we saw that in the demo. You can add extensive documentation which lives alongside your code or in a completely different repository using markdown. There are utilities to extract code comments into markdown files, which can also be a very powerful tool for documenting code libraries. Also, two-factor authentication. This doesn't have anything to do with Git. It has everything to do with protecting your account. Enable two-factor authentication. If you want to have something to read, like a book, on the Git website, there are free electronic copies of the book Pro-Git by Scott Chacon and Ben Straub. Scott is one of the founders of GitHub. Although this version of the book was published in 2014, the basics of Git have hardly changed since then, and this is still a very useful reference. Here are some additional Git best practices that you want to incorporate as you begin to use Git more and more. First of all, atomic commits. This means try not to mix multiple fixes or features into a single commit. Commits should have good messages, referencing a work item if you use those, and include only the changes for that work item or feature. Being familiar with Git workflows is worth the time. There are a lot of ways of using Git, and I've worked with teams who had a lot of trepidation getting started with new projects because they were worried they'd make a mistake in the setup or just couldn't figure out how they wanted to work. Additionally, different team members had different backgrounds with Git, and one may have wanted to use Git flow, and another use GitHub flow. And the discussions were long running. We sketched out the workflows on a whiteboard, discussed the pros and cons, the team agreed on one, we documented it, and off they went. And as they went, they modified it a little bit, making tweaks and documenting those tweaks. Do we add a branch here? When do we do this? When do we do that? As you begin finishing and releasing work, incorporate tags with each release. You're going to end up with a lot of commits, and tags are an easy way to find the last release. I get asked a lot about including packages in a repo. Unless it's a package you're developing, or you have some security reason to escrow a particular package, the answer is no. You'll bloat your repo horrendously and have conflicts in files you have no control over. Add your NPM or NuGet or whatever to the ignored list. You do, however, want to commit the packages manifest so that all developers are working with the same versions of the same packages. Git is very flexible in how you use it, and so documenting your team agreements on how to use it and contribute is a very good idea. This is a good use for a readme file. Some of what you want to agree on are the branching strategy and workflow. Can pull requests replace code reviews? Can contributors merge their own changes, as I did in this demo? And so on. Every time you come to a decision point, talk it out with your team and then document it. Although you can self-host Git with just the daemon, I strongly recommend using something with more features. I demonstrated with GitHub, but there are other good Git hosts out there. I've used Bitbucket a lot also. It's quite good on its own, but really nice if you also use Jira or other related products. All the commercial hosts have generous free plans, which are great for small teams or individuals getting started. If you want to self-host your Git server, look at Gitty or Gogs. True to the form of Git, Gitty is a fork of Gogs. Both are open source and have many of the same source control features the commercial services have, and both claim to be able to be run on Raspberry Pi hardware. I recommend something a little more robust for your critical code, but apparently these two services don't take too many resources to run. There are a number of Git GUIs. 
I did the demonstration with the command line, but I personally use a combination of the command line and some IDE plugins. Git GUI, which is part of the Git package, is eh, it's okay. Tortoise Git will be familiar to anyone using Tortoise SVN. As with Tortoise SVN, Tortoise Git is free and open source. Tortoise Git needs a companion tool for resolving conflicts, however. Git Kraken is a powerful desktop GUI from the wonderful Axosoft company. There are free and paid options. Git Desktop is also free and open source and works with any Git host. GitHub Desktop also needs a companion tool for resolving conflicts. Almost any ID can also work as a Git client, although some need a plugin, but others work with Git out of the box. WinMerge, DiffMerge, and Beyond Compare are good companion tools for editing conflicts. WinMerge is free and open source. DiffMerge and Beyond Compare have paid options. I've used both WinMerge and Beyond Compare in the past. WinMerge works just fine. Beyond Compare does a whole lot more than just merges and diffs, and it's worth the cost if you need those features. In addition to the standard git bash command line that I showed earlier, posh git is a PowerShell client for git. It's kind of cool, but I usually end up back at just the regular bash client. So, how to try git. Hopefully by now, you're very inspired. Start by going to gitscm.com, download, and install the correct binaries. Install a GUI, maybe Tortoise Git or something else. Create an account with one of the hosting services. Create a Hello World repo like I just did here. Make a poll, make changes, do a push, branch and merge. Work with a friend and break things, cause a conflict. Look at how the PRs work. Just goof around. You're not going to break anything. You'll learn a lot by just trying it. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Whatever time left, we'll dedicate to questions and answers. If we can't get to everything here, find me online. These are the two Twitter handles where you All right, fantastic. Great. Thank you, Richard. Or Rich, sorry, I keep saying Richard. Hope that you're okay with that. If you want to come on, we'll do some Q&A here. There you are. Oh, your audio is really quiet now. Ah, let me do this. How's that? That's a little better. It's a little garbled. I think it says your bandwidth is good, but um, I can understand you. Are you okay with Richard, or do you prefer Richard? You're good. You're good? All right. Either one works. So there's a few people chiming in about their favorite sub source controls. Uh, a number of fans of Subversion out there as well. That's great. Um, I always say, find what works for you and just make sure it's working right. You know, I don't care what you used in a day. <laughs> Subversion is great. It's, the it's Interact Development. Taurus SVM is a great client. It's a very good test. We use Serenus software. Um, so like I said at the beginning, I've out on Subversion for many years. And I went to a company that you get for 10 or 11 years. Now I'm at a software balance of version. So your audio is breaking up really bad. Um, I apologize. It says your bandwidth is fine, but um, your video and your audio are garbled. It's a dive issue on my laptop, so what does it apparently ruined my drivers at the drive sure to ride. Here. I'll go through some of the comments here while you're working on that. I, I these uh, technology, right? Uh, Lawyer says it takes a little time to get your head around Git, but it's worth the effort. I really appreciate the thing you said at the end about making a, uh, a hello world Git repo and just trying it out and stuff. That's I, I talk to people all the time. They're like, oh, I've watched the video on this. I think I'm up to speed on how to do it. And it's like, have you done it yet? And they're like, no. I'm like. If you haven't done it yet, you don't know what you're doing. It's like you, you're not going to learn to ride a bicycle or drive a car by reading a book or uh, watching a video. And, you know, it's the same thing with the these, I think. You can break anything. Lars is a fan of Git Kraken. Um, I, 
mostly used Predict. What I use, I use the command line and GitHub Desktop mostly. I think. Oh wait, I use another one too. I can't remember where it is. <laughs> uh, Fork is another pop popular one as well. Let's see. Uh, Patrick chimed in and says, great session, Rich. Uh, will be useful for any developers on YouTube after this event. Uh, yeah. I, again, if you're not using if you're not using a source control, use source control. <laughs> if you're like, I prefer subversion versus Git, that's great. Just use something. Make sure it's you're using source control and you have a effective backup. And your just your cloud host technically is not shouldn't be considered a, a good backup. You need to have a secondary backup. Your video looks better now. Who's <laughs> the auto? A little bit of your... <laughs> um, Lars said, I wish I had this presentation when we started using Git. It's great. Thank you. I, I There's a lot of good information there. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And I'm a big fan of Beyond Control, too. Just got to shout that out there. Uh, Thomas has a question here. How do you resolve merge conflicts in DFM files? Is there a visual comparison tool, or do you just have to edit DFM by hand and visualize changes in your head? Well, you can use, I mean, DFM is as text, and you can resolve the merges as text. Um, but, uh, I mean, so you can see the differences in text there. That's what I what I'd recommend. I don't think Beyond Compare, yeah, Beyond Compare doesn't do a, a form render. That would be a cool feature to add. So I want you to make a feature request to them. <laughs> um, oh, what's the other tool? There's another add-in for Delphi Project Magician that standardizes your project file format, which keeps, because sometimes the project file reorder itself. With Project Magician, it stops that from happening, and that makes it much easier to resolve conflicts when you're checking in project files. Um, Sylvan says, perfect explanation of version control. Thanks. I'm going to get a link to the replay and send it to my colleagues. Awesome. That's great. We try uh, going off video. See if that helps with the audio. It's a little better. You're understandable. It's just little, it's still a little garbled. Okay. Actually, that's getting better. Yeah, that's getting better. Um, for that. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. We we checked your audio beforehand too, and still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mo gremlins. <laughs> yep, gremlins. Yeah. Uh, someone suggested it might be your gain's too high in your microphone. It might be clipping. Uh, Terry says, "Great companion to the Git video previously put out in a webinar that deals with using it." Thread Studio. Yeah, I I've used and you mentioned this as well, Richard. You, you used it with a number of different IDE plugins, a number of different GUIs. I still find I use the command line a lot, and I think. There's a lot of times there's advantages. I use use it from Rad Studio. I use it from uh, different uh, GUIs. But I still think at the end of the day, having the command line in, as well is really important. And that's all base commands too. A lot of the UIs just don't make the command anyway. Yeah. Yeah, the the the, uh, the GUI makes you more productive, but at the end of the day, command lines get all the power. Because if you think about it, the command line is just a wrapper around, or I'm sorry, the GUI is a wrapper around the same API as exposed to the command line. Martin, if there's specific features you want to see around uh, Git improvements for Red Studio, submit them as a feature request on quality.marketera.com. Um, and John saying he wants to build a GUI, his own GUI for Git. That would be awesome. <laughs> I, I I run into a number of uh, command line tools that I'm like, ah, I need a GUI that just wraps up these certain features here to make me more productive.
I like your comment here, Richard. Rich. Yes, I always do talk to myself when using the command line. <laughs> uh, me too. And yeah, Lars says, "What's using?" <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, when working from home, yeah, all the times you just got the only one you talk to. <laughs> This is this is a good tip. I haven't had I don't think I've had too much trouble with Delphi having files locked, but it is something to be aware of is that sometimes you have files locked. Um, so make sure. Especially databases. If you have a database open, that's the one that gets me the most up. Okay. Well, sorry again for the audio issues. Um, oh, here's a comment here from before committing updates, I always check Before to change the updates, DFM files. Change really DFM files. Really I'm getting an audio echo from the trainers off here. I'm getting echo back from you, Rich. I'm going to mute you for a second. If they're really important changes or if it's just focus tab change or position or some GUI elements falsely moved. Yeah, so that's that's a decent point. Is And actually, your comment about atomic commits, so important. I was a... Um, a development team lead for a while and i had one developer that was notorious for going in to fix a bug or add a feature and would see other code he's like i don't know what this is doing i'm going to just take this out or that looks wrong it would just change all sorts of stuff everywhere it always caused problems <laughs> so yeah if you're going in making atomic commits then that makes it much easier to resolve dfm changes right because you're like i didn't change anything in the dfm then you know you don't need to uh you can keep the ones on the uh, the server. All right, I unmuted you. If there's anything else you want to add, uh, I need the uh, the sites available, Jim. We can get them out. Uh, like you know, the uh, some use, so I imagine the slide might be handy too. Yeah, um, we'll uh, follow up and get slides and everything from you later, and get those posted so that. Uh, they're available, although if you want to add them to your blog as well, you can do that. And then, um, yeah, uh, Martha will follow up with you later and get slides and code from everybody, and we'll have a, a blog post with everything available. So, cool. Fantastic. Sylvan says, uh, about DFM, sometimes I got differences with explicit top and left appearing and disappearing without understanding it. Any idea? Um, I don't know offhand. I, again, my rule of thumb is, like Rich was saying, atomic commits, right? So if you're not making a change to the DFM, don't check it in, right? <laughs> if there's a change in the DFM and you didn't make a change, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you are going in and making changes to the DFM, then just commit it. Now, if there's a conflict, um, then that gets a little more complicated. Um yeah, you'd have to you'd have to resolve it locally, make sure it still worked, which is a good practice anyway. Even if you're resolving conflicts in code, you make sure your code still works after resolving those conflicts before committing it. So, all right, Rich, we need to do another session. You do so in software has such great tools out there. I would love to do another session with you on some of your uh, your your tools as well. So, yeah, I'd be happy to. And we'll get the audio working for sure next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. Do that too. Okay. Oh yeah, you have to have visual representation to resolve it and make sure that your uh, your DFMs. It like I said, if you're resolving a conflict in code or DFM, run it again after you've made the changes locally before committing it. Um, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, sorry for the issues. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, it goes around apparently. And, uh, yeah, up next we have, uh, getting physical in your game with castle game engine. Very exciting. Um, castle game engine added Delphi support, uh, a while back and is, keeps getting new features. And it's very exciting to see all the great stuff going on and very excited to see physics support. So that will be starting here in just one minute. We'll see you then.
Okay, hello, hello everyone, hope you have a good time at DelphiCon 2023. And let's get to getting physical in your games with Castle Game Engine. I'm Mihalis Kamburelis, I'm the author of Castle Game Engine, I'm going to talk a bit about the engine, a lot about the engine, and I'm going to show you some demos of how to use it for some well, cool stuff, and I'm also going to put a special focus on some features that we did recently. So let's start with what is Castle Game Engine. Well, it's a free and open source game engine, first of all. So you can go ahead and you can download it right now and you can use it. It's all completely free. The source code is available. Go ahead and have fun. Uh, it's an engine suitable for both 3D and 2D games. So, for example, you can make a first-person shooter game, or you can make a 2D game where you view some map from the top, or you can mix them. For example, you can have a two-dimensional game where something is scrolling, for example, but then some of the objects may be actually in 3D, so they can have rotations in 3D, they can have lighting, they can cast shadows, and so on and so on. So, 3D and 2D. Uh, our, I guess, main feature since some time is a very powerful visual editor. I'm going to show you a lot of it today. Mm. The idea is that you can design user interface, three-dimensional worlds and two-dimensional worlds of your games inside Castle Game Engine Editor. It's kind of like other game engines that you may have known about. And uh, yeah, you can do a lot of stuff there. And of course, it integrates nicely with the code because everything you do there, everything you see there, well, those are just Pascal classes. Everything you see here, they're like a properties. Well, those are just properties of Pascal classes. So it's a powerful visual editor and everything you see there, it maps nicely to a simple object-oriented Pascal API under the hood. We do support a number of formats, in particular GLTF and XVD, and also Spine, that's a common animation format for two-dimensional models. Uh, it's using Pascal, as you can guess, so our code is what I would call a clean object-oriented cross-platform code, where everything is done using Pascal, like no tricks, it really works on a number of platforms. And we support Delphi, in particular we support Delphi Community Edition, the free version of Delphi, so yeah, no excuse not to use it, basically. Uh, the engine is also cross-platform. We support a number of desktop platforms, Linux, Windows, macOS, FreeBSD, uh, mobile, uh, Android, iOS. We support also Nintendo Switch, uh, Raspberry Pi. Though there is a small disclaimer here, with the Delphi, we only support Windows right now. It's This is going to be rectified very soon, but yeah, we, we want to support all the other platforms with Delphi 2. So, okay. Uh, so, as I said, like, go ahead and just get it from our website. You can install it, you can use it right now, today, completely free, completely open source. Uh, so, I guess one of the excuses for doing this talk is that we will have uh, very soon a new release of the engine, 7.0 Alpha 3. Mm. We we're kind of nearing towards something big. So, the 7.0 Alpha 3 is, uh, features a number of well, I would say uh, big things, and one of those is physics, and I'm going to focus on physics a lot about in, in this talk. So we have some new components, how to define physics in a really comfortable way. You can also use forces, like you can say from code that you know something is pushing something else with some force. You can run the physics simulation also in the editor, and you have joints and a few other features related to physics. We also have kind of upgraded our support for shadows. We have shadow volumes and shadow maps, and in particular the shadow volumes are just, it's just a checkbox, <laughs> you can activate it in the engine, and that's what it should be, I mean, it's very, very simple to use now, and that's actually a big thing, I mean, it, it, it makes them so much more useful. Uh, we also support tiled maps, we did support them a long time ago, our support right now is kind of better, we support a huge map, we support maps with animations, they can even be 3D, so we support a lot of more features about how to design your maps using tiled. If you don't know what it is, it's a very cool map editor and I'm going to show it to you later. Okay, we also have a component to just drop the engine rendering on a VCL or FireMonkey form. 
But by default, you kind of the engine has kind of a dedicated window. We call it the castle T castle window. But with T castle control, you can also just put the engine a, a, a rendering and processing inside a larger Delphi form, where you can place your regular VCL and Fire Monkey controls, and it's not just going to be placed play nicely with Castle Game Engine Editor. So that's that's kind of the roadmap of the stock, like talk about the new features in 7.0 Alpha 3 and also to give you just a general overview of the engine. Now looking into the future, well, we are aiming for a big 7.0 release, hopefully in March, so in next month. Uh, don't worry about the slide, it's kind of a joke. I mean, the left column is not readable, I know. We have a lot of features done since the last release. And uh, yeah, we want to actually have a new stable release 7.0, well, as I say, next month. Okay, and let's go with, I would say, the main part of this presentation, which is going to be demos. I'm going to show you how to use Castle Game Engine using Castle Game Engine Editor and, of course, using Delphi. To, to design and implement something cool. Uh, so let's start. Let's start with the three dimensional demo. So let's run the engine editor. Let's create a new project. You can create a new project from a number of templates. Uh, for this for this presentation, I'm going to use the 3D first person shooter game template. Uh, let's call it, let's call it uh, whatever. That's something unique. And once you open a project, you are greeted with a such window. It, the main point of this window is to show you that your project has two views. One is the mini, the other is play. The view in Castle Game Engine is kind of a special concept. Um, it's similar, a lot similar to what Delphi form is. So the idea is that the view displays something and each view has an associated Pascal unit where you can define how to react to user mm, doing some actions like pressing some keys or some buttons in your view. So similar to Delphi applications, when you at least at the beginning, when you start doing them, you are going to put your initial logic on a form, on this, on that form, because you are going to just react to user input and it's it's the same in Castle Game Engine view, yeah? so the view displays something and you have a unit that can react to user clicking on something, doing something, okay? So this sample project, well, this, this template of the project, it has two views at the beginning. It has the menu view that uh, shows the user just some menu that you can, you, know, you can choose to play or quit the game. And once you choose to play, then there's a ready code that switches the game view to play mode. And the play mode is, as you can see, well, kind of more interesting. So the idea here is that what I see is a three-dimensional uh, view. So there's a viewport that has a background. This background is the skybox that you see around. And inside of this viewport, I have a number of scenes. A scene is something that comes from a ready model, ready asset, like in GLTF format. And I can design such scene, like a level or like a soldier. I can design it using, for example, Blender. And in fact, the enemies and the levels that have been designed here have been indeed made using Blender. So we can even open Blender and we can see how it looks like. For now, let's just see that yeah, all those soldiers, they came from the soldier dot gltf uh, soldier one dot gltf file and i can do a lot of stuff with them for example i can duplicate them okay so like now i'm using castle game engine editor and i'm using those gltf models of soldiers as kind of a like like, like, like a blocks like a lego blocks okay so i can duplicate them i can rotate them move them around and uh, arrange them in any way i would like to uh, I can also change their animations, and here I can use any animation that I, ha I have designed in Blender, okay? So I can do stuff like this, and I can do stuff like this, and that's a little boring animation, and I can do stuff like this, and I guess I can also delete it. Uh, so all those things that you see, they have been somehow designed by Blender and then arranged in Castle Game Engine Editor to show you well, to show some level design. And those creatures have also some added, some very simple intelligence from code that allows them to walk basically left, right, and we will also be able to shoot them. So there's some ready logic in this template project, uh, but not much. The point here is just to kind of get you started. 
Uh, what point can I do here? Well, we have something called camera here, and the camera of course tells you what the user will actually see when the user will run this project. Yeah? So you can even increase this camera preview. Uh, for example, I can even move this camera. So when I'm moving the camera on the world, you can observe in the camera preview how it actually changes what the user will see. What's more? Well, we have also the lights configuration in Castry Game Engine Editor. Although you can also design a lights in Blender, it's actually much easier and, uh, well, that's more efficient to just add lights in Castle Game Engine Editor and configure their look, color and so on in Castle Game Engine Editor. By default we have a light called Directional Light that casts shadows over the scene. Oh, it's already using those shadows that I wanted to mention. So this is the shadows checkbox, yes, so this is it. <laughs> the shadows just work like that, you just toggle them with a checkbox. And yeah, this Directional Light casts those shadows. As you can see when the objects animate those those shadows animate too, and that's exactly what should happen. And of course, if I would start, for example, to animate the lighting, well, then also the shadows move appropriately. And you can, of course, configure a lot of parameters of lighting here. Uh, to do, to actually show it best, let me actually change the class of this lighting into something more uh, dramatic. Okay, so let's choose the spotlight. Uh, the spotlight looks like this, okay? So it's like a cone of lighting that looks, that shines on the level. And of course I can do a lot of tweaks here, for example, I can increase the intensity of it, I can change the color of it. Let's go ahead like this, okay? So I can configure the light like this and uh, it works. It allows me to give my scene the effect that I would like to have. And remember that everything that I show here all those things, they are Pascal classes with Pascal properties. So everything I do here in the editor, but it also can be done using the Pascal code at runtime. So, for example, what you see here, the Tcastle point light or Tcastle spotlight, it's a Pascal class. And what you see here, the intensity, the color, the beam width, well, those are Pascal properties of those classes. You are able to access those components at runtime and uh, modify them in whatever way you want to at runtime to do yeah, whatever you want, whatever effect you would like to achieve. And then another thing I want to show on this three-dimensional demo is I want to show you how to attach behaviors to your transformation objects. So the behavior, the idea of the behavior is that it doesn't display anything on its own, but it just controls the parent to do something, well, something useful with the parent, for example, modifies the parent transformation. At runtime, actually, to all those four soldiers, we will attach some behavior that will make them walk left and right. But let's also attach some behaviors at design time, just so you can see, well, how they work, okay? So let's start and create a transformation called image, the castle image transform. This is something that you can use just to display an image, okay? And let's load here an image. I have an icon of our engine here loaded, and it looks like this. So it's it's way too huge, of course, to be useful, but of course I can make it smaller by adjusting the size of it. Well, it's for example to to bay two. Okay, so that's how the image looks like. Now uh, this is well, this is this is not supposed to be impressive, okay? This is just a simple two-dimensional image displayed in a three-dimensional world. But why I'm doing it? Well, now I want to show you a behavior called billboard. So billboard allows, uh, makes the object that is attached to, it will make this object always oriented, such that the front of this object will face nicely the camera. So I can do like this, and there you have it. Now, when I'm moving around this image, you can see, from this perspective, you can see very clearly how it rotates to always face the camera, although it's still a 3D object, it still stays at the three-dimensional position that it was, it's just rotating to face me, okay? So that's, I would say, a basic example of a behavior 
and we're going to use this idea of behaviors much more later. So I guess let's do one last thing to make sure that everything works, which is to actually compile and run the project, of course. So uh, to run the project using Delphi, to compile the project using Delphi, just make sure that in the preferences, in the compilation tab, the Delphi is selected and that you have detected the Delphi path correctly. I have already done it previously, so cool. So let's now click run. And this will do actual compilation of the project using the Delphi command line compiler. And once it finishes, it will also run the project. And there you have it. Okay, so let's click play. And our amazing uh, design, including this billboard with the image and including those soldiers that walk around under the yellow spotlight is working, okay? The project has also some ready logic for shooting, so I can also shoot those guys, right? So that's a basic first-person <laughs> shooter game <laughs> available in Castle Game Engine. And one more thing that I want to mention here is that, well, you don't have to build the project from Castle Game Engine Editor. You can also just open Delphi and you can run it, you can compile and run it from Delphi, which is in particular useful if you would like to use the debugger. So yeah, you can just run it from Delphi, you can use the Delphi debugger to debug your games and uh, yeah, it just works because it's all just Pascal units underneath. So, I guess the final, I would say, a generic demo before I jump into some physical specific features is how to actually do something from code using a uh, custom game engine. Because so far I have mostly shown you how to do, use custom game engine editor. Well, but the very point of what I'm doing is that it's all available from Pascal code and you can use Pascal code to do well anything you want in your games. So let's go ahead and do something simple. Hmm. Let's open our three-dimensional demo again, and I want to actually create. I want to. I want to make two things. Okay, so I want to make something happen when I press a button, and I also want to make something happen when I press a key. Okay, uh, and I want the something to actually be. Let's play some sound. Okay, so I have downloaded some amazing sound that sounds like zap. Okay. And I love this sound, okay? So this is an amazing sound. I want to be able to play it in this game forever. So let's add a button to play it and let's also make this zap sound be played when I press the Z key on my keyboard, okay? So like those two features I would like to implement now. Okay, so first of all, let's start and let's copy this file into the data directory of my project. So I'm just copy and pasting the audio file into the data of my project. I want to place it into the data subdirectory of it, okay? And now I want to define something called tcastle sound component that is like an easy wrapper around an audio file that will allow me to configure some parameters of this file. I actually don't want to configure anything uh, and allows me to play the sound easily. Okay, so let's create a non-visual component, sound. There we can configure the URL of the file. Okay, once we have this, let's rename this component to sound zap and let's also add a button to actually activate it, okay? So this is going to be our amazing button. I'm going to call it zap and I'm going to make it very, very big so that you can see it, okay? Uh, let's make the font also, okay? crazy big, I guess. Uh, okay, so we have a button. Let's call this button also zap. So we have a button zap and I want to play sound zap when I press this button. Okay, so let's go to Delphi. Let's open the unit called game state, uh, game view play. And yeah, and this is where I can configure what happens when the user is pressing various things. Okay, so from this thing, I want to access button zap. So I'm just going to define it, uh, declare it. The value of this published property will be automatically set when you actually uh, load the design. This is actually similar to what happens with when you load the Delphi form. Okay. And now I'm going to need a sound for this. Okay. And now I'm going to connect. So. I'm going to assign an event. So when somebody clicks on a button, 
I want to call the method called zap, okay? And the method called zap is as, well, because it's trivial declaration as you would expect, okay? So this is a method called zap, and what can I do here? Well, I can play a sound, okay? So I can use the sound engine singleton, and I can use the play method of the singleton. And here I can pass the sound that I actually want to play. Uh, and that's it, okay? So that's the way how you can play the sound. Let's actually make some log, okay? Just to confirm that it's all working perfectly. So that's one way to play something. When the user presses the button, we are going to play the zap sound. Another way to play something, and I'm going to show you because, well, why we add it, why not? So react to user pressing some keys. So the view has a, by default, the templates uh, have a method, uh, have defined a method called press on a view. And you can play some code there to react to user pressing some keys. For example, when the user will press the Z key, let's, uh, as I said, I love this sound, so let's also play the zap sound, okay? And let's exit with true to tell the engine that the key has been handled. Eh, it doesn't matter in this case, but in case you have something more complicated and something else could process this key, well, this way we have told that this key, the Z key, is already handled. Okay, then let's compile it. No, oh, no right. Okay, now let's see what happens, okay? Amazing. So that's what I want. I can press this button as many times as I would like to, and it produces the debug output zap, and it's also making the sound I wanted. If I don't want to press on the button, I can also press the keyboard. I think I can make some music this way. Yeah, so this is the way that you can play sound uh, from Caster Game Engine, and this is in general, this is a way how you can react to user pressing on a button or pressing some keys. So, and that's also, I guess, the basic demo of how you can use the Caster Game Engine API. And I'm going to show you more now. So let's jump into, I would say, the main course of this presentation, which is the physics. Mm. So one of the, I guess, more important features that we have done recently, uh, thanks to Andrzej Kliansky, who has developed a lot of this, and thanks to Craft Physics and Engine from Benjamin Rousseau, uh, so we have a really full-featured physics engine in Castle Game Engine, and it's kind of really easy, really easy in integrated in a way that is really easy to use it from Castle Game Engine. So let's go ahead and let's see how to actually use it. For this purpose, I'm going to just create a new project starting from the empty template. Let's call it like this. And the empty template, well, as the name says, it's kind of empty at the beginning. <laughs> so it looks like this, and that's cool. We're going to create a new user interface element, a viewport, a three-dimensional viewport, okay? Let's move it like this, so the frames per second counter is visible. And okay, what can I do here once I have this, well, almost empty viewport? Well, it's not really empty, right? It has a camera, it has a light, and it has a plane, just as a nice thing to place some stuff on it. Okay, so let's add some physical things on top of it. So let's start with a box, okay? That's our standard born box. Uh, let make, let's make it look a bit nicer by creating another light. And only one of those lights will cast shadows like this. Okay, let's also make this plane a bit larger like this. Okay. I guess the light casting shadow should be like this. Uh, okay, so that's our amazing box. Let's add something more. Let's also add a sphere. Okay, crazy. And then let's assign some physical stuff for them, because by default, well, those are just static box and static sphere. Nothing happens with them. They are just going to hang in the air by default. Now, if I want to, I can instead assign some physical components to them to make them aff be affected by gravity and be affected by collisions with each other. How to do this? Well, I'm going to add a behavior and I'm going to choose the physics uh, subsection and I'm going to choose a collider. Now, for each object, 
you should choose like the most suitable collider in particular for box well of course there's a box collider that makes it behave naturally and i'm going to do the same for sphere okay so it's physics collider sphere you can see on the left what actually happens so when i'm adding a collider it's adding a box collider it's also adding something called a rigid bod those two components rigid bod and the collider they kind of work closely together with each other and now we can actually run physics i can run the game and just observe it from the point of view from the camera so the camera looks like this and the camera will see everything okay but i can also use something called physics simulation inside the engine and this is kind of a quick way to actually preview how your physics behaves so let's see how it behaves okay they go down into infinity because i forgot one thing well by default the ground the ground is not a physics object by default and they fall through okay but this is easy to fix so let's add a behavior physics plane collider on the ground and now they will behave like this so they will stop here okay and of course i can duplicate those things to very quickly create something um, i guess more fun with it okay let me just move the lighting somewhere there and i'm just pressing now duplicate ctrl d and this is well a very easy way to of course create some more chaos in your scene so let's see how this thing behaves okay so as you can see the box has reacted like correctly to the fact that it is that it collides with the spheres underneath it's pushing them around it's rolling them and so on and so on and that's what should happen okay so let's create something more interesting okay because this is just a plane with some boxes okay first of all let's start and create some well let's call it a simple leveling blender i really just want to show you that you can design some easy thing in blender and you can load it quickly in castle game engine so how how would go about it so let's first save our scene let's open blender and let's create our amazing level in blender how to do it well i'm just going to create a terrain okay so this is a quick way to design a terrain in blender there we have it okay and now i can easily load this terrain into custom game engine in order to make it available for custom game engine i want to export it i want to export it to gltf format and uh, the default export settings are actually good enough uh, for the simple object though i almost intuitively actually click some additional things which are apply modifiers and remember export settings and this way the level will be exported to the gltf file with well, what i would call the most suitable settings usually okay so let's have a level okay how can i actually now access it from custom game engine well now i have the file called level.gltf in my data subdirectory i can also preview it in custom game engine so if I would select it here, okay. So this is my quick preview of the level.gltf in Castle Game Engine Editor, okay. And now what I actually want to do, of course, is just to place it, okay. So I'm just going to drag it and place it like this on my screen. Now uh, I'm going to actually, I mean, there's a, there are two ways now what I can do. I can take all my stuff that I have designed here and I can position it at a sensible place on my terrain or I can do it the other way around I can take this terrain and move it a bit lower and now this way like make everything arranged in a sensible way so let's delete this plane let's take this new scene from Blender that we have created let's press F like focus to make sure that we see everything okay it's kind of black because the lighting the lighting is underneath it okay it's no problem let's just move this thing lower lower and like this and let's also make this terrain have precise collisions this way it will react nicely with the walk navigation that i'm going to add here in a second and uh, that's going to be i think a good starting point for more fun that i want to show here ah, let's move it here 
So that's our, I guess, simple level designed in Blender from a Terra in some boxes, okay? And now I'm sure you can imagine how to do it 100 times better. So let's see, let's make sure that it works. So I want to add here a user interface navigation that will allow the user to automatically navigate in your world. Because by default, well, the camera just stands still and there is no default reaction to what user is pressing. You have to implement it or, as I say, use our ready component that implements those reactions for you. So we have a walk component, uh, the walk navigation component, that will kind of perform what you would expect in a typical first person shooter games. So I'm just adding a walk navigation component to the viewport and that's it. It will just work. It will allow the user to navigate in our world. Mm, and let's test it. So let's run the game. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm often like clicking at the camera preview because before running the game. Because this, of course, shows what the user will see once we will run the game. Okay. And that's it. So the user has stayed on the ground correctly because the ground has precise collisions. Yeah, but we have again made the same mistake that I guess five minutes ago because the physical objects, they fall through because the terrain it doesn't have any collider. And that's of course very easy to fix. So we can add a behavior called Mesh Collider. And this way those objects will stay on our terrain. Let's first test running the physical simulation. Okay, it's better now. And now let's do another test by running the actual game. Okay, and everything falls down and everything behaves well, in a way it should, okay? Let's do, and those balls, they will fall down into infinity soon. Let them go. Um, okay, so what more can we do here? Well, first of all, let's make our navigation a bit better. For the debug purposes, I have usually found that it's actually better to have some larger move speed. And also it's very useful in games to have something called mouse look. Mouse look means that when I will move my mouse around the screen, then it will translate to the rotations of my camera. So that's an easy way to rotate your camera by activating the mouse look. Now let's do something more with physics because, okay, now we can drop those things, but that's not very interesting. Let's say I want to shoot something and I want this thing that I'm going to shoot to actually collide with other things using physics. Okay, how to go about it? Well, let's start with Blender, okay? So let's start by designing some simple model that will act as a missile that I'm going to shoot, okay? So let's go like this. Let's switch to the Blender front view and let's use cylinder. And I'm going to align the initial, the cylinder in this way, okay? And now let's scale it because I want to create something like an arrow out of it, okay? So this scale will work, I think, yes. Now let's select this thing and extrude it, okay? Now I'm going to scale it and I'm going to extrude it again. And now I'm going to press M like merge, okay? And amazing, this is my missile. This is what I want to shoot in my game, okay? Let's make it also shaded perfectly. And that's cool, that's the missile that I will want to use in my game to shoot stuff, okay? So let's save it just like with the level. Let me save it as a Blender file. And then let me export it to the GLTF file so the Castle Game Engine can actually use it. Okay, so let's switch those things. Again, actually the default ones, the default settings have been good. I, I guess mm -hmm. uh, now, now a hobby to switch them. Um, okay, so now we have something called Missile. Okay, so let me just do it like this. Okay, so the missile is visible here. However, well, okay, now how do I place this missile on my level? Sure, I can just load this GLTF file at runtime, but this would also not do what I want, because this way I won't have the physics components available on this missile. And I don't want to just add this missile to the level, because, well, it's not initially present on the level. I want to shoot this missile, for example, when I press mm, Enter on my keyboard, okay? So the way to do it in Castle Game Engine is to create something called the design that will compose the scene with the missile with the components that determine how does this missile move from the point of view of the physics engine. 
If you come from the background of, for example, Unity, then you may recognize this pattern in Unity. This is called prefab, which stands for prefabricated object in Unity. So in Castle Game Engine, we have something similar. It's called the design, and it's basically a way to like compose visually a few components into something, well, into something bigger that you can then later easily instantiate from your code. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create it. Let's create a new transform and the transform is root. And it looks like this, okay? So nothing fancy. Yeah, but now, okay, we're adding here a missile. And actually, I don't want any transformation additional to be applied on this missile. And now, okay, so we have a scene with missile and additionally, now I want to apply here uh, physics behaviors. So let's create a collider. Um, box is kind of okay for this collider, okay? Let's make sure that the size of this box is sensible. Yes, it is. It matches the missile. And let's save it. And I'm going to call it just missile. So now I have the field called, the, the file called missile.castle-transform in my data. And cool, this is what I will want to now load and like spawn when the user is pressing some keys, for example, enter, something like this. And let's go ahead and let's actually do it, okay? So let's open our project in Delphi. Okay, let's go to the view main. And okay, now when the user is pressing some key, so when the user is pressing the enter key, okay, so that's my start. I want to spawn, I want to spawn a copy of this missile, okay? How do I do this? Well, I want to declare the missile, it's going to descend from the Tecastle transform class. This corresponds to this to transform class at the root of this design. So that's why I'm declaring it here as descending from the tcastle transform class. Of course, I have to remember to use the unit when I should. Mm. Now, okay, so I have declared the missile. Now I want to load the missile. I don't want to just create a new instance of this class. I want to load the instance of this class from file. And to do this, I'm going to use the transform load method, uh, actually routine, it's a global one, and I'm going to here specify the field name missile.castle transform and it lies in the castle data special magical data subdirectory, okay? So this file name corresponds to what I have set here. Okay, now this is a component so it actually has to be only something. I'm going to assign an owner called free at stop, which means that if the view will switch to something else, which it will not in case of this game, but if this view would switch to something else, then the missile would get automatically destroyed. Okay, so now I have this missile in my hand. Well, by default it's not visible anywhere, I want to actually add it to the viewport, okay? So let's go ahead, let's switch to our view, and let's rename this viewport to something, well, let's call it meaningful, okay? So I'm going to call it main viewport, I'm going to declare it. Okay, and now here I can say, okay, main viewport, while well, the main viewport has items. Oops. Of course I have to add it to the user's class, okay? So the main viewport has items, and this items is, well, it's what you see here in the custom game engine editor. The items is what is visible in the viewport. Okay, cool. So to the items, let's add our missile. Okay. However, now this is a bit, this is still too simple to actually make any sense, because now I have added a missile to the viewport, but at what point, at what translation is it added? What? At the default one. And with what direction? Well, with the default one. So we're just going to stand at the 0, 0, 0 position in my level, not even visible, and it's going to be pointing toward, the, I guess, the negative z-axis. So that's not very useful. So I want the initial position of my missile. It's called translation in Castle Game Engine. I want it to correspond to the position of the camera. So, you know, I'm shooting like the missile from where I'm standing at. Okay, so let's use the viewport camera translation as a good initial position of this missile. I can also actually 
make it even like further so like shoot it not exactly from my camera but shoot it from some point b b in front of my camera okay so i could do it uh, <laughs> i could do it like this for example okay so okay now the missile have a sensible translation let's also orient the missile so that it's directed correctly at the beginning and to do this i'm of course adjusting the missile direction in the same way so the missile direction by default it matches my camera direction okay cool and this way the missile will actually be oriented just like my line of sight okay cool let's see how it works okay so i'm like walking around and let me press enter and that's what happens when i press enter okay i can press enter many times and as you can see yeah the missile is now a physical object and i'm just you know dropping it on the ground where i stand uh so okay that's i guess what was what was supposed to happen so the position and the direction of the missile matches my camera and it's a physical object and i just drop it on the level where i stand okay i guess the one more thing that i want to do is when i shoot the missile i want to actually apply some initial speed to it so it goes well forward instead of just falling down along with gravity now the way to apply some initial speed well, you can use the forces api to do it you can apply some impulse or force at the beginning but there's actually a simpler way in, in, in this case which is to access the rigid body component of this missile and just apply some initial linear velocity so that the missile will fly with some velocity yeah just as it is should okay so how how to go about it so i want to access the rigid body component of this missile i have already designed this component as you recall here this transformation has a component rigid body of the class t castle rigid body and okay this is actually well, there are multiple ways to access it but this way is actually the easiest in this case so i can go ahead and on the instantiated missile i want to find behavior with a class t custom rigid body and i know it's going to be there because i just did it so i just added it there so i can actually in case of this demo i can just assume that it is there okay so this is this definition and a way to operate this physical body and what can i do with it well it has the property called linear velocity that i'm not going to adjust so i want the velocity of this missile to be just like direction that i'm looking at but i want it to be larger yeah the length of this vector is meaningful so i want to do it like this and this way the missile will actually fly forward okay and now as you can see I can shoot with this missile and it bounces correctly off the terrain it bounces correctly off everything else in particular i can oh i can shoot the sphere yeah go 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 go, go. Yeah, so i can now play around like this i can do some really crazy thing as you can see <laughs> terribly fast I'm an amazing game yeah so I, I can do some crazy thing with physics and this way incredibly fast the thing flies with physics the thing collides with everything else that is affected by physics including other missiles terrain uh, those spheres and boxes that have i guess long gone now into oblivion no there's this okay i will, I will leave it. Ah, yeah. uh, so so yes i can i can do everything i want to with physics and it's it's a lot of fun i guess uh, okay so what more could we do here with this so we can now shoot things and uh, they collide with other things i guess the last thing that i want to show in this physics demo is how to make an explosion so imagine that you want to have like a center of explosion and when something happens for example when i press some button i want this thing to like explode which means that every other physical object should like bounce off it okay so it like go around it okay so how would we go around making it okay so let's start by going to our level and let's actually put something that will represent our um, explosion center at our level okay so i'm going to just use a simple sphere for it Let's assign the color to it. Ah, just like this. Okay, so this is going to be 
our center of explosion. I'll let it lie here, like on the terrain, okay? So this is our center of explosion. Let me rename it actually explosion center. Yes, okay? Now I want to access this explosion center from the code, of course. Okay. And I guess one additional thing that I want to do is I want to have a button to actually activate this thing. Okay. So I want the button to make it explode. And just like last time. Let's make it a big button. Alright. Uh, so this is the button that will, I guess, make everything go boom. Mm -hmm. And now I want to handle the user clicking on the button by causing the actual explosion. There's one detail here actually, in order to click on this button I will have to uh, deactivate the mouse look. So let me just do it by the way, okay? So I have the button explode, I also have the main walk navigation. Okay, now two things. When user presses escape, I want to toggle the mouse look on and off so that you can actually click on the button, okay? Because otherwise the mouse look will kind of hold your mouse glued to the window and you will not be able to actually click on the button. Okay, so toggling the mouse look is, I guess, simple enough. If event ski escape, then toggle the mouse look. Okay, and the next thing is handling this button explode. As you can guess, I will want to have a method called explode that actually reacts to it. Okay, so I have a button explode. Let me assign an event to it. On click, explode, cool. Okay, and now let's actually define. So I guess let, let's do the main uh, the main thing that we have came here to do, which is to define what happens when you press on this button to explode. So what I want to do is I want to enumerate all the physical objects that are in my world. In order to do this, one way is to use something called find all behaviors. And if I run it on the main viewport items, it can find all the behaviors present in my viewport. So everything that I spawned, everything that was already there, all those things will be found by find all behaviors. And I go and I want to find everything that has a physical body. So I want to find the custom rigid body, all the T custom rigid body instances, okay? And what we are going to get from this is a TCAS2 behavior list and we're going to iterate over it, right? Let's make sure to also free it. Oops, okay. Now for behavior in behavior list, okay. Now each of those behaviors, I know that this is a widget body behavior. Okay, cool. So I have a behavior and I have a widget body. Okay, so this is I guess a, a bit of boring piece of code that says, okay, take all the tcast widget body instances present in the viewport. Now iterate over them, iterate over them, access all of them as a rigid body, and now to the good stuff, okay? So what can I do with this rigid body? Well, I want to, the easiest way, I guess, to make an explosion is to apply an impulse on every physics body around me. And the impulse has two things. Mm. The first parameter, the impulse, it's actually a direction. So it's a direction along which the force will act on this object. And the second parameter is a point position from which this 
force will act. And I know both of those things because now I have this explosion center, right? I have this defined this object called explosion center. So this is great. This is my position from which the explosion occurs. Okay? So let's define a vector center is defined like this. So this vector I know the center because the center corresponds to the translation of my explosion center object in world coordinates. Cool. What more can I do? Well, I want I want this. So, I want that the direction that is affecting um, the force that is affecting this given object when it's kind of directed from the explosion center toward the object that it is affecting. So, in mathematical terms, this is a subtraction. So, I'm taking the middle of the object that I want to affect. Okay, and again using the word translation and I'm subtracting it from the center. Okay, and this is the direction that I want to use. And the position from which it acts, well, it's the center of my explosion, right? If I could, I could also adjust, actually, the strength of this explosion, because, well, the length of this vector, well, it depends on the distance from my object to the explosion center. Maybe it actually makes sense, but let's say that for this case I don't want to actually make it matter. So instead I want the strength of this explosion to always be, well, 10, yeah, because that's what, I, that's what I invented right now. Okay, cool. So let's see how it works. Okay, so now we have our project. We have our explosion center waiting for us nicely at this place on the terrain. And uh, yeah, we have this big boom button waiting for us to be clicked. And the escape key allows me to yeah, go in and out of the mouse look so that I will be able to actually press on this escape key. So let's press it, okay? So boom. And now everything that I have defined is like goes away from this explosion center. But of course I actually want more things. So let's just shoot some rockets. Mm, I should have actually made those rockets slower so that they will be easier to control this way. Oh, and let's go like this, okay? So now I do want to have actually the slower rocket, something that I didn't want to do earlier. And let's try this one, okay? Boom! And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, okay, so that's, I guess, the simplest... Mm, maybe not the simplest, but this was the one of the simpler demos of how we can use the physics engine in Castle Game Engine, in Castle Game Engine Editor, and from code. Uh, what more? Well, I want to mention that well, we have a number of demos of this physics engine in our Castle Game Engine examples. And in particular, well, I want to emphasize that it all works not just for the three-dimensional objects, but also for two-dimensional objects. So let's open a demo called 2D Game Sopwif, and it's designed like this, okay? So there is some two-dimensional object with a rigid body and a collider, and let's see that it works nicely at runtime. So I can move this plane, and it's shooting some spheres. They are actually spheres in 3D. And those spheres hit some boxes. Finally, we have also uh, joints. Joints um, allow you to connect a number of rigid body components into something, well, into something that like stays together, following some rules. So let's actually run the demo, and then you can it's definitely easiest to explain how it works. So, for example, this is the joint of a hinge. So what happens if I shoot this is that one rigid body is connected using a hinge joint to another rigid body. And when there is a rigid body that actually causes this thing to rotate, well, it doesn't just fly off. Instead, it stays connected to the wall. I mean, this pretends to be a door that is connected to a wall, and it just rotates around the hinge 
like a door would. Okay, and there are a number of other uh, joints like following, I would say, this pattern. So let's run this demo and see. Okay, so this is the hinge joint. This is, I guess, a prettier version of it designed using Blender. And in particular, you can see here that uh, some joints can be made like breakable. Like, for example, this door, it has been actually made. It's a breakable joint, which means that if you apply uh, force to it with enough strength, then actually the joint will break. So it kind of translates to exactly the same thing in reality. Like if you bash on something hard enough, then yeah, the constraint will eventually break. And there are more joints, like this is the ball joint that allows one thing to rotate around another with a, well, a complete freedom how it rotates. Another thing is the grab joint, and this means that when I click somewhere, the objects, the physical objects, goes to where I clicked but it's still following like the rules and the collisions of physics. So it's not going instantly and it's also not going through if something if something is preventing it, it like has to push those other things through. Yeah? So this thing like is a magnet essentially in reality. Okay, we have a rope which allows one thing to dangle from another uh, while keeping some sensible distance. And finally we have a distance joint which is kind of like a rope too, except it's uh, flexible, so it can behave like a spring. One thing fall keeps to another thing, like tight with an elastic spring, and uh, yeah, it can like bounce, mm, it can be more or less rigid, essentially. Okay, and uh, that's everything I wanted to talk about during this talk. So, as I mentioned, the engine is like, as I kind of emphasized at the beginning, the engine is open source game engine. Uh, go ahead download it it's for free and also if you like what i see if you like what you see if you like what i talked about uh, go ahead and sponsor us uh, support us on patreon we very much count on your support uh, we right now hire one developer andrzej kliański who is working on the engine we basically want to be able to hire more people and have more time to work on the engine and yeah do more amazing features so thank you, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, yeah, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Bye. Awesome, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, you want to? It's a, Mike Michaelis. I'm not sure. Actually, go ahead and come on. Let's do some Q and A here. Uh, I was just chatting with Ian actually on the side here about how cool this your game engine is here. Oh, I removed you. How do I pronounce your name correctly? I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope you can hear me. My internet is uh, is weird. Ah, do you hear me? Do you I, see me? I hear you, but your video is not moving. But I hear you fine. Oh, that's okay. I'm just not moving. I'm perfectly still. I, I'm just going to go like this. Sorry, I'm just disabled and enable the camera. Let me go like ah. this. Oh, it's better. Okay. Yeah, that's better. All right. In and out. Yeah. And my name is Michael. <laughs> that's actually Michael. Easy. Okay. It's just Michael. It's a weird name. That's All right. I, I tend to make names too complicated. <laughs> Uh, I'm not really good at it. And I, so I was saying, I Ian and I were talking in another chat about I Castle Game Engine is so cool. Lars says as well, impressive demos. Uh, I agree. I, I've tried to do some stuff with, oops, that was the wrong one. I've tried to do some stuff with uh, Blender before, and I'm just not any good at it. And watching you do is I'm like, oh, wow, that's amazing. But so the question is, what formats do, can you support uh, besides Blender for 3D models? Well, actually, we don't support Blender like natively. We don't load Blender models directly. We support a few, we have, I think, 12 of them by now. So I guess the main one is the GLTF. GLTF is kind of a standard format developed by Kronos. It's supported by, you can do it from Blender, from 3ds Max, from Maya, and so on and so on. So I would say GLTF, X3D, Collada, Wavefront OBJ, uh, STL, um, and something else I don't remember. <laughs> we have like 12 formats basically that we support. And yeah. Our goal is not just support Blender. Our goal is to kind of support every authoring software that you can possibly use. And I, for every for every authoring software, I'm guessing that we will find some format where we can <laughs> read something that comes out of it. So we don't really need Blender. But in short, GLTF is what we recommend because it's a, it has an extremely good feature set, and it just works with a lot of software. Like I said, Blender, 3ds Max, Maya, those are covered. Use, use GLTF. 
Now, as far as like animating parts of a uh, model, right? So you you're um, you had just the models moving as a whole. Is there a way to like move the arms or stuff like that within Castle as well? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we support skinned animation. Um, so you design it in Blender, and then you loan, you export it to GLTF, and then yeah, we render it in Castric Engine. Uh, so this is absolutely supported. I mean, the one thing that we're actually missing is that what you can do right now is that, for example, you can make a character that has the name uh, as has a hand animated, for example, something like this. What is still a to do is actually to give you something called uh, inverse kinematics, which means that you would also be able to, for example, from code say where does this hand go and control it. So this bit is still a to-do, but it will also come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, very cool. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the good comments. I did comment. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the good I, comments. Honestly, I'm watching this, and I'm like, I've seen you do this before, but I just every time it's so impressive, and it's so cool. And you're doing, and you get, you're doing like all this in real time, too. And I'm just like, ah, this is amazing. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I see just some positive feedback. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, so uh, go out, everybody, go out to Patreon and, and uh, sign up to support uh, Castle Game Engine. That's a great way to show your support and show your appreciation. And uh, I will be back out there again too, I think, as well. Uh, let's see. What about like particle animation, right? So like in, in your explosion, is there a way to add particles or, you know, stuff like that, debris? Uh, we don't have it as a core in the engine yet. Uh, so like the particle engine is a, well, I kind of didn't have basically resources to kind of attack this feature, but we actually have a dedicated person, uh, Kagama on our Discord and GitHub, who has made actually two implementation of uh, physics, uh, not physics, uh, particle effects for Castle Game Engine. One of them is using something called FXSeer. It's kind of an external library to define effects, like particle effects. And you can define them, so like in an external editor, and then load them in Castle Game Engine. And another approach that he did, and he's still doing it, I mean, he's still maintaining it, is that uh, actually a way in our Castle Game Engine editor to design particle effects. So basically, it's not part of the Castle Game Engine core, but it, there are at least two like powerful, very much practical and powerful approaches to do this in well external open source components developed by yeah, Kagama, Nick on Discord on GitHub. <laughs> He's doing a lot of great things uh, around Castle Game Engine. At some point, I suppose one of those two methods will win and we will you know, integrate them actually in Castle Game Engine core, of course. But for now, yeah, you can use it already. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, can Castle Game Engine render spline curves for creating things like roads yeah i did answer that one already <laughs> because i was answering in parallel uh, so okay. yeah we can render spline curves we can nurps spline we can render them all you can also load them in the engine and basically from code do what you want with them for example build something along, along the spine or animate something along the spine and so on so yeah Hey, Patrick put oops. <laughs> Apparently I'm fighting here. Pa Castle or Patrick put the link in for your Patreon, Castle Game Engine on Patreon. Very much. Um yeah, I, I would add to the Patreon that I mean the goal here is to just hire people. I mean to have more time and to hire people. We already have Andrzej Kiliański. What you see in this demo has been developed. Uh, not by me, I couldn't do it. <laughs> by Andrzej Kliański, who did it, and then um, using um, Craft Engine from uh, Benjamin Rousseau. And then maybe, I guess I just helped a bit. <laughs> but it is not a work of, of, of myself. It's a work of a few people. And the idea of Patreon is to support them, basically, so that uh, we have more time <laughs> to do more of this. Yeah, thank you. All right, fantastic. Um, we, we need to wrap up here. Uh, Sandra says you code too fast, hard to read everything. Which <laughs> yeah, I, like you I, just jumped in that you have demos that we can check out. So yeah. Yeah, indeed. I, I answered Sandra already in the chat. Basically, what I show in this presentation is kind of a combination of two demos that you can find source code for them in the engine sources. And uh, yeah, look at them for yourself. What um all the oh. it's probably on the website, but what platforms can you target from mm -hmm. Castle Game Engine? It's quite a few, I believe, isn't it? 
Yeah, uh, in general, quite a few. Uh, so Linux, FreeBSD, macOS, uh, Windows, of course, <laughs> uh, on mobile, Android, iOS, and finally Nintendo Switch. Oh, and Raspberry Pi also. That's that's a Linux too. However, there's a disclaimer here, but one day we will rectify it. But with Delphi, so far we just support Windows, uh, which is simply didn't have resources like to 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 port our other platform support to Delphi. But this is going to be rectified. We want to support other platforms. The ones coming sooner with Delphi are going to be Linux and Android. In fact, there has been a kind of a successful like a, like a fundraiser for one person who's developing actually a game for Android using Delphi, and they wanted this support. And, and uh, well, they made funds <laughs> basically to support exactly this particular development. Android with Castle Game Engine on Delphi. And uh, yeah, they succeeded, <laughs> so it's going to happen. So with Delphi, Fantastic. just Windows, but this is going to get better. Yeah. Fantastic. So I, I, I like the fact that I, that you can compile, and I you, you showed both compiling it from Castle Game Engine versus from Delphi IDE, and you can use the compiler or the uh, debugger and stuff. And so I'm assuming that if you are uh, targeting one, if you want to target like Switch, right, then you're probably you're your loop would probably be similar to what you're showing today. You'd be developing and testing on Windows and then test to switch occasionally. Would that be probably your uh, your what your uh, work, style, work would look like? Yeah, exactly. It would be the same I mean, it's, on it's... Windows. Exactly, exactly. I mean, when you're doing basically anything that doesn't work on desktop, even Android or iOS, it's kind of easiest to just keep testing it on whatever Windows, Linux, whatever you're working on, and then just at the, I guess, from time to time, recompile it for the platform. I mean, it's, it's you, you can do it as often as you like, but of course, you, you know, it's two seconds to just see it on your Windows, and it's, you know, at least 15 seconds to see it on your Android. So it's always going to be faster to just keep testing on your desktop. Yeah. And yeah, do you support Animation sure. Blender? I see the question already. Yes, we do support Animation Blender. <laughs> when you play an animation, you can tell what is like the crossfading time. So you can crossfade to animations with, well, any time that you want to. And you can also customize this time per animation. So yes. So there's a question here about Adobe, but I'm assuming this goes back to the other thing of just exporting to one mm -hmm. of the 12 formats that you support. Okay. Yes, here, 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 I guess an important mention about Adobe is that Adobe is kind of, um, I want to say pushing, but let's say promoting their proprietary 3D format that's called FBX. And well, we don't support it. We do support, however, GLTF, and you can export to GLTF from 3ds Max, Maya, so Adobe products. <laughs> so we do support Adobe products like 3ds Max, Maya through open formats like GLTF. There may be at some point a support for something like FBX. If I'm guessing right, then, then maybe you're asking about FBX, but not right now. Right now, our recommendation, even if you're coming from Adobe products, is to use GLTF as kind of an intermediate format. Um, yeah, because it works good, and we have documentation on our website also, particular for 3ds Max and Maya, how to uh, yeah, use them properly. I okay. hope I did remember, yeah, yeah, because they are from Adobe, yeah, right? No, Autodesk. I mixed it up. Okay, so I guess I guess my answer for the Adobe question may have been completely idiotic. So sorry about that. And if you want to make it better, uh, go ahead and I guess ask me later because we may support something that is connected to Adobe, and I will be able to answer you uh, better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One more question, and then we're going to the next section. Um, is there a? I, I one of the things about game development is a lot of times. I'm not very artistic, so I'm not going to be able to develop the models myself. Are there any good places you found, like third-party marketplaces, to pick up uh, models and assets and stuff like that that you can use in Castle Game Engine? Actually, quite a lot, and it depends on it depends on whether you want to pay for them or download for free. But actually, we do have a lot of sites that allow open source, like on the open source licenses and for free formats, yes. And uh, actually there are there is a collection of links that you can use. If you go to the Castle Game Engine website, you can click on gallery. Uh, actually, let me, you can click on the gallery and then go to the assets. And uh, so like we have a dedicated link from two websites from which we recommend you to download assets because they have one good quality 
and two, they are on clear open source licenses. So uh, yeah, public domain, Creative Commons, and so on. So actually, there's a few of them. There's a few of, uh, there's, okay, not a few, a lot actually, enthusiastic people doing really high quality and also free assets on the internet. And yeah, you can basically use them. Thank you, exactly, Patrick, right. that's the link, thank you. Patrick, and there's the direct link to the assets. Fantastic, all right, great. Um, very exciting, very excited. Thank you so much for all your work in uh, promoting this. And I, I, what is your role? Are you managing it since you said you're not the developer for this? Or what is your role in Castle Game Engine? Oh, no, 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 I'm still a developer. Oh, <laughs> I, still I guess developer. I, okay. Yeah, I'm the original author and I'm still the developer, I guess. I'm holding all the keys and I'm still developing a lot of this stuff. But I am also hey, overseeing, I, I guess, some work that happens. But okay. I still come. Yep. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you well, for thank you so me. much for your work, and thanks for all the your team. Let your team know we appreciate it, and we're very excited about all the stuff you have going on here. So, thank you very much. <laughs> all right, and we'll see you later. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. All right. So up next we have. Um, I don't see the next session. It's I believe. Uh. uh Fair critical section with Jens Makovsky. Mav Makovsky. Mavov. I'm I shouldn't try to pronounce things. <laughs> uh, and we'll start that here probably in just one minute. So thanks uh for that everybody. And we'll have a short wrap up right after that. So we'll try and wrap up pretty quick because it's it's been a long week for me, probably for a lot of you as well. All right. And we'll see you all here shortly. Everybody, welcome to the DelphiCon 2023 session celebrating 28 years of Delphi, in which we will be talking about fair critical section, which is from the area of multi threading. The critical sections enable only a single thread at one time to pass through a block of code, all other threads need to wait. Uh, they are used every time memory is allocated in Delphi and when applied to a single instruction on one variable like increment decrement compare they are called atomic operations the goals for critical section implementations are of course modest processing overhead guaranteed not to lock up low frequency of atomic operations thread fairness and mindful of thread context switch frequency so what means thread fairness all threads entering a critical section exit in the same order in which they arrived this is the definition. The main cause of non-fairness are preemptive OS gives no warranties on the timing when individual threads will be resumed from sleep, the thread context switch. The non-deterministic nature of the operating system's sleep function, and these are two main reasons. And the result is that every time a thread enters sleep to wait, the sleeping time can be slightly different from thread to thread. What does thread, when does thread fairness become a problem? So if we have a T parallel for uh, loop, the, and inside of this loop we have one section of the code which is threaded code and all the threads are running here in parallel. And then we have another section of the code which is single threaded and is inside of a critical section so that all the threads need to pass one by one through this uh, code block. When the time which is spent by threads inside of the threaded code block become, comes to be close to the time spent inside of the critical section block and the number of threads waiting in the queue of the critical section because of this becomes to grow. This is when the 
thread fairness becomes a problem because the queue or the number of threads waiting inside of the cs.enter line becomes much more than than zero now the wait inside of the critical section some threads may enter the critical section multiple times while others get stuck at enter and might be released only once so performance penalty can be two to three times and be varying two to three times from run to run this is one indication that we possibly have a problem with the fairness of a critical section if our threaded code has large variability from run to run and of course the greater the core count the bigger the number of threads that we will launch the bigger will also be the problem thread job distribution across 16 threads is on this example and you can see that if the columns are cores and the blocks are the thread jobs then the jobs will get accumulated on a few cores or a few threads and several threads in this case three threads will remain uh, unused three cores will remain unused because one of the, or two or three of the threads will be stuck inside of the critical section waiting line while other threads will pass this block uh, several times here we have an example of the implementation of the fair critical section and the main uh, key point here are two counters every time an enter count uh, a thread enters it reserves the index uh, which is uh, which is determined with the enter counter this uh, counter is then captured inside of this function and used inside of a loop to determine when does this counter uh, match the value of another counter which is incremented with the leave this makes a very clean and simple waiting loop in which we have no atomic operations the precondition is of course that the overflow checks need to be off and uh, try enter is also possible with this uh, this line the tricky part here are these two parameters where the exec counter these two these two expressions because the uh, exec counter needs to be read only once from the memory and then from this one value which is read both of these expressions need to be evaluated before being passed to this atomic cmp exchange function the compiler in fact does generate code which respects this requirement and at least on windows delphi will correctly generate the code for this try enter expression as specified here the overflow checks need to be off and it was tested that the integers will overflow and this does not represent a problem for the operation of this uh, language construct in this example we are using the sleep zero but this can be customized for the specific requirements for example sleep zero the count the number of sleep zero, zero and then increase this to longer sleep times if necessary and finally if we look at what is happening with the atomic operations every time we increase we call the atomic increment 
the parameter in the core is written from the from this core cache into the main memory and because it is written in the mem memory this memory address is invalidated in other in the caches of other CPU cores S and the same situation happens when we are calling the leave or exit we are incrementing another uh, counter and again we are communicating the value uh, or publishing the value back to other cores if we do not uh, call an atomic operation the time needed to for the ch change value to reach other cores can be longer in extreme case if the other cores are in a tight loop the the, the change value might actually never or indefinitely or the situation could be such that indefinitely this value will not reach the 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 cache of other cores because all other cores maintain their own copy of the same variable in their own dedicated caches this critical section is very uh, will cause a very high threat context uh, switch rate uh, higher than what it will be triggered by the Windows operating systems critical section these critical sections look like they could be used uh, everywhere but Microsoft for example recommends a frequency of less than 1 kilohertz per core so we should not be calling any critical section which will result in a threat context switch more than 1000 times per second this is a very or a relatively strict requirement on the design of the code and of the libraries of the runtime libraries of, on the whole on the whole software to reduce the number of uh, sleep commands of the wait commands and critical sections in general this critical section solves one specific problem which has to do with thread fairness but if our um, but if our uh, critical sections are short enough relatively to other threaded code blocks then this problem of fairness will never occur will never occur because the waiting lines for the critical sections will most of the time be empty we will now have a look at some benchmarks if we want to consider the Microsoft requirements that the number of thread context switches per second may not exceed 1000 times uh, per core on the CPU this means in practical reality that we may not call get memory in Delphi more than 1000 times per second if we want to be sure that the thread context switches will not happen we have here uh, an example where we are testing and comparing different uh, critical sections one is this FIFO critical section which is the fair critic se critical section then th this is the Windows OS critical section and we have the simple critical section which is uh, many times used in Delphi and you can have a look at the getmem.inc what is being used inside of Delphi memory manager uh, what we are doing here we are we have a very uh, slim body of the critical section a very short piece of code where we are just increasing two variables and or three variables 
and we are counting the number of times we can manage to capture the critical section with try enter how many times we do it with enter and the time it takes in it takes how many times we enter for every thread and what what is the max maximum time and then we display some statistics so let's run this code and see what results we get back some some results and if we compare the fair critical section with the with the simple Delphi critical section we can see that the timing of the code is approximately the same that we have the same number of iterations and that the sum is correct these iterations and the sum is displayed so that we can see if the critical section is actually working <coughs> as expected because if there is an error in the and multiple threads would enter the critical section then the sum would be wrong uh, below we display uh, how many times does the thread sleep longer than one millisecond we can see here that zero times and the maximum is rounded to the value of one millisecond and most of the time here we see that the threads sleep very rarely longer than one millisecond and the maximum is sometimes close to one millisecond this is for the simple Delphi critical section if we compare this to the T monitor we have here one loop which is using system.tmonitor we see that the T monitor finishes nearly 10 times faster than the simple critical sections when using such a short such a short body to be to be executed now T monitor when executed on uh, without multi-threading is of course slower than the um, and the, this simple critical section but it shows its muscles when it comes to multi-threading so the result is correct and what we can see here is that we have many more sleeps that take much longer than one millisecond and that these sleeps are in fact or the weights these are the weights inside of the critical sections enter that their uh, these weights are fairly long up to 25 or 50 milliseconds sometimes but despite these long weights still the result is very very good so how does this happen because the uh, the number of uh, times which the the number of times that the critical section is acquired is reduced it is reduced because when the T monitor calls exit it does not really exit but exits with some delay and allows the same thread to recapture the critical section immediately again and this will lower the thread context switch frequency because of the lower thread context switch frequency the thre those threads executing will be more efficient and the timing will be better now we have the windows os critical section the timing is similar to the Delphi but we see some movements here so the the enter command will sometimes be more than one millisecond but still not much more uh, it does show some um, attempts by Microsoft to by the operating system to increase the the sleep times and allow other threads to be uh, running to be running without so many uh, con thread context switches but the, the final effect effect at least in this case is not 
not very much uh, different F in from the not from the T monitor but from the simple critical section. Then if we go to the fair critical section and try to uh, consider the spin weight, spin weight is just a simple loop without slipping without calling the slip function we have a lot of uh, slips which last much more than one millisecond and we have the maximum which is close to 50 milliseconds so there is a, a, a somewhat surprising result that there are so many cases where the enter is going to slip so many times and the final timing will be uh, so similar to what we already had before another uh, interesting result is that the try enter is going to happen only in a few uh, only in a few hundred or thousands of cases out of 10 millions which is much less than than one percent here we have a fair critical section which is uh, using switch to thread uh, rather than slip and uh, you can see that the slip times inside of the enter command uh, are very short and the maximum is rounded to one millisecond uh, this timing should be taken with great uh, reserve because if we run this outside of the debugger now we are inside of the debugger we will get different results and when we run this for an action application it greatly depends everything on the thread switch thread context switch frequency this is the paramount uh, parameter when it comes to critical sections we should basically use critical sections extremely sparingly within our programs and if we consider the Microsoft requirement for 1000 thread context switches per second this is indeed very modest because here we are running 10 million in 5 seconds for the reference here we have one uh, one web page where Microsoft is talking about the thread context switching and it says it is reasonable to have fewer than 1000 context switches per second per core that each context switch takes the kernel about 5 microseconds on average which is uh, close to 10 microseconds sometimes however the resulting cache misses and additional execution time time is difficult to quantify and finally we are looking at the fair critical section which is using sleep zero this sleep zero can only be used for the computational threads which are not waiting for the uh, input output operations to be finished or to be involved in the input output uh, logic because the kernel might not update all the related resources necessary to make decisions inside of the wait loop and here again see that the s wait time inside of the enter enter command is nearly never bigger than one millisecond and the maximum is close to one millisecond the total timing is not is not neither good or bad it is, it is comparable with uh, other implementations and we if we consider that we are sorting the threads as they arrive and that we process and release them in the in the order uh, in which they arrived this extra processing is nearly 
free does not cost us anything special we are going to have a look at the try enter logic implementation which is um, interesting to see how the compiler is handling the atomic compare exchange enter working what code is generated by the compiler when we uh, execute the atomic compare exchange because these two expressions need to be uh, <coughs> evaluated by reading the exec counter value only once from memory so it should be that this value is read once then this expression is evaluated from the same uh, from the same register and here we see that the value which is in AAX is reduced by 1 we read EDX once we move it into AIX into AIX we reduce the value by 1 to create the exec counter minus 1 and then we can be sure that the exec counter which is at RCX plus this address is read from memory only once before it is passed to the log CMP exchange if the exec counter would be read more than once from the memory then on each read the result could be different because other threads could already modify this value and here we are again concluding our uh, presentation I hope you manage to learn something new and uh, see you at our company webpage and on the github so thank you very much for your attention and uh, wish you happy coding all right great thank you so much for that session uh these are one of those that's uh yeah it's always uh interesting these deep technical sessions because there's like parts of us like are just beyond me <laughs> I, I think that probably happens for a lot of people but there's always interesting parts to pick up on there as well so i think you're on here to join me for q a um i don't see any video but hopefully you know, yes can you hear me i can hear can you, you. Hear? yes yes it's wonderful jim so right. the main the main conclusion would be that in some cases you can get two to three times more speed and it happens if the threaded code is about the same length in times of execution as the critical section code. Mm -hmm. So this is the the main area where you would want to use something like this. And you yeah. can see and you can see if you have this problem if the timings are uh, jumping up and down. So every time you run the code, you get two uh, not slightly but two to three times different result. Mm -hmm. And this means that or possibly you have a thread fairness problem. Makes sense. It's it's one of those things. A lot of times, that people ask me that you know, like, what's the best way to do this, or is this better than this? It's like, well, it depends. And this is a great example of that. It's like, well, this normally would be good, but then, like you said, when you have in certain circumstances, then you see where you can have better performance by making uh, by using this differently. So there's a question here from Patrick. Um, says in Delphi system sync objects critical section mutex and semaphore are used the same way Do, does it make a real difference I guess which one you use uh, it's like this that mutex and semaphores are generally meant for more for interprocess uh, interprocess communication which is maybe one order of man magnitude slower than what you have inside of the process and the critical sections are used inside of the process. And you, in 
as I explained before, you can have penalty up to two to three times if the, your critical section is not fair and the operating system does not provide a fair critical section. Okay. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Looks like not. Is um, your code... The show, is there any of the code you showed off available for download or, or can we collect it and make it available later? Well, the code is part of our product. So let's say okay. it is it is it is open source so that you can see it, but it's still under license. Right. Because so which, if someone goes so to do research, if someone goes to your do research website, what should yes. they download to check us out? Uh, you don't have to download anything. You can write it the way you have it, the way you have it written in the in this demo, and it will simply work. You can, of course, also download our product because it's uh, integrated into the product and it's used also these concepts in, in the product itself. So you will benefit from the extra performance which comes from this area. But this is, let's say, one... One thing that stands out and is interesting, perhaps, to other people who are more tech savvy and would like to uh, and would like to have an extra edge. And when they see a specific problem in their code, they would say, "Okay, I need this building block. I would like to put this into our system. Into our system, it would make a difference for us." And then they would, let's say, buy our product for to get these uh, features. Okay. A uh, couple of questions here. Carlos is saying, congrats on the technical details. Sorry if I missed this. Is it possible to have nested calls using fair critical section? It's uh, like this, that the uh, um, all the calls are always uh, nested. So do you have multiple threads which are calling the same critical section, but they are being queued at the entry point so you you cannot go into depth of something which is where you only allow one uh, one thread to pass so you only allow one thread and that's it you you, you could have one more critical section inside of the critical section but that it doesn't serve any purpose because you have already limited the number of threads to one right that makes sense that makes sense. Um, Patrick saying, I suppose using system.tmonitor to lock objects in code for compatibility with threads is a good thing too? Well, I have had very good results with tmonitor. Tmonitor is actually a feature of many languages. You have the same construct in C Sharp. You have the same construct in C++. And also, I'm sure, in, in other languages, especially like Java. And this is a special design. Maybe there was a paper done some years ago and everybody implemented this. And uh, the T-Monitor, as I explained, has this special capacity to reduce the threat, the, threat uh, con or the, the context switch frequency. So how many times does the kernel switch between threads? So even though it looks like we are switching the same number of times, it does some trick to keep the thread, even though to get the, the thread running, even even though it looks like we have switched to another thread, but we didn't. And because of this, it gives you a performance which is closer to a single core, full single core frequency, full full single core capacity, rather than something which is much slower than one core processing. Another great example of how it's not, you know, the 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 answer is not always obvious. You know, it's one of those things. You know, Patrick says thank you. Um, multi -core, adding more cores doesn't necessarily, yeah, because you have to consider that. All right, I think that's it. If people want more information, they can um, check out your website, do-research.com. Yeah, uh, right. Do you, yes, correct. Oh, just do, no dash. Do, just do research. Correct. All right, I'll put that in the chat here. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much and uh, appreciate your time and appreciate all, all you do. 
Thank you very much, Jim, for having me. And I hope to meet you many more times. Yes, looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good night, Jim. Good night. Okay. Um, I was going to... Oops. A couple things I wanted to do here real quick. At the end of the day here, end of the conference. Let's see if I can share screen. There it is. And hopefully this bandwidth stays going good. So this has been DelphiCon 2028. A lot of great content here. I learned a lot. Um, hopefully you all did too, since you've stuck around this much. I'm guessing you probably got a lot out of this. We were celebrating 28 years of Delphi. Um, I, 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 what my idea in creating this chart was just show that Delphi is kind of in the middle of a large pack of languages. There was a lot of languages right here. You know, Python is a little bit older, Java and JavaScript are just a little bit younger, and it still continues on in either direction. But it's a mature language, which is great because there's lots of great stuff you can do with it. But then also it's a, uh, it, it continues to evolve and be a very productive language. I guess you've already seen this link. And I've got to close this so it stops coming up here. And I don't know why it's popping up on that window. It's not supposed to. Okay. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. And um, I think this has got everybody on here, hopefully. Actually, it doesn't have... Uh... Oh, is it Yans? Yes, Yans. Okay. I thought that's... <laughs> My brain is fried. It doesn't have Yans because he uh, didn't give us a headshot. Uh, he's a little more uh, reclusive, I suppose, but that's fine. But thank you all of our speakers for being part of this session. We will have replays up. There is a, if you go to the DelphiCon page, you will find a link to the YouTube playlist where we'll be adding the additional sessions as they become available. The entire eight hour videos will also be up there in the meantime, if you just you know have to get out there and find that little bit uh, tidbit of knowledge. Also a reminder that, we're, so we were going to do the awards for the AI art contest and the enterprise um, article contest, but decided we're going to extend the deadline on that. So if you haven't entered yet, and actually I saw Lars just submitted a number of them as well, which was great. I really liked some of those with mid journey. I know Lars just said he just went to sleep, but uh, uh, yeah, I like some of the ones he made. Great stuff there. Delphicon.embarcadero.com. Thanks, Patrick, is the site if you want to go out to find the replays. And yes, yeah, Samuel says thanks and happy birthday. Agreed. Happy birthday. I'm very, I, this is exciting. I'm glad to do Delphicon at the birthday for Delphi. We kind of, in the past, it didn't always line up, but I thought, you know what? Let's just line them up. And that's my goal going forward is just keep this all lined up here so that they are uh, together. Uh, so yeah, go out and generate some AI art and you can edit that in images or you can make it yourself from scratch. If you just want to make, if you're a talented artist, make your own art from scratch. You don't have to use these image generators, but they're a fun way to, uh, get, you know, get something to start with. And, you know, you could take one of these that are, um, have it generate something and then edit it when you're done. This one, I think, so this one here is Dolly 2. Dolly 2 always has little color things in the corner. But I think these three are Mid Journey, um, which Mid Journey does really good stuff um, as well. There's just, they're neat. You can actually download these and run them locally, which I did if you have a, a decent GPU. And that gives you a little more ability to tweak some things and stuff. We have some more articles coming out with some more stuff you can do with Dream Booth as well, which is kind of exciting. Uh, things you can do too. So a lot of cool stuff to check out and be part of. Um, here's Darian's uh, song and the or a poem and then the hip hop song, which I I might re-record later if I get a good bass track to go with it. And then yeah, the enterprise software or article challenge as well. These are, you can go out and check these out. They're all out here on uh, blogs.embarcadero.com. Ian's been helping edit those and publish those. A lot of good stuff here. Some of them are really cool and really interesting, actually. So definitely check that out. Uh, very interesting stuff for sure. Uh, let's see. A lot of positive comments here. Great. 
good to see. And yeah, there's the link, delphicon.embarcadero.com. I, um, I was, yeah, so we're going to do another follow-up in the near future. I will get scheduled and make an announcement where I'll do the winners for the, um, uh, the contest. You're welcome, Robert. Uh, and Ian and Martha are a huge part of this as well, behind the scenes. Actually, Ian was in front of the scenes quite a few times as well because internet issues. Um, actually, so I will, let's see, do I have this? I don't, so I wanted to do Spirit of Delphi here as well, but I decided I'm going to wait on that as well. But I will go ahead and just uh, tease this out and review. Let's do that. We'll review the previous Spirit of Delphi Award winners and know that you can come back here in a few weeks when I get this scheduled and you'll get to see the uh, the, the new uh, 2022 Spirit of Delphi Award. So who was the, who um, we want to recognize for their contributions over the last year. So real quick, we're just going to recap here. Spirit of Delphi was introduced in 1998. Uh, here are the winners through 2007, which there was a I was a went on a break after 2007, um, and then Carrie Jensen was in 2018. So there was 11 years there where we didn't have a Spirit of Delphi winner. And I'm actually thinking I'm going to go back and retroactively recognize some people during those that period that were also contributors. But Carrie Jensen, great guy. He's done a lot of great work for the Delphi community. It's good to recognize him. And of course, David I. Um, he was the original developer advocate. He kind of invented the thing. He joined Borland in 85 and has been there ever since, so just till a few years ago when he retired. Um, done a lot of great stuff for the community. And it's interesting if I travel, if I'm someplace at a conference, it, if I mention uh, Delphi, they're like, oh, do you know David I? Because everybody knows David I at all, uh, even if people aren't using Delphi. So. I was wearing, I don't know if you noticed, I was wearing my uh, tie-dyed shirt, I think, yesterday in honor of David I as well. And then 2020, we had Dave Nottage, who's our Spirit of Delphi Award winner. He does a lot of great stuff on DelphiAwards.com. Definitely check him out. Um, he's on GitHub Projects. He's on Twitter. This is a picture of him when I was in Indonesia. I finally, I don't know if I met him before that or not. It's always interesting when I travel to a far-off country and meet somebody from the first time that isn't from that country. <laughs> so Zach is from the US and Dave is from Australia and I met them both in Indonesia. And then last year, Venetius and Paulo with their work on Skia for Delphi, which if you haven't caught on yet, I'm a big fan of, definitely check those that project out. And I did meet them while I was in Brazil. And there's a picture again. They, uh, yeah, so what's next? Who's going to be the winner? You guys have to find out later. Uh, it will be later this month. We'll find out who the Spirit of Delphi for 2022 winner is. Uh, very exciting. I uh, really appreciate everybody. Can you guess the hardest part probably is, is picking out who? <laughs> because there's so many great contributors and so many great community members. And appreciate all of you, all of our speakers, all of our MVPs and tech partners. And uh, everybody just for showing up and asking good questions. So thank you. Keep doing awesome stuff with Delphi or, you know, C++ Builder or whatever you're using. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as long as you're doing awesome things and making the world a better place. I appreciate you and appreciate all you do. Um, so we have the launch. We have the preview webinar on the 28th coming up. There's a link on the website. If you go to blogs.marketer.com, I'm sure you probably have an email about it as well. Hopefully you can join us for that for the 11.3. See what's coming in 11.3. It's going to go into more detail on that. And yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, FIS Alpine Skiing. Ooh. Wow. All right, cool. Uh, it, it, actually, I really do appreciate seeing people that I recognize and stuff like that showing up here and asking questions too. Appreciate you. It's, uh, it, sometimes it feels like you know, I'm not doing this in person. I'm doing it virtually. It feels like I'm just throwing information out into the void and then to have people asking questions or commenting about you know, that they appreciate it. That's, that's much appreciated. Really, thanks a lot. And oh, yep. Thank you, Patrick. There is the link for the uh, launch webinar. So, or preview what's coming in 11.3, February 28th. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we will see you on the 28th, if not sooner. Take care.
I just loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song, and then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey, get up, get coffee. Code monkey, go to job. Code monkey, have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say code monkey, very diligent, but his output stink. His code not functional or elegant. What do code monkey think? Code monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code monkey not say it out loud. Code monkey not crazy, just proud. Code monkey likes Fritos. Code monkey likes to have a Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man with big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code monkey like you. Like you. Code monkey hang around at front desk Till your sweater look nice Code monkey offer buy you soda Bring you cup, bring you ice You say no thank you for the soda Cause soda make you fat Anyway you with the telephone, no time for chat. Code monkey have long walk back to cubicle. He sit down, pretend to work. Code monkey not thinking so straight. Code monkey not feeling so great. Code monkey like Fritos. Code monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew. Code monkey very simple man. Big warm fuzzy secret heart. Code monkey like you. Take bath, take nap This job fulfilling in creative way Such a load of crap Code Monkey thinks someday he have everything Even pretty girl like you Code Monkey just waiting for now Code Monkey says someday, somehow Code Monkey like Fritos Code Monkey like Tab and Mountain Dew Code Monkey very simple man Big warm fuzzy secret heart Code monkey like you Code monkey like you Code monkey get up get coffee this is actual object Pascal code and was recorded in real time. You can compile it with Delphi or App Method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well.